What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to Reborn as a Prodigy Hyuga during Minato's era. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. I woke up to see my mother sitting by the fire and roasting some meat. I made my way over and joined her. So, how are we getting Sato back to Kanoha without him dying of dehydration? I assumed we'd wake him and make him eat. But this was the Naruto verse, so who knew? Maybe his chakra will let him last until we get to Kanoha. I'll give him some water now and then. Akedaki. Sounds good. Now all I had to do was hope we didn't run into any ninja that I'd have to fight. We were back on Nagi's main island approaching the area we first arrived at. And I was enjoying my trip thus far. I was using my tongue to play with my loose front tooth. It was the first of many as children didn't stop losing them until around 12. Which sucked. I was thinking about how goofy I'd look with half my baby teeth. And half my adult teeth. When my mother interrupted my thoughts. There's some Kirin in at the port. That's great and all. But I wanted nothing to do with them. There are too many people at the port. I'd rather not have a public fight. Mom nodded. Do you want to wait and see if they leave the port? No, I don't. No thanks. Mom raised an eyebrow but nodded. Alright, it looks like we're running to the land of noodles then. That sucks. It was around midnight when we arrived at the shore of the land of noodles. I was well and truly tired, and my mom looked a little annoyed. Are we stopping here or are we continuing further inland? It didn't matter but I hoped to sleep on a bed. We're going along the shore. Great we traveled for a little longer before we came across a small town near the edge of the water. It was nothing marvelous, they looked to be simple peasants. I still want a bed to sleep on regardless of how crappy it was. So, what's the plan? Are we going to wake them and ask for a place to sleep. We'll use Jinjutsu and steal a bed for a few hours of sleep. A little amoral, but I like the idea. Sounds good. It seems my mother is also a bit apathetic towards other people. My mother woke me up before the sun had risen. We silently moved the middle-aged couple back onto their bed. Mom picked up Sato and made her way to the entrance. I followed after her. I took a wad of cash out of my kunai pouch, separated a few bills, and left them on the table as I passed. We made our way to Kanoha over the next three days. Our trip was eight days long. As I walked through the gate, I decided that I'd never voluntarily do a mission that was longer than four days. My mom had vanished the moment we got through the gate, saying that she couldn't walk around with a body on her shoulder. I shunshined home eager for a shower. Shower done with, I looked at the clock on the wall. I had eight hours of daylight left. I sighed and made three clones, then sent them off to the third training ground to complete the Rasengan, either together or separately I cared not. I walked to the kitchen. I decided that I'd make something for my mom and me. My clones dispersed returning very little chakra, but signaling the completion of the Rasengan. I held my hand out, palm up, and started using the Rasengan. I formed a thin sphere of chakra, then spun my chakra in multiple directions, finally. I slowly increased the volume and density of the chakra I was outputting. I looked at the small Rasengan in my palm. It worked fine, but it took too long to form it currently. Though that didn't matter as my speed in forming the technique would come with familiarity and practice. I increased my chakra output and increased the size of my Rasengan. I now had a basketball-sized Rasengan swelling on my palm. And nowhere to put it I shouldn't have done this inside. And while I was cooking nonetheless I took the food off the burner and made my way outside, basketball-sized Rasengan on my palm. I stood in our backyard looking at our nice flowers and grass, and decided that it wasn't a good idea to use it here I shunshine to the third training ground I arrived at the training ground slightly annoyed. I smashed my Rasengan into the first tree I saw and let it go. I jumped back and watched my Rasengan drill through a tree before dispersing and leaving a spiral-shaped mark on a second tree. E-R-A-S-H asterisk the first tree fell the ground. And with the death of the tree I felt less annoyed than when I first got here. I ran a hand through my hair while admiring the damage. I liked the Rasengan. I plan to claim the creation of it despite Minato. But it was what won Naruto almost all of his future battles, so I definitely shouldn't do it. I had to choose between a savior not having his signature jutsu and being petty, and taking away one of Minato's future achievements. It wasn't a hard decision. I tucked a stray piece of hair behind my ear and sunshined home. My mom arrived a few minutes after I had finished the food and joined me for lunch. I had just finished my meal and mom wasn't far behind. I figured it was the ideal time for a talk, only this time it wasn't about me. How's your chakra control? My mother raised an eyebrow. I've created a new technique that requires excellent chakra control. I want to know if you can learn it. I technically didn't make the technique, but I wanted it established that I had the technique well before Minato had made it. I didn't want to be accused of stealing from the fourth Hokage after all. And my mother had no unique non hyuga techniques. I get an alibi and my mom increases her survivability. Win-win mom took a few seconds to finish chewing before responding. 
My chakra control is really good, but nowhere near as good as yours. That was the ideal answer. Good, I'm going to teach you a new technique I've just created. I looked at the clock on the wall. Tomorrow, I sent her a nod and put my dishes in the sink, and I left towards my room. I woke up feeling excited about what would come. I was happy that I got to teach my mom something. I did my morning routine and walked into the dining room. Mom was occupying her usual spot and sipping tea. Don't go anywhere, I'll be back in a little while. I exited the house and sunshine to the market district. I had to get some balloons and rubber balls. My mom and I were at the third training ground. I had filled almost all the balloons with water and I was ready to go. My mom didn't look too interested in what was happening. But that would probably change with a demonstration. Activate your Byakugan and watch. I created a palm-sized Rasengan, but decided that it wasn't impressive enough. I held my hand above my head and dumped an eighth of my reserves into the Rasengan. My palm-sized Rasengan became a giant Rasengan. I was nervous. But I tried to keep my face passive. Back up. This is a big one. I heard some movement and decided that it was time to get rid of this disaster waiting to happen. I grabbed the Rasengan with both hands and threw it towards the trees. I watched it drill through four trees before it burst and left a spiral marking on some trees and ground. I looked over to my mom and enjoyed the look of shock on her face. I just finished this yesterday so it isn't combat ready. It was still too slow. You can do that faster. I hope so. Yay. It's just chakra control. The more familiarity you have, the faster you can do it. At least that was the theory. Now the question was, do I create the Chidori as well? That was a thought for later perhaps. Is this based on the clan's 8 trigrams? Revolving heaven? Nope. Yet. Yeah. I like it when people jump to conclusions and save me the trouble of lying. What's the technique's name? I don't have one heaven's palm. Good enough. Okay? Grab a water balloon. You have to spin your chakra in multiple directions at once. When you've popped the balloon, come see me. Oh, yay. Whatever way your body naturally spins, its chakra is the way you start. With that done, I left towards the edge of the training ground. I made two clones and sent them off to practice lightning release. Something had almost slipped my mind. I sat down and took a deep breath. I activated my gravity seal, bringing it up to level 3. Again, sitting was a good choice. We were well into the day and it was about time for Guy to get out of school. That means my training for the day is done. I dispersed the clones practicing lightning release. There was little improvement. I looked over to my mother. There were some pieces of rubber on the ground, but she was still using the water balloons. I walked closer to her. How's it going? She seemed annoyed. I'm almost there. I'm just having trouble maintaining the rotation. Sadly, the first two steps were the easiest. The last step is the hardest. The next step is increasing the volume and density of your chakra. You must burst the rubber ball to complete this step. I pointed vaguely in the direction of the box of balloons and balls. What you've done is good enough to move on to the rubber balls. The second step was by far the easiest, so it shouldn't take too long. I got a nod in reply, and my mother made her way over to the box. Have fun. Alrighty, time to see Guy. I'll grab some food as well. I sunshine to my favorite teriyaki stall. I was seated in the tree in front of the academy. I was pondering the wonders of friendship maintenance and waiting for the bell to ring. To keep a friendship when you're no longer in the same place every day required maintenance. In my case with Guy, I came by and brought him food and asked him how he was doing. If I didn't do this Guy would forget about me and move on with his life probably only thinking about me years later. It was something I learned when I left high school in my past life, those I failed to check in on moved on, and we became distant. Those that I did keep in contact with became lifelong friends. I say lifelong friends because I died at 20. I chuckled. They were indeed lifelong friends. Eventually Guy exited the academy with a river of other students. I had planned on joining him when he was away from the academy, but he had other plans it seemed Shiro. Guy was staring directly at me. I gave a little wave. I dropped down from the tree and made my way over to Guy. Hello, Guy. People were staring, which was exactly what I wanted to avoid. I brought teriyaki. I waved the food around for emphasis. How are you for Shiro? I nodded. Want to climb to the top of the Hokage Monument? I created a shadow clone already anticipating his answer. A most youthful idea Shiro. Guy raced off towards the monument. I handed the food to the shadow clone and joined him. We were seated on the top of the Hokage Monument and enjoying our now cold teriyaki. Guy. Guy didn't stop eating. But I saw that his eyes were on me, so I continued. Want to learn lightning release from me? Guy hesitated for a moment. No thanks, I've got my hands full with my youthful training. Meaning he didn't have enough time to pursue Tejutsu and lightning release. How about the Shunshin? It's not too much trouble to learn. It was an easy to learn technique, though it would perhaps take Guy longer with his Puchakra control. Guy just shook his head. No thanks. Alrighty. No worries. All I could do was try. I couldn't force Guy to learn something if he didn't want to. Guy was dedicated to Tejutsu. If he didn't want to learn any techniques 
that was fine. There was other stuff we could do together. Wanna spa? Guy looked excited. A most youthful idea, Shiro. Guy jumped up and took a stance, completely forgetting about his food. Finish your food first. Guy picked his food up and finished it in a second flat. Yosh. Let's go. Alright, I jumped up and took my stance. I think I'll start using the Academy 3 in our spas. Hopefully, it'll help Guy improve. I got home and took my customary shower and got ready for bed. I decided I'd have a quick look around and see how my mother was doing. I went from room to room looking for her but she was nowhere to be seen. I sighed and created a clone that I sent to the third training ground. I shook my head and went to lay down. How goes it? My mom was still hard at work practicing with the rubber ball. Not well. She had made remarkable progress. I'd say it was going extremely well. No rush, it's a hard technique to master. She had gotten the first two steps down faster than I had. Why don't you come back to it tomorrow? It's getting late. My mom looked at the sky. Sorry. I got distracted. But you did. Have you eaten yet? She shook her head. Let's go see if we can get some street meat. Street meat was code for a prostitute. My mother eyed me. And I fought to keep my face neutral. Yes. Let's go get some shiaiki. I nodded in reply. Sounds good. I followed my mom as she shunshine away. Dawn came and brought with it a new day. Mom had decided that we'd do one or two missions per month. And spend the rest of the time improving ourselves. Which was ideal as I hated missions with a fiery passion. My mom was already out of the house practicing the Rasengan. Which put a damper on my plan to study her by Akigan today. I sent a clone out to the third training ground to find her, with no success. So, I had to find another way to occupy my time. I spared a look at the calendar as I passed. My birthday passed. And I didn't even realize it when's my mom's birthday. I flipped through the calendar looking for a hint of some kind with no success. I'll figure it out later I blew a sigh out my nose. I think it's time I get started on my list of experiments. Let's start with super cool bone weapons. I was seated in my room and trying to create a bone weapon from my finger. I had dulled the nerves in my hand in preparation for my project. It was extremely slow going. It took me two hours to form the bone weapon. It was a senban. I created a chakra scalpel on my other hand and cut the bone protruding from me at its base. I pulled the senban from my flesh and my finger healed near instantly. I rolled the piece of bone between my fingers. It was heavy. I'd probably be able to throw it. I started channeling some lightning chakra down the bone. The lightning spread around the senban with no resistance. I rolled it between my fingers again looking for any damage to the bone. Hum it looked good. I think it's safe to call super cool bone weapons a success though it took forever to create them. And I didn't want to develop calcium deficiency with overuse so, a partial success. I'd not be pulling my out my spine and using it as a sword, that's for sure. I heard my mom enter the house, and I decided that I was done with bone weapons for the day. I stood up and made my way out of my room. Time to look at that Byakugan mom can I look at your eyes now. My mom shook her head. Let me take a shower first. Alrighty one shower later, my mom was seated at the Chabudai, and I was standing behind her, hands on her eyes, and using Tsuned's modified diagnostic jutsu. I had used the time she was in the shower to study my own eyes and renew my familiarity with them. Few things were different when comparing her eyes. Mom's optic nerve was more robust than my own other than that her eyes were about the same from what I could tell. The job of the optic nerve is to transfer visual information from the retina to the vision centers of the brain via electrical impulses. So maybe mom's brain got more information from her eyes than my own. I ended my jutsu and withdrew my chakra from her eyes. I was staring at the back of her head blankly lost in thought when my mother interrupted me. Find what you were looking for. Not really, no. Maybe the way she used her chakra and her eye had something to do with her increased range. Activate your Byakugan. I activated my Byakugan and magnified one of her eyes within my vision. Hum, deactivate and activate your Byakugan again. I watched her chakra flow through her visual cortex in her brain down her optical nerve and into her eyes. The chakra in her eyes was throughout the eye but was densely gathered around the retina, pupil, and optical disc. The way her chakra concentrated was different than how my own did. And her chakra was much denser than my own as well. She was also running chakra through her visual cortex, in an unusual way. It was probably a combination of chakra density, how robust her optical nerve was, and the chakra in her visual cortex, that caused her immense range. I circulated chakra through my visual cortex, to use Chikaku no Kaoka, and slow my perception. Hum, is this how you always use chakra to activate your Byakugan? She nodded. This required more thought I might need to figure out how to increase the size of my optical nerve stem cells. Were well, the answer that automatically appeared in my mind. But I didn't know how the optic nerve formed. So, I guess I'll see alright I'm done. I'll let you know if I figure out anything. My mother nodded and stood up. She made her way to the kitchen probably to make some tea. I called to her as she was leaving. Thanks mom. Now I need to add studying eyes slash the optical nerve to my schedule. Maybe I'll need to find some Hyuga babies and scan their eyes. I'll scan their brains while I'm at it or maybe not off to the training ground. 
I go I was seated against a tree in the third training ground. I planned on copying the way my mom's chakra flowed during the use of her Bayakigan. I had a clone to my left in case any accidents happened. Alright let's go. I brought a small stream of chakra through my visual cortex, copying the way my mother did so. I then let the chakra travel down the optic tract to the optic clasm, and along the optic nerves, and finally to my eyes, retina, pupil, and optical disc. My Bayakigan activated. With a definite change in vision my range had expanded more than a kilometer. I'd say it was almost six times what it was previously, which was amazing. A manic grin covered my face. I spent a while enjoying my new range and watching the animals in the forest. Eventually I got bored and deactivated my Bayakigan. The only problem was that I couldn't slow my perception and enhance my Bayakigan's range at the same time, which wasn't much of a problem as I shouldn't need to slow my perception and have increased range. I blew a breath out of my nose and activated my Bayakigan, this time keeping my chakra away from the visual cortex. My range was still more than it usually was, though it only clocked in at about 500 meters, two and a half times my normal range. I think the visual cortex does most of the heavy lifting when I copied the way my mom's chakra flowed my range increased by about 6 times what it normally was so, mom's natural range should be 5 kilometers divided by 6. So, her natural range is 833-ish meters which was more in line with what most Hayuga had what to find. I might not even bother trying to mess with the optical nerve. I was fine with my natural range, and perhaps my optical nerves would increase in size with Bayakigan usage. But now this needed a name Bayakigan no Kaoka nope, not happening. It's still just called the Bayakigan. I think it's still worthwhile to read more about the eyes I stood up, dispersed my clone, and sunshine back to my house. Three days passed, my mom continued practicing the Rasengan, and I learned a lot about eyes. Mom was now on the third part of Rasengan training, and I was pondering changing the color of my eyes. Your eye color depended on the amount of pigment your iris had. The less pigment the lighter the shade your eyes were, and the more pigment you had the darker your eye shade was the iris was just a muscle that controlled the size of the pupil, so I could afford to mess with it. My eyes were currently a pinkish white, so perhaps I should make my eyes less Hayuga like three more days passed, making it a week since we got home from our mission. My iris was now purple, while my pupil remained a light pink, I also sported some grey highlights in my hair, which was just more simple pigment change I now look nothing like a Hayuga knot. That I look much like a Hayuga, to begin with, the bulging veins were the only way to tell I was using the Bayakigan. It wasn't quite what I hoped for, but it's now what I've got. My mom was quite upset that I experimented with my hair and eyes. No assurances wouldn't quell her motherly wrath, and she had made me come with her everywhere she went to ensure I wouldn't get up to any shenanigans this led to me sitting in the third training ground and watching my mom's progress with the Rasengan with a bored look on my face. I sighed. I was tired of watching my mom make the Rasengan wrong. Activate your Bayakigan and watch how I do it. I held my palm up and created a Rasengan. I looked over at my mother. She didn't seem to get it. I drilled my Rasengan into the ground and let it disperse. I held my hand out palm up. Rotation. I gathered chakra on my palm and started to spin it in multiple directions. Power. I increased the volume and density of the chakra on my palm but still kept it spinning. Containment. I created a shell around the spinning mass of chakra. I drilled the now done Rasengan into the ground and let it disperse. Okay, I got it. Lies, I watched her fail to create another Rasengan sigh. We were headed out to eat after a semi-successful day of Rasengan practice. Mom was nearly there. The shell of chakra around her Rasengan was thin and unstable, but with a day or two of practice she'd be done. Can we get a mission in or around another shinobi village? I wanted to steal some jutsu. Why? Honesty or bullshit? I want to steal some of their jutsu with my Bayakigan. Honesty. She hummed but didn't answer the question. Oh, yay, I'm currently being punished we arrived at mom's place of choice. Ichiraku Raymond I dully looked at Kishina as she devoured bowl after bowl of Raymond with relish. I side-eyed my mom, hoping she would make the smart decision and find a different place to eat. I wasn't in the mood to be smothered. It wasn't to be. Kishina. Mom approached Kishina with a dimpled smile and hugged her. Kishina didn't return the greeting as she was still too busy eating. I stood and stared with knitted brows, wondering when they became such good friends. I looked to Kishina's left and saw Makoto was watching the proceedings with a raised eyebrow. I decided to stay out Kishina's reach, so I headed over to Makoto's left. Hello Makoto-sama, it's been a while. I took the seat without asking. I didn't want to risk being refused. Hello Shiro, you look different. She remembered my name. How nice. I sent her a nod of acknowledgement and looked past her. Mom and Kushina were side by side and enjoying their meals with smiles on their faces. I blinked. Alright then I focused back on Makoto. I used medical ninjutsu to change the color of my hair and eyes. She probably could have guessed that or come to conclusions, but for the sake of politeness. I started making small talk. Oh, was it hard? Not really. Yes, it was, it took a long time. That was a filthy lie. But I had no interest in wasting my time changing people's hair and eye color. Topic change no jutsu. So, Makoto-sama, what have you been up to? 
She reached over and gave me some head pats. Just call me Makoto. She ignored my question. All right. I looked around wondering how I ordered. Can you order something for me Makoto? She nodded. One miso ramen with crispy pork please. I guess you just yell what you want. I sat and slowly ate my ramen. I was using my food as a shield against conversation. Makoto, Kishina, and mom seemed to be having a blast. Chatting laughing and having a grand old time which didn't bode well for my future peace at home i took a bite of pork hopefully no unexpected home invasions happened i sighed at the group i think this was my time to disappear i mumbled something about going to the bathroom and made a hasty exit i sent the ladies one last look before i shunshine home interlude i felt shiro's chakra disappear out of my range i hope he didn't think he was being sneaky shiro left i looked at kishina and admired her beautiful hair it's a shame she's not into women thanks kishina I didn't notice. I looked past Kishina. My first impression of Makoto was that she was a very gentle and kind woman. She was also attractive, though I don't think I could bet in it she her. They're known to be crazy after all. So, what have Minato and Kakashi gotten up to? I started a conversation hoping to get my mind out of the gutter. Oh, they've been doing missions non-stop I rarely see them. That's probably for the best from what I heard they aren't great company. Kishina threw a question back at me. What's Shiro been up to? He's been experimenting on his eyes and putting his future at risk. He created his own jutsu and also changed the color of his hair and eyes. Kishina smiled. Oh, what's it called? And what's it do? I saw Makoto perk up as well. I don't think Shiro would mind if I show them. Watch. I held my hand out, palm up. Rotation. I gathered chakra on my palm and started to spin it in multiple directions. Power. I increased the volume and density of the chakra on my palm. Containment. I created a shell around the chakra. Kishino and Makoto stared at the spinning mess of chakra. The shell was a little thin and misshapen, but I was close to completing it. Shiro calls it Heaven's Balm. I let go of my control, and the mass of chakra dispersed kicking up a small wind. I'm not good at it yet, but I will be soon. Wow, that's amazing. Kishina wrapped her arms around me and spun me around taking me off my seat. Kishina stopped spinning, and I was now looking at Makoto over her shoulder. That's extremely impressive, you should be proud. I felt my eyes moisten. I am. I wrapped my arms around Kishina and buried my head into Kishina's shoulder. I didn't want Makoto to see me cry during our first meeting. Eventually I blinked the tears out of my eyes and left Kishina's embrace. Shiro's grown so fast. One moment he was crawling on the ceiling like a human spider. The next he's creating his own jutsu. I missed so much. I can't wait until I have my own. Kishina patted her belly. I'm not sure how I feel about kids Makoto was stirring her ramen with her chopsticks. I wasn't sure about kids myself. I figured I wouldn't have them. But it's something you'll never regret. I know I didn't. Regardless of how it happened. The love you feel for your children is something you can't comprehend until you have your own. Another week passed. I was now no longer being punished and could now roam free. Thankfully my home remained uninvaded. And I didn't have to worry about Kishina ambushing me when I didn't expect it. We now had another mission to do for the month. I had requested a mission at or around another ninja village. I wanted to nab some jutsu, put the biokig to use. My mom arrived home scroll in hand. I got us a C-ranked mission to Suna. Good stuff. What's the mission? My mom had a mirthful smile on her face. An escort mission. Fuck. We were escorting a merchant from Kanoha to Suna. Which sucked what sucked even more is we likely wouldn't be allowed into Suna. I was escorting our client to the gate where my mother was waiting. I tried to use rock, paper, scissors to get out of merchant walking duty. But it was not to be. Mom was much faster than me, even with my perception slowed. She still beat me. Go to Hidetoshi was the name of the merchant. He also brought his son Ida along for our journey. Hidetoshi had grey hair and brown eyes. His son had both brown hair and eyes. Hidetoshi and his son had what I'd call an average build. They weren't fat which was a plus. Merchants who could afford to eat whatever they wanted and are not fat were admirable. Most merchants I've met were so fat that their body started storing fat in places it shouldn't be. Like the face and forehead. We arrived at the southern gate. The plan was that we'd travel southwest through river country stopping at Tani which was River's capital, and from there we'd make our way to Suna. A nice plan the village hidden in valleys or Tanigaka was located in River Country, and maybe I could send a shadow clone to have a peek and see what they had while we were at Tani. There was a second hidden village called Takum Village or the Village of Artisans, though I wasn't too interested in them, so they'd be left alone for the time being. I looked at my mom, she looked bored. I looked to Aide, he also looked bored. I looked at Hidetoshi, he didn't look any less bored. So, what are you selling, Hidetoshi? I used my hidden move cultivated over many merchant escort missions. Hidetoshi perked up and a smile appeared on his face. I've got a lot of honey, grain, and glassware, most of which I plan to sell in Tani. I'll fill any space I've made with water, and bring that to Suna Social Foo. Ask a merchant about his product. Works every time. The trip was quiet, none of us seemed to be much for conversation. Usually this is when Minato would carry the conversation with his charisma. But he was not here, and thus it fell to me to make small talk. Ide and I were at the back of the cart, watching the trees pass. Why are you traveling to Suna, Ide? I didn't care. 
but idle talk made the journey seem shorter. My mom and pa are on a break, mom said she needed space, and pa's been upset and throwing himself into work, so I'm traveling with him, trying to make sure he's alright you know. Yikes, now I have to fake sympathy. I'm sorry to hear that. What's your mom's name? Social Fu. Continue the conversation with a question. Mom's name is Fume. Fume, Nakayama Fumi. He blinked at me. Yeah, that's mom's family name from before she married Pa. Takumas has a new girlfriend called Nakayama Fumi. Oh, I've met her before. When your mom said she needed space she meant she needed some dick. It took us three days to reach Tani. I'd and Hidetoshi are going to set up shop and sell what they could for the next two days. That left me and mom to wander around Taki and entertain ourselves. I was far outside of town standing with my mother preparing to release my seal. I needed that extra chakra to make my clone last. I'm going to release the seal. Mom nodded. Alrighty the first use of the seal is a go. I brought a tendril of chakra to my seal and gave a twist. Chakra flooded my body. And I felt a tingling as the seal spread across my face. I smiled and laugh bubbled from my throat. Ha 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 ha. My grin could only be described as manic. Shiro. I let my head roll backwards so I could make eye contact with mom. That's me. I eyed my mother. Stop smiling like a creep and make your clone. Oh, yay I made a clone, giving it a good part of my chakra. The clone stared at me with a raised eyebrow. Get going idiot. The clone stuck his tongue before disappearing with a shunshun. I blew a breath out of my nose. I hate clones I sent a tendril of chakra to my forehead and deactivated the seal. That done I sat cross-legged and started sending my chakra back into the seal. Phew. What a trip having that much chakra saturating my body, made me a bit crazy. Let's get going, any nearby ninja will be coming to investigate the spike in chakra. Alrighty we were seated in our room. So, how did I look with that seal active? Hopefully like a badass. You looked insane. Or not. Did it look cool though? My mother was silent for a moment. It looked cool. I smiled. Good. We had to lay low for the rest of us stay. The clone should have dispelled by now, as the trip to Tanigaka only took half a day. The clone had been active for a day and a half, which wasn't good news for its sanity. Clones get a little silly after a day of accidents. Tomorrow we'd set off to sooner. Hopefully, the clone dispelled before then. It was midday and I was sitting in our room when my clone dispelled causing me to sigh. I arrived at Tanigaka. Henged as my brown head cannon fodder teacher minus the headband. Compared to Kanoha, this place was hot garbage. Though it did look nice nestled between the mountains. I easily snuck past the walls and into their city. Their senses were hot garbage as well. I looked at the sun. It was midday, and I had plenty of chakra. So, I'd take my time and explore the city. I walked all around the city by Akigan active mentally marking places of interest. There was a bank, the village leader's tower, the academy, the market, and so on, so forth. I spotted a pretty reed selling vegetables. I approached her with a smile. Hello miss, has anyone told you how beautiful you are today? She looked at me with disdain, a mocking smile on her face. No, they haven't bitch. Well good luck tomorrow. Her jaw dropped and I left feeling victorious. The day passed and I accomplished nothing of note. I wandered around Taki and pondered robbing their bank slash treasury. I decided that I'd give it a try if I had the time, and things went according to plan. I snuck into someone's house and slept on their couch. I got up bright and early and was leaning against the tower by Akigan Active, and reading Tanigaka's version of the Scroll of Seals. I was slowly browsing the techniques while deciding my plan of action for robbing the bank. Barrier Shattering Technique if a barrier is active, the user can see an enemy territory, and shatter the barrier source from within, while his team lends him chakra. Needed more than one person nope, earth release. Coil of earth. The user releases a row of rising earth towards an opponent, nope, self detonation technique. The user can cause themselves to explode with varying effects from simply blowing open a door to destroying a home. They may be able to control the strength of the explosion, blow up portions of their body, or severe parts of their bodies, and let it explode at contact with the enemy. No thanks hiding with camouflage technique. Maybe hiding. Animal possession technique. The user is able to take over the bodies of non-human animals. And I blinked. I focused on an innocent bird that had been staring at me the entire time I had been leaning on the building. Okay then I focused back onto the scroll. Body elimination technique. The user self-immolates I didn't plan on dying so nope. Mutual death technique. The user grabs one of their intended victim's hands, and forces it to assist in performing the necessary hand seals. Once this is done, the user and the victim die. That's a duck technique. Nope. Yin release. Jibakigan. This Jinjutsu brings out the victim's subconscious negative or hateful emotions. The caster can take advantage of these feelings and control the victim's actions. Nope. Ultimate death beyond terror. More useless Jinjutsu. All of Tanigaka's techniques were useless. They had nothing good. I looked at the Ambu in the ceiling. There were only two I focused on the village leader sitting at his desk doing paperwork. He had high Jonin level chakra, nowhere near as much as the Hokage. Weaklings I focused back on the bird, sitting on the ledge of the roof. It did have a stupid amount of chakra. I started tapping my foot. What do I do now? I focused back onto the scroll self-detonation technique. I started cackling. I knew exactly what to do. I walked a distance down the street humming a cheerful tune. I stopped, spun on my heel, and broke into a run straight towards the cage tower. A manic grin stretched across my face. 
I jumped and started making hand seals. I broke through the window. Surprise motherfucker. EOOM asterisk I sighed through my nose and started rubbing my eyes. My clone just tried to assassinate the leader of a village. Why didn't the Embu react to that? Maybe they were surprised. It's a shame the clone didn't see the leader's face I sighed. What happened to robbing the bank? The clone should have stayed away from the tower. Clones are so stupid I need to lie down. The mental stress of absorbing a day and a half of memories is a bit too much. It was still dark when I woke up. I looked at the clock. It seems I've slept for 14 hours. I've got 3 hours until everyone's up I sighed. I used my time to make another bone senbon. My mom woke up, just as I was about to start on my second senbon. Morning. Mom blinked at me with half-lidded eyes. She was still half asleep it seemed. My clone didn't get anything good, other than the self-detonation technique. Mom yawned and then buried her head into the pillow. Alrighty I focused back on my senbon. I rolled it between my fingers. Could I make them hollow and fill them with poison? Or are they better coated with poison or can I use a hollow senbon to extract stem cells? Mom had showered and was now awake and ready for the day. The clone I sent to Tanigaka didn't find any worthwhile jutsu. Mom wrinkled her nose. Not even a hide and technique. There was one. There was an animal possession technique. But there was a high risk of your human body dying and getting stuck in an animal body. If the jutsu was done incorrectly. Which made the technique too dangerous to learn. How do you plan to look at Suna's jutsu? I didn't know I certainly couldn't use clones. I didn't want another assassination attempt on a foreign cage. We'll see how it goes, it depends on the layout of Suna. Everyone was packed and ready to go. The only change to her appeal was a wide-brimmed hat and some sunglasses. Hidetoshi and I had replaced a lot of their goods with water. They both looked to be in a good mood, so I assumed that business was good. Everyone ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yup. Mom blinked at the variation of yeses that she got. Alright, let's go. I scratched my chin. How was the cart going to get through the sand? Suna had a sandstone road leading directly to it, which was good for both my chakra and the cart. I figured I'd have to water walk on the sand for the next two days, even walking on the sandstone path. Sand still managed to get into my shoes. I take the front of my left shoe on the sandstone, letting the sand escape from the open toe area. I looked at my shoes. They were called Tabi boots. They were a boot with no covering for the toes. The only plausible reason for no coverings was ventilation. I tapped my right shoe dislodging sand from it as well. Perhaps I can target my enemy's toes. We finally arrived at Suna after three days of travel. The trip to Suna was painful, though my pain was only mental. We ditched the father and son pair. They would make their own way into the village. They would employ Suna Ninja for the return trip and make their way back to Kanoha at a later time. Thus we were no longer needed. I assumed foreign ninja would not be allowed into Suna. My assumption was false. Mom and I were welcomed quite warmly. We got visitors passes with strict instruction not to wander after dark and we were sent on our way. The only thing of note was that they assigned us a room at our inn. It was a nice place so I had no problems with it. Suna's was much bigger than I had expected. The village was in fortified valley behind cliffs of rock with passage in and out restricted to a single entrance, making the area very hard to attack from the ground. I couldn't imagine how they kept their people well fed and watered then again. They probably didn't we were sitting in our room. I was in the bed cold up in the blankets. Mom was leaning against the wall. Head bowed with sunglasses covering her eyes and using her bayak again, probably looking for any hidden danger. Why were we let in so easily? I figured it was because they wanted us to spend money in the village. They're grateful we escorted some merchants supplying water and goods. They want us to escort some more merchants here, so they treat us well. And they want us to spend our money here. That's more like it. So, how's it looking? Meaning is it safe? Not too good. I saw the veins recede from her face. Meaning keep my mouth shut with being watched. Alrighty want to go explore what products soon has got. Mom picked up her backpack and slung it over her shoulders. That answered my question. I copied her and slung my own backpack over my shoulder. Time to look at the market. Suna was doing extremely well. I figured they would be on the verge of economic collapse. But that didn't seem to be the case. The market was bustling and full of life. I looked at their street food, some of it normal, some of it not. I eyed a fried scorpion. Hum, I wonder how crunchy that is. I walked side by side with my mom, a stick of small fried scorpions in hand. I was currently trying to summon the world to start on it. I took a deep breath and took a bite. E-R-U-N-C-H asterisk I chewed the scorpion and swallowed. Hum it tastes like beef jerky with a slight fishy taste. It's not that bad I took another bite. E-R-U-N-C-H asterisk C-R-U-N-C-H asterisk I finished my last bite of fried scorpion. Alrighty. I looked at the cage tower in the distance. I just needed to find a bathroom within my Bayakigan's range, so I could take a peek at their scroll in privacy. Or at least that was the plan. Their big round and stupid looking cage didn't have any easy shops around it. It seemed to be mostly administrative buildings and I guess I'll keep looking. What to do what to do soon as cage tower was surrounded by non-public buildings. I was having a hard time finding somewhere to sit and peek at their scroll. I thought this would be easy PC lemon squeezy, but it was actually difficult difficult lemon difficult. Can we go see Suna's cage building? Plan B. You can see it from here. Why are you being difficult? But I want to see it. 
I was now dragging her toward the tower. Finally, we were close enough to Suna's ugly ball thing. What a hunk of shit. We were a little less than a kilometer away from the tower. I activated my Byakugan. I noted the two Ambi following us, but quickly dismissed them. I scanned the tower roughly and quickly located where they kept their scrolls. Suna didn't have one forbidden scroll, they had a forbidden bookshelf with many scrolls. Nice. I started scanning the scrolls. Wine release. Infinite sand cloud. Nope. Wine release. Multi-layered gale. The user creates a wall of multiple layers of vacuum that are stacked on top of each other. This technique can be used to provide additional support to other defensive techniques. Nope. Water release. Water blade technique. The user raises a column of underground water from beneath their feet, which takes the shape of a high-pressure water blade. If one were to take a direct hit from the blade, it would cut clean through flesh and bone. Cool, but nope. Third eye technique. The technique Gari used during the Chunin exam's written test. It requires 10 hand seals nope. Magnet release. Imperial funeral I don't have magnet release so nope. Memory concealing manipulative sand technique. The user seals away the target's memories by burying an extremely small needle into the brain's memory center. The memories can be restored by canceling the technique, thereby destroying the needle. If a subordinate had this operation performed on their brains and has infiltrated an enemy camp, they can safely perform spy activity over a long period, with no memory of being a sleeper agent. This could help enhance their act as they will fully believe their loyalty lies with the ones they are spying upon. If the user cancels the technique, the target will once again remember their mission as a sleeper agent. Yet, yeah, I need to get closer to memorize the seal though puppet performance. Skillful achievement with a human body A puppet performance technique where chakra threads are attached to various spots on a person's body. The head, torso, both arms, and both legs. The person being manipulated gains the ability to not only use their techniques, but the skills of the puppeteer as well. The origins of this technique lie on the battlefield. When a puppeteer's puppets were all destroyed, they would begin using corpses. To perform this technique with a living person would normally require both parties to cooperate. However, a highly skilled user can control the target by force. If the person is severely weakened or damaged, rendering them unable to resist. Maybe there was some good stuff? But these scrolls noticeably lack Kinjutsu and Hidden Jutsus. I was mainly looking for the Jutsu the old lady uses to revive Gara. Perhaps they've been hidden elsewhere, Sai. I already needed to get closer to use Kokoro no Kaoka. I might as well just memorize everything there. Let's get closer. My mom sent me a stern look. Shiro, that's close enough. Meaning stop pushing your luck. Shit. What do I do? Oh, I blinked at the sudden brilliant thought I had. Alright. I've seen enough we started walking away from the tower. How good is your writing? I got an embarrassed smile in response. Oh boy, we had purchased writing supplies and were now 4 kilometers from the cage building. Sitting in a dongo shop. Well out of my range, but well within mom's. I don't know why I hadn't thought of this earlier mom was in the bathroom writing down as much as she could in a reasonable time. We would take the book back to our room where I would memorize everything before destroying the book. It was a good plan. Mom didn't want to write down anything in case we were caught with it. But I eventually persuaded her. Though I probably could have done it myself with telescopic vision. A waitress interrupted my thoughts. Excuse me, sir, would you like something to drink? What do they drink in Suna? What are my options? The waitress smiled sweetly. Yes or no? I blinked. Yes, please. The waitress gave me another smile before she left. Bitch. We left the restaurant and got back to our room in one piece. Mom closed the curtains before handing me the book she had hidden in her backpack. Thanks, I'll memorize it. Mom raised an eyebrow but nodded. I cracked it open and flipped around until I found the thing. I was the most excited about. Memory concealing manipulative sand technique the seal she drew wasn't pretty. But I got the point. I activated Kokoro no Kaioka and burned the seal into my memory. I then ripped the page from the booklet and ate it. Shiro, my mom of course wasn't happy. A few chakra enhanced bites in the page was no more. Sorry I was hungry. I didn't need that page to exist any longer than necessary ham. There were a lot of magnet release techniques. More than I had originally seen. There were also pages and pages of wind release techniques. I don't know why mom wrote these down I sighed and started memorizing the book page by page. Dawn broke and it was the start of a new day. Sadly, this was the day we leave. If I had a few more days I would have poked around more, maybe take a peek at their library. But sadly, mom was extremely eager to leave. So, I wouldn't be raiding Suna's library. We made it past the gate without trouble. I expected a bag search of some kind, but no such thing happened. They did watch us the whole time. But still, a little extrication never hurt anyone. What should we do with the techniques we stole? Keep them. What do you have in mind? I raised an eyebrow. We either give them to the Hokage or the clan head. Oh, Oh, I forgot she was loyal to Kanoha. I eyed her for a second. Will we get praise for sneaking into Suna and stealing their scrolls? Or will we be punished for risking potential conflict? Mom frowned and didn't answer. I only really planned on stealing these for myself. I had no intention of giving them to anyone. This was more of a test run. I didn't think things would go this well. It's up to you. I put the choice on her shoulders. We talked while we traveled. It was decided that our stealing would remain between us. 
Mom didn't want the reputation of being a thief, and I didn't want to give up my hard-earned loot. I traveled eight days to steal those jutsu after all I didn't feel like sharing. The trip back only took three days. The trip was much easier without the father-son duo slowing us down. I started asking Mom questions about her life trying to pass the time. Mom told me stories about her Genin team and the shenanigans they got up to. Sadly, she was the last surviving member of the team. The team split up after the Chunin exams, and slowly died off one by one. She told me about her parents and how her father died when she was young. Her mother was around for a while longer, but died on a mission gone wrong when she was 17. We chatted and I got to know my mother better, something I wouldn't have imagined could occur just two years ago. We passed through the gate with no trouble. Mom disappeared with a shunchen, and I followed her soon after heading home. Mom had beaten me home and thus beaten me to the shower. I was extremely annoyed, although I bathed in any rivers or streams. I passed it just couldn't compare to a warm shower. As if to taunt me, Mom started humming a cheerful tune. A-N-O-C-K asterisk, K-N-O-C-K asterisk, K-N-O-C-K asterisk. Hurry it up. I want my shower. The next day I sent three clones off to start on Fuenjutsu in the third training ground. Soon as Memory Seal renewed my enthusiasm for sealing I couldn't wait to start making seals. I figured there would be plenty of clone deaths. But as they returned any remaining chakra to me. I could continue to send them to their deaths, gaining valuable knowledge in the process. Lovely, I thoroughly enjoyed it when I didn't have to pay for my mistakes. I was storing my remaining chakra in my seal when mom interrupted me. Do you have any plans Friday? Lay in bed while my clones use their deaths to advance my fuenjutsu no. Do you have something in mind? I didn't want to do anything Makoto's invited us to dinner. Do you want to come? No thanks. Not interested. Mom cracked a smile. Let me rephrase that Makoto's invited us to dinner and you're coming. Why did you pretend I had a choice in the matter? I had three days until Makoto's dinner. I occupied myself by practicing lightning release while my clones worked on Fuenjutsu. I wasn't making much progress in either. But then again I'd only been working on them for a while. Progress would come with time. The day of the dinner arrived. Mom had forced me into a white kimono and sternly lectured me on proper manners. My manners were fine we stood in front of Makoto's house. It was a traditional looking building. I could already hear Kishina's laughter from outside. Sigh my mom didn't wait for me to compose myself and knocked right away. K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk after a few seconds I heard the knob jiggle and the door opened. Shiro, Sumiko, I'm glad you could make it. I didn't have much choice we were led inside. After we took our shoes off we were walked to the dining room where Minato, Kishina, Kakashi, and who I guess was Fugaku was sitting. Fugaku had brown hair and black eyes. I had expected him to have black hair. He wore a simple kimono with grey pants which had the Achiha emblem on them. I decided that I probably shouldn't be staring and turned away. I saw there was an empty seat beside Kakashi and figured that was for me. I made my way over to my apparent seat. Hello Kakashi. Kakashi sent me a dull stare and didn't respond. Okay then I took a seat and watched the proceedings. Minato and Fugaku were talking. Fugaku didn't seem too like Minato and was giving him the cold shoulder. Mom, Kishina and Makoto seemed to be the best of friends and were chatting and having a blast. Mom was telling them about our boring mission of course excluding any jutsu theft. Though I doubted the Achiha would care about jutsu theft so we decided to try for a baby. I tuned into the end of what Makoto was saying. I blinked. I looked at Fugaki who looked slightly embarrassed. So, is there going to be a baby Itachi soon? Cool I wonder if there's a way to make non-crazy clones. I would have used a clone to attend the dinner. If I was confident it wouldn't cause havoc, Minato spoke knocking me out of my thoughts. What have you been up to Shiro? I've been practicing Fuenjutsu and thinking about ways to get to the moon to capture an Otsutsuki. I've been learning Fuenjutsu. Minato raised an eyebrow. How's it going? Not well. Not well, everything I make explodes. Minato nodded. Fuenjutsu gets easier to learn after everything you make stops exploding. I think he's telling me to stick it out. Feel free to come to me and Kishina if you have any questions. How nice of him. I understand I nodded in thanks to Minato. Before continuing, if at first you don't succeed, find some who has succeeded, kill them, eat their flesh, and absorb their essence, and then succeed. The entire table was silent, and everyone was looking at me. Mom mouth cut it out. That was a joke. Nobody laughed. Alrighty eventually food was brought out, and everyone was served. I had stayed quiet but figured I might as well make another attempt at conversation with Kakashi. What's new Kakashi? Kakashi didn't answer for a moment. I'm practicing lightning nature transformation, starting on the path to the Chidori Oe. Nice. I sent him a nod and a thumbs up. I didn't know how to continue the conversation topic change. Kakashi, recently I learned a valuable lesson recently, and I would like to share it with you. Kakashi looked skeptical but nodded. Won't give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Kakashi rolled his eyes. Give a fish a man and he'll eat for a week. I nodded seriously, and Kakashi looked weirded out. Finally, we made it through dinner and it was time to go. Kishina ambushed me as I was leaving and squeezed the life out of me. 
She told me she missed me, and that I should visit her. After many promises I was released. Mom and I made our way out of the Achiha compound and started heading home. We arrived home without fanfare. Alright, I'm going to bed. Mom nodded. Good night, Shiro. I gave a little wave as I walked towards the shower. Night we were eating breakfast the next morning when I popped the question. Should I enter the Chunin exams? Mom shook her head. You should wait around a year before you take it. Hum, I'm approaching Jonin level, and I don't want to stagnate doing Genin missions for long. With my different enhancements and my seal, I was very much unbeatable to anyone below Jonin level. Sai, you can do the Chunin exam when you turn 8. So, in 10 months. Sounds good. I'll work on lightning release and fuinjutsu until then. Mom nodded. I need to teach you how to hide your chakra as well. As it is, you're a giant beacon of chakra. Alrighty. Hopefully, that wouldn't be too hard. I was using today to test an idea I had for a lightning jutsu. It was just a more guided version of lightning palm. Instead of letting the current run rampant, I was trying to make it target something. Mainly the heart or nerves. I wanted it to kill with a strike or cause immense pain. Both suited me fine. Sadly, the creation of the technique required a test subject. I didn't have one at the moment, so I was striking trees and trying different variations of chakra to see what happened. I wasn't making much progress, but I was learning. And that's all I needed to do. As long as I kept progressing things would be fine. Or at least I hope so. Interlude Shiro and Sumiko arrived completing Makoto's list of guests and signaling the start of the dinner. Shiro was a bundle of nervous energy. He couldn't stop himself from tapping his foot or fiddling with his kimono sleeves. The only time seeing Shiro seemed relaxed and happy was just after he fought. The only time I had ever seen Shiro get a full 8 hours of sleep was after he killed a cave full of bandits by himself, and then experimented on them. Shiro was a special one. Shiro took a seat next to Kakashi, and I returned to my conversation with Fugaku, putting Shiro out of mind. Fugaku and I have known each other for a long time and are sure of our love, so we decided to try for a baby. The girl's conversation gained the attention of the entire table at Makoto's words. Everybody gave their good wishes, and conversation continued this time about baby baby names. Conversation between Fugaku and I had died down, so I had to find someone else to converse with. I looked at Shiro and sent him my best smile. What have you been up to Shiro? Other than the normal hiding from human contact and experimenting on criminals. I've been learning Fuinjutsu. I raised an eyebrow and cocked my head. How's it going? It's good Shiro's found a way to occupy his time. Not well, everything I make explodes. I nodded. Fuinjutsu gets easier to learn after everything you make stops exploding. After I was no longer in danger of losing my limbs Fuinjutsu was smooth sailing. Feel free to come to me and Kishina if you have any questions. For all his faults Shiro was good company. I didn't mind teaching him and spreading the craft of Fuinjutsu to future generations. I understand. Shiro trailed off as he dipped his head to me, but then continued. If at first you don't succeed, find some who has succeeded, kill them, eat their flesh, and absorb their essence, and then succeed. The entire table was silent. Shiro seemed to have realized no one shared his humor. Though part of the problem was his deadband delivery, no one could tell it was a joke. That was a joke. Sai so eventually, Makoto brought out the sukiyaki, and everyone was served. I idly watched Shiro and Kakashi attempt to make conversation. What's new Kakashi? Kakashi and Shiro were both painfully socially awkward, leading to painful but entertaining exchanges between the two. I'm practicing lightning nature transformation. Kakashi had recently become Chunin and started on learning lightning release. Nice. Shiro sent Kakashi a nod and thumbs up. Kakashi, recently I learned a valuable lesson recently, and I would like to share it with you. Shiro started killing the conversation, something he often does when he gets nervous. Won't give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Kakashi rolled his eyes, making Shiro smirk. Give a fish a man and he'll eat for a week. Shiro nodded seriously, and Kakashi cocked his head in confusion. Oh, Shiro everyone had eaten and it was getting late. Kishina caught Shiro before he could slip away and hugged him to prevent any possible escape. Shiro, I miss you. You never come around anymore. She shook Shiro emphasizing how much she missed him. Shiro, you definitely have to visit more often. Shiro was tense. He didn't enjoy contact of any kind unless initiated by himself. No worries Kishina, I'll drop by more often. He likely wouldn't Kishina mentally exhausted Shiro. He never hung around with her for more than a few hours, and even then he would hide for the next few days to recharge. You better Shiro. Kishina was banned from Shiro's residence by Sumiko after she ambushed him early one morning. The only thing she could do was invite him over after she had been banned from invading his safe space, as Sumiko had put it. I will, I will, stop shaking me. Eventually, Shiro was released, and he eagerly made his way out of the Achiha compound, with Sumiko trailing behind him. He wasn't a bad kid, but his apathy and disregard for human life made me wary of him. Though perhaps I was mistaken time would tell. 
Shiro, my eternal friend. I'm not sure how I felt about the emphasis he used on the word eternal. Guy, it's been a while. Have you been youthful lately? Meaning were you just training or were you about to train? I was just fanning my flames of youth, my youthful friend. Meaning Guy already did his routine. Okay? Want to spar? Guy gave a nice guy pose, a thumbs up, wink, and winning smile. An excellent idea. Guy reached behind his back and pulled out some Nunlux. Since when did Guy use Nunlux? Here I come my youthful friend. Seriously why Nunlux Shiro? Hum, yes. Mom was staring at my new pet. Why do we have a rabbit? I didn't answer, but gestured to the rabbit. His name is Emergency Rations. He was my new pet. Who's going to feed him when we're on missions? He could fend for himself. No worries, I'll hire a Genin team to look after him. Hopefully no one let him out, he was near impossible to catch. What are you drinking? I was sunbathing and enjoying my alone time when Kishina started bothering me. It's the source of my strength. I looked at my drink and gave it a little swirl. It was pretty much a health drink. I was using resources faster. Then my body could get them from my normal food, and die created supplements. Thus my drink wants some. I offered her some, with a kind smile. I love some. I had a second cup beside me that I had intended to drink. Here you go. I gave the cup to her. Thanks. She didn't even have the cup a second before she took a swig. Huyoga. Kishina immediately started vomiting. She stumbled away from me and out of view. I continued to hear the sounds of retching for a few minutes afterwards poor Kishina 8 months had passed since Makoto's dinner. I had 2 months until my 8th birthday where I would then be allowed to take the tune in exams. I could now hide my chakra was passable with lightning release, and was able to make basic seals and copy simple pre-existing seals. Sadly, I wouldn't be making any original seals anytime soon. I spent a lot of time practicing the shunshun and trying to make it more efficient. I could now use it to travel long distances, and could now do multiple short shunshun jumps around an opponent. It was becoming my most used combat technique next to the gentle fist. My medical skills didn't make any progress for the first four months, until I started sending hench clones to any villages we passed. I'd let the clones run wild and heal anyone they could, it led to many shenanigans. But it also improved my medical ninjutsu, so I'd take what I could get. I also enhanced my nerves slash reflexes. A reflex is a simple and automatic response to a stimulus. If you touch something painfully hot you will automatically withdraw your hand, so it's a reflex. It's pretty much your brain receiving information via the nerves and your body reacting to it. When you touch something hot there's a small delay where you don't feel anything until your brain receives information from the nerves that the thing you're toughing is hot. The reason for this delay is how fast the signal can travel from the nerves in the hand to the spinal cord, to the brain, and back down to the muscles. So, I wanted my nerves to conduct signals faster. The first thing that popped into my mind was lightning chakra. Sadly, lightning chakra did more harm than good, and there were a few mishaps so, I spent time looking at different people mainly ninja and non-ninja. I realized that non-ninja had smaller nerves or neurons, while ninja had bigger neurons. Ninja didn't just have bigger nerves, their neurons were also insulated with a super salty conductive fluid that allowed for faster electrical transmission, something that civilians lacked. So, I just had to make my neurons bigger or more conductive. The only problem with making the nerves bigger was the lack of room. The nerves throughout the body, especially in the spine, only had a certain amount of room. If I wanted to make them bigger, I'd also have to make more room. It wasn't too much of a problem, my bones were already abnormally sturdy, and if I cut some bone away, it wouldn't affect me overly much. After my research was done I was ready to experiment. I caught 14 rabbits and attempted to enhance their nerves. I then had one nerve enhanced rabbit and a large amount of rabbit stew. The nerve enhancement worked, though not in a way I liked. The rabbit reacted to things faster, then he could see them. The rabbit's visual reaction time and his body's reaction time were very different now. The rabbit seemed to react to stimulus automatically before it could even comprehend what it was doing. I wasn't sure how I'd adjust to the same myself. If someone puts their hand on my shoulder, I might accidentally grab them and flip them. Or if someone launched a fire jutsu at me, my body could start automatically getting away from the hot and react before I even consciously registered that there was a jutsu coming my way. It wasn't a bad thing. I was just worried about opponents finding ways to use my reflexes to trap me. It was probably an unnecessary worry. But that didn't stop me from having anxiety about it. So, without further ado, I enhanced my nerves over a month's time. My enhanced nerves led to my body moving a lot on its own, something I had expected. If I knocked something off the table I would grab it before I even thought about it. If my mom threw a kunai at me my body would automatically start dodging before it even left her hand. It was nice. It made me faster and better able to react when using Chikaku no Kaoka. I'd liken it to having more pronounced instincts I'd hear the whoosh of a kunai slicing through the air from behind, and my hand would snatch it from the air and toss it back before I'd even thought about it. Now my body was reacting faster. Next, I needed my brain to do the same. I didn't know how that would look, perhaps my perception would be permanently slowed. I didn't know, but the speed the brain processed things had a lot to do with how fast the neurons conducted electricity. 
so perhaps enhancing the neurons in the brain would make me smarter. It was something I was wary of testing, but something I'd have to get around to. I wanted to scan Kakashi and Minato to see what made them smarter than average. There was a lot to do. I haven't seen you in a few days. What have you been up to? I've been looking for some Byakugan that won't be missed. I've been meeting with different clan members and trying to make friends. I wanted some spare Byakugan in case something happened to my own. Any success? Some. No, most of the clan are unlikable. I ended up deciding that I should wait until the war starts to nab some Byakugan. Shiro, you've been moody lately. Yes, it was almost that time of the month. We have to do a mission soon. I didn't like missions. I'll let you pick if that will make you feel better. It wouldn't, but I'd never turn down an opportunity to pick a mission. Things went as they usually did. I looked at the missions with disgust while my mom held back her laughter. There were only two options that weren't total garbage. Both be ranked. There was a Rouge Canova Shinobi that escaped to the land of vegetables. It'd take about 10 days of travel to get there, and we'd have to pass between both Lightning Country and Water Country by boat. And there was a one-armed Miss Jonah named Adana Roiko that had taken over a village on the border of fire country and noodle country. This trip would take around three days. I wasn't interested in a near month long mission we arrived at the border of noodle country. The village was about five kilometers away. We had stopped and mom was checking using this time to check the situation in the village. Judging by the look on her face, it wasn't looking good for the villagers. How's it looking? Mom blew a heavy breath from her nose. The men are dead, only the women and children remain. Meaning murder hobo Ryuko had been having a blast raping and murdering his little heart out. So can I fight him? With my gravity seal off I was confident I could kill our target. As long as you're careful. Sweet, my first jonin. We approached slowly, eventually. We got within a kilometer, and I was able to see our target. He was tall with cyan hair and eyes, he had a katana next to him marking him as a swordsman. He was having a hearty meal and being serviced by the naked village women. He was living it up I spotted the kids they were in a different part of the small village, and being cared for by what I'd call the ugly village women Sai. What do we do with the villagers after I kill Ryuko? I hope we could just leave them. I wasn't interested in walking at civilian speed to the nearest town or city, we'll figure that out later. Our righty want to guard the children. I didn't want Ryuko to get any hostages after all she nodded and disappeared towards the children. I was within 200 meters of Ryuko. He had finished his meal, bent one of the women over the table, and was now thoroughly enjoying himself. The other women were cleaning up the table ignoring what was happening just a few feet from them. I held back my scythe this was what happened when you were powerless in the Naruto verse. I arrived at the house and activated Chikaku no Kaoka and my perception slowed. Ryoko was occupied, most of the women were in other rooms, with only three remaining in the dining room slash kitchen. Acceptable causalities I took a deep breath before barreling through the wall with a one for all enhanced punch. A second one for all punch sent Ryoko flying through the house and out into the street. He tumbled and tried to recover, but his pants were around his ankles, so he only flailed around and continued to tumble into another house. I walked out of the hole I had created ignoring the screams and waited for Ryoko to get his bearings. He stood up and kicked off his pants. You can put those back on. I'll give you some time. I wasn't interested in getting literally dick slapped. Ha ha ha. You got me good. Ryoko ignored my generous offer and charged. He was naked and without his sword and arm, so I didn't know what he hoped to accomplish. We engaged in a flurry of blows. Ryoko used his arm to block my gentle fist strikes and lost use of it, and one for all kick to the chest sending him tumbling again. Lacking both arms and his sword Ryoko wasn't living up to his rank as a jonin. You bitch. Ryoko got his feet under him and took off in a sprint towards the forest. A quick shunshun and a swipe with a chakra scalpel and Ryoko was short ahead while I had gained one. Ha ha ha. I chuckled. I deactivated my Byakugan and Chikaku no Kaoka. I grabbed Ryoko's head by its hair and made my way over to my mother. I see that your fight went well. When people couldn't tell you were a Hayuga, they tended to use their limbs to block your strikes. Yes, as you can see, I came out ahead. I waved Ryoko's head around for effect. Shiro, she sent me a stern look. What? Ryoko thought that was funny. Didn't you Ryoko? I held up the head, grabbed its jaw, and started making it talk. Ha ha ha. It was very funny Shiro. My mom shook her head. Stop playing around, go seal Ryoko up. I blink innocently at her. And I mean all of Ryoko. She then started walking towards the house Ryoko had been occupying the surviving villagers were rounded up. Ryoko had done a number on the woman and they required some healing. So we would be staying the night while I healed them. And they gathered their things so we could drop them off at a neighboring village. I took some time to check Ryoko's belongings for potential loot. His only possessions were his sword, kunai, a picture and the money he looted from the villagers. I looked at the picture. It was a younger Ryoko standing next to a brown-haired, big-nosed, bearded man who had his hair in a top knot. Nothing useful. 
I sealed Roko's belongings and left the money for the villagers to collect I was startled awake by my mom. I locked eyes with her and realized whatever was happening was serious. We're being watched by a team of hunting in. That was not good. I activated my Bayakig and extending my range as far as I could. Yeah, I see them. There were four of them, which didn't bode well for us. There would be no peaceful solution. We had a body that they were supposed to dispose of. The whole reason for hunting down missing Nin was so we could uncover village secrets from their bodies. And Kiri's hunt and then killed their own missing Nin to prevent that so, we had a conflict of interest, we couldn't just hand them the body, even if we did, they would still hunt us down. There was also the village folk to consider. I briefly focused on a building full of sleeping children. I watched as mom put contacts in her eyes, making them black. Nice. I gave her a thumbs up. If they don't know you're a Hyuga then they won't dodge your strikes. So, what's the plan? Hopefully we are abandoning the village folk and racing straight towards Kanoha. We're going to lead them away from the civilians and engage them. I didn't like the sound of that. We're not leaving the villages. A boy could hope. No, we're not. Damn it so, what's the plan? Mom jumped out a window and shunshined into the surrounding forest. Three hunter nin followed her leaving my range. It seems jumping out the window before anyone could protest was the best way to solve arguments Sai. I was sitting in the house watching the remaining ninja. He was short with pure white hair and purple eyes. He was slowly checking each house and making his way to my own. He wasn't a sensor. Then again, the others weren't as well. He approached our house and took a look in the window. I jumped at the wall. My Bayakugan and Chikaku no Kaioka active. The OOM asterisk guy burst from the wall barreling towards him with a one for all enhanced punch. The punch got him. But he promptly turned to liquid upon contact with my fist. I blinked. A clone. He reformed right before my eyes. I blinked again. He took out his tanto and charged me without a word. I sent another one for all punch only this time stronger. POOF asterisk half his body scattered into water droplets, only to reform a second later. Cool. I grinned. He came at me again, and I again scattered him with a one for all punch. I was thoroughly enjoying fighting an opponent that didn't turn into a bloody mist when I punched them. Sadly, I couldn't play for much longer. I struck his arms with some gentle fist strikes while he was reforming. He tried to move his arms with no success. It seems he's only immune to physical attacks. Chakra seems to work fine. He jumped back putting some distance between us. What did you do? Sorry friend, I'd love to chat but I've got things to do. I started towards him and he did the same. His body turned into liquid and started squirming towards me. That looks gross. Sorry, friend. I made a hand sign and launched a stream of lightning at him. It was extremely effective. He returned to his human form unconscious. I walked over and struck him in the heart. My enemy was no more. I sealed him up and disappeared in a shunshun towards the direction my mom left in. Mom as it turns out wasn't very far. She had kept me within her range and circled the village keeping the hunter nin busy. I was supposed to flee and return with help from Kanoha. It sounded like she wanted to sacrifice herself to save me not on my watch. I shunshined behind her slowest pursuer and tapped him on the back of the neck, severing his spine with my chakra scalpels. Ambush. He fell from the branch. E-R-A-C-K asterisk. I blinked. What did he break? I didn't expect him to speak. My super surprising surprise attack did as I expected. Though I now had everyone's attention. Everyone was staring at each other. We were in a tense standoff. It's a lovely night to bath in the blood of a child. I chuckled. Way to ruin the atmosphere where though things were quiet for a moment. Mom looked positively ferocious and jumped at the weirdo starting their fight. Mom and the weirdo took their fight elsewhere leaving me and the last ninja staring at each other. So, how's your day been? Let no one say I wasn't polite. It was good until you killed my nephew. Which one was his nephew? Sorry about that. He shook his head. It's part of the trade. His piece said he launched a handful of Semben in my direction. I dropped to the ground avoiding them before he had even completed his throw. I watched him go through some hand signs. He pointed both of his hands at me making finger guns. And promptly launched a huge blast of water in my direction. Nope. I shunshined behind him, hitting him with a one for all punch. My hand went straight through him. Ah, another water person. I jumped away letting him reform. So, what clan do you belong to? I was stalling so I could focus on mom's fight. She was kicking ass. I don't know why she was so worried. I also wanted to know what bloodline let him note my punches. He didn't have white hair like the other guy, but he did share the same purple eyes. I'm a member of the Hazuki clan. That sounds familiar, ah? Uh, Kiri had a cage from that clan. I heard Kiri had a cage from your clan. He didn't waste any time and jumped at me running through three hand seals. Small talk ignored his right arm bulged and became extremely muscular. He swung his sword at me using his enlarged arm. I met his strike with my own one for all enhanced punch. The OOM asterisk our clash created a shockwave that rustled the nearby trees. We both jumped back to gain space. I eyed his sword. Can he even use physical attacks without the sword? Would he just turn into the water with every impact? Hum we continued staring at each other. I took a deep breath used a single hand sign. And my right hand sparked with blue lightning. My opponent tensed. Which was a good sign. I increased the amount of electricity on my hand. I sent him a cheeky wink and shunshine to his left and struck him in the ribs with my hand. His body seized and I used my other hand to attack his leg and disable it. I jumped back and looked at him, waiting for some other trick or hidden move. He looked resigned, his um deflated, and regained its normal appearance. 
You're a monster, kid. Thanks, I try. Thank you. I sent him a nod. He shook his head. It wasn't a compliment. He tensed before his whole body liquefied and he sprung at me. A single hand sign and a lightning arrow struck the jumping blob. He returned to human form and kneeled on the ground, still conscious. I readied another more powerful lightning arrow to finish him. Though it seems he beat me to it. Ha ha ha. I'm glad I won't live to see a monster like you grow any further. He burst into a tower of flaming blue chakra. I jumped back putting more space between us. There was no explosion, his body just disintegrated. I haven't seen that before seeing that there was no danger I focused on mom's fight. She seemed to be finishing up, the weird O's arm was dangling, and he was favoring his left leg. Hum a few hand signs and a clone popped into existence. He wandered off to find the other hunter Nin's body, and make sure the villagers were okay. I focused back on my mother, she seemed fine, but I figured I should ask. I signed a message at her. Need enemy assistance, I then gave a thumbs up, and then a thumbs down. She gave me a thumbs down and engaged her enemy again. Alrighty, I guess I was watching then mom was playing with her opponent. She'd give him an opening, and when he went for it, she'd strike him destroying his body. She slowly, strike by strike destroyed his body, until he could no longer even stand. Eventually, she obliterated his head with a Rasengan. I decided she had things well in hand. I deactivated my Byakugan and Chikaku no Kaoka. I started making my way to the village. I dispersed my clone. The villagers had stayed put. I figured they'd run and scatter into the forest, but apparently not. They just huddled together awaiting whatever fate they'd be subject to. They should have scattered, it would at least annoy the hunter Nin had they chased them. And it would lighten the burden mom and faced in taking them to another town I had the younger Hazuki laid in front of me. Other than the high amount of moisture in his body there was nothing of note. As far as I could tell anyway meaning his fluidization had more to do with his chakra. I heard a displacement of air behind me, signaling mom's arrival. So, what's the plan now? I wanted to let the villagers fend for themselves. I wasn't interested in playing Shepard. You should be more on guard Shiro. I am. I don't have to worry, with you watching my back. Besides, I've got an interesting subject to focus on. Shiro seal him up before his chakra fades. Or not. We left the village in the morning. The women had hooked up a cart and were now traveling in style. That style being surrounded by children and taking everything they could fit on themselves in the cart. A kid with brown hair and eyes interrupted my piece. Do you think I could become a ninja like you? Not unless you're a descendant of literal space gods. Yes. With hard work anything is possible. The kid smiled at me and left. Hopefully the kid didn't become a ninja. Having brown hair and eyes meant you were cannon fodder in the Naruto verse. We made it to the nearby village. It was a little deeper into noodle country, and pretty unremarkable. So, can we leave now? They added another day onto the mission, something I was unhappy about. Yes, their fate is in their own hands now. They were citizens of noodle country, so we had no obligation to help them. Unless mom was feeling generous, which didn't seem to be the case. We departed, leaving the villagers on the outskirts of the village. You've been quiet, what's on your mind? I was pondering making a chakra drill on my finger similar to the Rasengan. I'd like to poke people and have them die. Not that I didn't already do a lot of that. I was thinking of ways to improve my tajutsu. Mom shook her head and sighed. Sigh of course you are, what's that mean? I raised an eyebrow. You're already Jonan level, you should slow down and enjoy life. I was enjoying life. What wasn't fun about creating new techniques? All right. I said instead. I didn't want to argue. Mom sighed again. Anyways, this will probably get you bumped up to Tokibetsu Jonan at least. Which was good. I wasn't interested in the tune-in exams. So, she was bringing it up because she had some sort of point. She wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. Meaning you will have new responsibility and opportunities. I wasn't getting it. Like what? Mom took a deep breath, she looked like she was annoyed that I wasn't getting it. You will be expected men to graduating gen in teams, and pass or fail them depending on how they've done. You also might be offered a position in the Anbu or somewhere else. Meaning Root probably I'm not interested in joining the Anbu. Mom nodded. Wise choice. She took another deep breath. This mission might become a A-ranked or S-ranked mission, depending on how much they value the Hazuki corpse. Why an S-ranked mission? What makes the corpse so important? Probably potential bloodline theft. It becomes more important depending on how many village secrets the body revels. As far as I knew they mainly looked into chakra types, herbs eaten, ninjutsu, special medicine used, and KK Genkai when examining recovered bodies. Alrighty. I yawned. I didn't understand what might make the corpse so valuable. I decided to put it out of mind. I wouldn't gain anything from thinking about it. We arrived at Kanoha in the evening. I was able to escape from having to attend the debriefing after writing my mission report. So, I made my way home eager for a shower. Hopefully mom's account was enough, she had seen everything after all. I was tired and grumpy hopefully they didn't need me. I didn't have the energy to be pleasant to be around at the moment. It was a new day and I was feeling better than I had yesterday. We have a meeting with the Hokage tomorrow, though that might change. What's he want? Probably to discuss promotion, he wants to discuss possible promotion, and he wants to hear about your version of the engagement. I sighed, I included my fights in my report. 
Don't sigh at me, riding white-haired guy nope my punches by turning into creepy liquid doesn't accurately describe your engagement with the enemy. I think that described plenty, though to be fair I was in a foul mood when I wrote that. Alright thanks. Now I needed to work on the Chidori or some other way to put my hand through my opponent's chest. Also, we need to go see a cousin of mine. Her name's Shime, and she just had a baby, and has been bugging me to visit her. It seems I wouldn't be putting my hand through anyone for a while. I was sitting while holding baby Sakai while mom and Shime chatted and did dishes. Hariyama, Shime's husband sat across from me, and watched it I rocked baby Sakai. You're very good with babies. You've only seen me with one baby yes, I'm surprised it's going so well. Hariyama inclined his head. It's a good thing I'm sitting, usually I'd have dropped the baby at least twice by now. I've never held a baby before, but who didn't appreciate a little humor. I think I'll take her back now. Hariyama snatched little Sakai from me, evidently not appreciating my joke. Thanks for letting me hold her, it's the first time I've held a baby without dropping it. The look of horror I got was delicious. Don't worry about it the baby wouldn't remember being dropped. The look of disgust I got only furthered my desire to bother him. You don't drop babies, do you? No, I do not. No, that was supposed to be a joke. Though it was only for my amusement. Dropping babies is not a laughing matter. Clearly if you had seen someone dropping a baby, you'd understand how funny it was. Hariyama huffed and left the room, meaning further conversation was successfully avoided. Oh, well I looked at the kitchen, mom and Shine were still chatting. I think it's time I bail. I had regained my day and was now ready to experiment. I had tried to create Chidori many times with no success. I had long forgotten any training Sasuke did to learn the Chidori, or if his training was even shown. So, I needed to create something different. I wanted to create a spinning drill of chakra around my hand. Similar to the Rasengan it would require no hand seals. Or at least that was the plan. It shouldn't be too hard as I already did something similar with the Rasengan. It was a new day and I had around 4 hours until I met with the Hokage. Meaning emergency rations was getting a stem cell transplant, and if things went well. I'd use those stem cells to repair any damage that happened while I tried to enlarge his chakra system. And when I came back from the meeting with the Hokage, I'd try to grow organs with stem cells. If that worked out, I'd just have to regrow my Byakugan if it ever got damaged. Or maybe I could grow Byakugan in other people that was quite the thought. Growing Byakugan in others I liked the idea, but I imagine the Hyuga clan wouldn't. If I could regrow organs that would be a huge contribution to the village, perhaps enough to get a lab. Thoughts for later. The meeting with the Hokage approached emergency rations, had his chakra capacity increased, but his chakra density and regeneration remained the same. Meaning even if he had the capacity of a genin he couldn't regenerate chakra like someone at genin level should be able to. Forcefully expanding his chakra network caused his pathways to become thin and fragile. So it wasn't something I'd do to myself, though perhaps they would heal over time. The natural expansion of the chakra network seemed to be the way to go for the moment. Even though it didn't completely work I'd still created a ninja rabbit, all he needed now was an increase in physical and spiritual energy. Physical energy could be increased with liberal use of Kinyoku Kaoka, but I was unsure about how I could increase emergency rations spiritual energy. I eyed emergency rations as he was enjoying some fruit. I can't teach him how to meditate yet. Perhaps in the future I sat in the waiting room pondering the wonders of ninjutsu. So far it had been useless. But all the strongest ninja seemed to toss ninjutsu around like there was no tomorrow. Should I bother learning more nature transformations? I had already planned on learning earth release. But it seemed like a huge time sink for no real reason. I did also have a ton of wing jutsu from Suna. Those Suna seemed to have kept their kinjutsu and hide jutsu elsewhere. I was happy having a lot of options. Should I want to learn? It was probably pointless to think about learning another nature transformation. When I hadn't even gotten that far into lightning ninjutsu. I only had 5 techniques to my name after all. I was close to giving up learning any more nature releases. They seemed to be huge time sinks. My time might be better spent elsewhere. Shiro Hayuga. The Hokage will see you now. Alrighty I made my way to the Hokage's office and knocked on the door. A-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk enter. Showtime. I made my way inside and stood in front of the Hokage who had been eyeing me as I entered. I stood in silence while the Hokage stared at me. Finally, the Hokage spoke. Shiro Hayuga, due to your contribution during your recent mission and significant combat potential, I'm promoting you to Tokubetsu Jonin. I bowed at my waist. Thank you. Hokage-sama. I kept my bow for a few seconds before rising. The office had descended into silence. I wondered if this was deliberate, or if the Hokage was just getting old, and forgot what he was doing. You and your mother will remain on the same team as it has been effective thus far. That was ideal as far as I was concerned, more time with my mother and possibly more dangerous missions. Two things I like the sound of, you're dismissed. This meeting was short, I sent the Hokage another bow. Thank you for your time Hokage-sama. I started retreating from the room. 
I had a rabbit to experiment on after all. Shiro, I was enjoying some pre-experimentation jerky when my mother interrupted me. Yes, I looked at the cage containing emergency rations. He seemed to be doing well. Every decision made in fear is wrong. Every decision you make should be made in confidence. What? What brought this on? Why was I getting advice? I was just thinking about all the advice I wish my parents had given me before they passed. Meaning she didn't want to leave me with regrets. Thanks. I sent her an appreciative nod. I meant it. It means a lot that she was thinking about me. Though an I love you would be nice as well. Come give me a hug. Every touching moment needs a hug. Mom didn't agree and fled the room. I blinked. All right, no hugs for me. I looked back to emergency rations. He was blissfully unaware of what was about to happen. Emergency rations seemed to be doing fine, though he was now well muscled. I opted to just speed up cell division and shorten his lifespan a tad. I'd see how stem cell transplants worked in maintaining youth. Though there seemed to be a bit of cell rejection, it wasn't as bad as I had expected. Perhaps Chakra had something to do with it. Now what I needed to do was grow some organs. Perhaps emergency rations needed a second heart. One could never have enough hearts after all. Though I think I'll wait until tomorrow interlude. Hayiga, Kagaya, Shiro Gender. Evil birth date. November 9th, 1211 age. 8 years rank. Gen and marital status. Single. Textual summary of the report. Openness to experience three one hundreds. Very low traditionalist bullet down to earth bullet practical bullet conservative bullet prefers traditional outlooks and technical problem solving bullet experimental conscientiousness ninety five one hundreds. Very high conscientious bullet discipline bullet efficient bullet well organized bullet likes precise detail bullet strong sense of duty bullet could be described a workaholic extroversion one one hundredth. Very low reserve bullet formal bullet serious bullet quiet bullet prefers working alone bullet avoids direct leadership roles agreeableness 55 one hundredths. Middle hard headed bullet skeptical bullet compared Competitive bullet good natured. Bullet prefers competition over cooperation, natural reactions, 88 100 high experiences, negative emotional reactions, and feelings of anxiety. Bullet prone to worry, bullet easily upset, bullet playful note. Shiro doesn't respect social norms. He consistently oversteps social boundaries. Very little regard is shown for people not close to himself. Shiro has displayed the battle lust that the Kagaya are known for, but it has not shown to be a hindrance. Most of Shiro's free time is spent with Mike Guy, even then Shiro is training. So it is debatable if this could be considered free time. Looking at Shiro's personality, the evaluation provided very little information that I couldn't already glean from my meetings with the boy. Shiro's analytical reasoning, memory, mental speed, spatial IQ, logic IQ, and nonverbal IQ were ridiculously high, surpassing everyone in his age range, though some scores were average. He was also described as a chakra savant, though I didn't get the impression he was mentally deficient. He was perhaps a prodigy similar to myself and Orochimaru. Shiro reminded me of a young Orochimaru who was also complex, though lacking Orochimaru's sadistic nature and manic ambition. Thankfully he doesn't create conflict to ease his boredom, instead opting to make jokes. Creating conflict was one of Orochimaru's hobbies that I found most distasteful, not including human experimentation. Something he and Shiro seemed to have in common, though thankfully Shiro had turned to animals as of late. Shiro also seemed to have a penchant for body modifications as Orochimaru does, though thankfully to a lesser extent, so far only improving his eyes. Though that could change in the future. Orochimaru was once a child as well before he became what he is today. Hopefully, Shiro wouldn't follow in his footsteps. It's probably for the best I keep them separated. Shiro doesn't need any ideas from Orochimaru. Sai Shiro also lacked the will of fire. He did not see the village as a family as I did. Then again neither did Orochimaru, and he turned out fine. Unstable but fine though at least Shiro had things he loved and would protect. I should put it out of mind. I flipped through his mission report. It would provide insight into his thought process. We arrived at the border of Noodle Country, and quickly found the village slash house Ryoko was occupying. It was decided that I would fight Ryoko while my mother guarded the civilians. Ryoko was occupied with some village women who I deemed acceptable casualties. Even though them dying wouldn't be a huge loss. I'd rather not deny a child his mother, so I elected to eject Ryoko from the house. A chuckle escaped my lips. According to Sumiko, Shiro had burst into the building, punched the missing nin through a wall and into the street. Eject was an apt word to describe what happened. Ryoko was in an embarrassing state of undress. So, I kindly offered a temporary truce so Ryoko could dress. My kind offer was ignored, and Ryoko ran at me only wearing his shoes. I decided that such a pervert shouldn't be allowed to live for longer than necessary. Our fight was quick, I disabled Ryoko's arm in our first engagement and removed his head from his body when he tried to flee. I came out ahead in the engagement. Shiro liked to amuse himself by making dark jokes and making others uncomfortable. Even during mission reports my mother and I regrouped. It was decided that we would escort the villagers to the nearest village. We would leave in the morning after the villagers were healed and had gathered their things. Sadly, our plans were interrupted. For Hunter Nin interrupted my beauty sleep, earning my ire. My mother decided that she would distract the Hunter Nin. 
while I fled to Kanoha for reinforcements. I heavily disagreed but was not given the chance to voice my opinion as my mother had jumped out the window before I could protest. Three of the hunter then followed her as she fled, leaving the last to search the village. I decided that I wouldn't be returning to Kanoha alone and engaged the remaining hunter then. The white-haired guy noped my punches by turning into creepy liquid. I'd call the liquid snot-like, disobeying orders from a superior but also saving Sumiko from certain death. Sumiko likely talked to him about disobeying orders so I won't bring it up. And comparing the Hazuki's hydrification technique to snot I punched him again and disabled his arms as he reformed. He turned into snot and jumped at me, likely trying to suffocate me. I decided that I was having none of that and shocked him with a lightning jutsu. He reformed unconscious. I killed him as I didn't want him interfering with later fights. I ran after my mother and caught up with her in little time. I employed a sneak attack and killed the slowest hunter then. He had time to warn his teammates of danger, so sadly, I couldn't further thin the herd. We stared at each other for a while until mom broke the stalemate and started fighting one of the hunter nin. They took their fight a distance away while I and the last hunter nin remained. I and the other hunter nin made polite conversation where I apologized for killing his nephew. Making polite conversation and apologizing for killing his nephew, I stroked my beard. The hunter nin started the engagement by tossing some senbon at me, which I promptly avoided. He used the time his thrown senbon had bought to launch a water ninjutsu at me. I shoeshined behind him and tried to punch him in the spine. He turned into snot and my hand passed right through him. I tried to engage in some small talk, but was ignored, I quirked my eyebrow. Small talk. His arm turned huge and muscular, and provided him with a boost in strength. We clashed, our strengths matching. We both jumped back and stared at each other, realizing that another clash wouldn't benefit me. I started preparing a lightning jutsu. The hunter nin didn't seem too like that I had lightning on my hand and tensed. This action confirmed my thought that his snot body had a weakness to lightning release. I shun shine to him and struck him with my jutsu. I used the opportunity to cut the tendons in his leg preventing escape. In a last ditch attempt in winning the fight, the hunter nin turned into snot and jumped at me. He was pretty much asking to be shocked. Jumping made him an easy target, so I struck him with a powerful lightning jutsu. He reformed and kneeled looking defeated. I readied my finishing blow, but he beat me to the punch and took his own life, making his body unrecoverable in the process. My fight done with I sent a clone to check on the villagers while I checked in on my mother. I didn't need to read any further, Sumiko's report had covered their return trip. I skimmed some earlier mission reports. The lower the mission rank the more ridiculous the report. Perhaps silly should be listed as a notable trait. I flipped through Shiro's file taking note of his combat assessment. Tijutsu. 4.5 slash 5, ninjutsu. 4.5 slash 5, jinjutsu. Hero slash 5, intelligence. 5 fifths strength. 4 fifths speed. 5 fifths stamina. 4.5 slash 5, hand seals. 3 fifths total. 29.5 slash 40 what I've seen from his training made me sure these ratings were accurate. Though perhaps his physical scores should be lower. Shiro fell short in terms of jinjutsu. And his physical attributes were only that strong when he used ninjutsu to supplement them. His score should perhaps be closer to 25. He was lacking experience as well. Though he had the strength to be a jonin when he was using ninjutsu. He excelled in tojutsu and medical ninjutsu but was lacking in other areas. Something that could be rectified in time I made up my mind. Shiro Hayuga would be promoted to Tokubetsu jonin. Shiro was a prodigy if properly nurtured his contribution to the village might surpass my own though that would perhaps be a long time off a n o c k asterisk k n o c k asterisk k n o c k asterisk enter the boy entered and stood at attention in front of my desk i took the time to eye him he looked small he didn't look like he could kill three experienced kiri hunter nin he was only eight and already had chakra reserves higher than most jonin and his reserves are nowhere near done growing young shiro had gotten nervous and was shifting his feet Shiro Hayuga, due to your contribution during your recent mission and significant combat potential, I'm promoting you to Tokubetsu Jonin. That and politics. The more influence Shiro had the safer he was from the Hayuga clan. Thank you, Hokage-sama. He bowed deeply. I wanted to put Shiro on a different team, but was doubtful he would make any bonds, which was what he needed. Shiro had few people tying him to the village, and thus few things that could be used to control him. Those that were powerful, unrestrained, and uncooperative often had unfortunate accidents during missions something Danzo swore he wasn't involved in, I suppose press the urge to roll my eyes. Danzo wasn't fooling anyone. I wanted Shiro to make bonds so I couldn't put him in Anbu, he would only further seclude himself there. I couldn't put him in a team of people older than himself, as it was likely he wouldn't become invested in the lives of his teammates should there be a drastic age difference. Perhaps he would become invested should he train a team himself. But he was 8, and was too young to mentor any genin. Perhaps my only option is to keep him with Sumiko. He seemed to be doing well with her. You and your mother will remain on the same team as it has been effective thus far. When Mike Guy graduates perhaps Sumiko, Shiro, Guy, and a fourth member can form a team. Perhaps Asuma you're dismissed. Maybe more options will present themselves in the future. But for now my hands seem tied. Thank you for your time Hokage-sama. I took my pipe from my desk. I'll indulge a little. Half a year passed. Not much changed. 
I got a Jonin jacket that stayed tucked away in my closet. My promotion came with an increase in mission level, we now sometimes did A ranked missions. Which wasn't so bad as I enjoyed fighting stronger enemies. I had dropped nature release for the most part as I seemed to lack talent in it. I'd still keep learning new lightning releases and improving old ones, but that was as far as I'd go. Even with three clones working on lightning release every day for nearly a year. I made little progress. I couldn't imagine how long it'd take for me to learn a nature release that I didn't have an affinity for. I wasn't sure if I'd regret this in the future as almost every strong ninja knew more than one nature release. But I could always come back to it in the future. Emergency rations was whole and hail, though he had all of his organs replaced and many rabbit stem cell transplants. And two hearts he was doing pretty well all things considered. I was torn between trying to give him the Byakugan or trying to increase his intelligence. Both were things I was interested in, and both had the potential to go wrong. I eyed emergency rations. Perhaps I should let him go free for his services him. I wanted to see how long he would live if I consistently gave him stem cell transplants. Rabbits live for a year or two in the wild, but can live for as long as a cat or dog, when kept as a pet. Perhaps I should get an animal with a shorter lifespan. A mouse then they only live for a year or two sire I was already trying to pick up a new project I didn't need to do this myself. This was now a project for my clones. Can we do a mission? I was bored and wanted some change. All I had been doing lately was experimenting, practicing fuenjutsu and training. I thought you hated missions that hasn't changed. I do, but I'm bored. I had hit a bit of a block. Most of the experiments I wanted to conduct involved humans, and thus couldn't be done in the village. Let's not change our schedule, meaning she wasn't interested. Can I do a mission myself? She nodded. Yes, you're a Jonin now. Okay. But try to stay within the land of fire. Skirmishes have been happening along the borders. It seems tensions are growing. What been happening? This is the downfall of having few friends and not speaking to people. I was out of the loop. There have always been skirmishes along the borders. But recently things are heating up. I motioned her to continue. More than a year ago I'm assassinated the leader of Tanigaka. And now the land of rivers and the land of rain. Are all but officially at war. Oops that certainly wasn't my intention. Anything else? Hopefully not. Yes. Aura and Kiri have gotten more aggressive. Aura is provoking us in Suna. And Kiri is provoking us in Kumo. She paused for a moment. And the smaller villages are getting cocky and attacking shinobi from other villages. I might have started the third shinobi war a tad bit early. And who are we provoking? All my timeline was off. Kinoha is allied with Kusa, and we are mainly fighting with Iora along the border Iora and Kusa share. Oh boy war was coming I felt part excited and part nervous. Up your training. I stared at my mom in the eyes trying to convey my seriousness. You as well. I nodded. I looked at her clock. Alright I'll see you around. I promised Guy we'd run around the village today. Mom nodded with a small smile. Have fun. Will do. A day passed and now it was time to choose a mission. I needed some sort of combat mission so I could test my chakra drill. As of now, it was unnamed. I also wanted to do some experimentation. So, I ideally needed a bandit extermination mission. And sadly, there weren't any of those. Looking at the B ranks there were a lot of spying and assassination missions, most of which I wasn't interested in. There were no A rank missions available for casual perusing, those were assigned by the Hokage, and contained sensitive matters. So back to the B rank missions. Spying was out as I wanted combat, so assassination it was. There were few good assassination missions, most of them would involve a lot of stalking and waiting for the target, to leave their village. I wasn't too interested in those. Finally, I found something that wasn't total garbage, but still sucked for a different reason. There was an Iowa Jonin that needed assassinating. Sadly, he also had a Genin team. So, if I didn't want to have a page in the bingo book, I'd have to kill some kids, which could make me look bad. Though I was a kid myself did that make it excusable. After all, I was the only one who knew I was mentally 29 ham. Is it about time I go for that bingo book page? Possibly the mission didn't say anything about killing the genin alright, it's decided. I'm going to grass. I stood at the gate pondering my plan of action. I had to get to grass's border and hunt down one Shiro Renzo. He had black hair and heterochromatic eyes, one being blue and the other green. Hopefully, the eyes and hair meant he wasn't total cannon fodder though I wouldn't get my hopes up. Regardless of coloring, there could only be one Shiro, and that was me. If I shunshined the whole way there I'd make a three-day trip or one-day trip, but I'd also spend a lot of chakra. But I did have a big Olay seal, full of chakra already speed over safety. I shunshined from Kinova to Grass's border, with Chikaki no Kaoka active. The chakra drain wasn't as bad as I had anticipated, though I still wasn't fresh enough to fight. I still had a bit of time. So I'd make my way to Grass's capital and stay there for the night. Oh boy there was a lot of action happening in the capital. Looking around with my Byakugan, I could see four people with developed chakra systems bumbling about. I imagine that they're spies though why they weren't spying on Grass's hidden village was beyond me. Though I guess the nobles were important as well. I guess it doesn't matter what they're doing, as they were ideal experimental subjects a quick hench. And I now looked like I was a nondescript brown hair and brown eyed cannon fodder. I took over a family's couch for the night. Now that I was rested it was time to go on the hunt. I arrived early so I would have a few days to mess around. 
I needed to find a place to set up shop, and I needed to have a quick look for other spies. My quick search provided both a place to stay, and the location of two more spies. Both of them were occupying an apartment on the edge of the city near, but not in the slums. One of which was unconscious in front of me. Short stature, dirty blonde hair, and blue eyes. He didn't look like total cannon fodder. Though he should have picked a better time to have a nap a quick tap to the spine and throat, meant he wouldn't be moving or speaking anytime soon. I watched his eyes fly open and dart around the room, before meeting my own eyes. I mouthed a sorry at him before setting off to capture the second ninja. She had bright yellow hair and purple eyes, marking her as not total cannon fodder as well. She was making some sort of breaded fish and humming a quiet tune that I approached. A tap to the lower spine and she would walk no more. She collapsed to her knees bringing her spatula with her. Wah! I taped her spine and throat in quick succession, stopped her from speaking and moving. I dragged her into the room the man was occupying, before going back to finish cooking that fish. Food shouldn't be wasted after all I now had a full stomach and was ready to experiment. I moved the woman onto their shared bed and stared at them lost in thought. So, flesh transplant or biochigan growth? They didn't have similar cells so there would be rejection. But I couldn't discount the possibility that Chakra would somehow stop cell rejection. Madara did successfully transplant some of Hashirama's cells onto himself. Though that could be because they were spirit brothers. Orochimaru and Kabuto also did lots of transplants. Or at least I thought so. I currently had no idea how Kabuto had mixed all those genes into his body. Hum. Other spies were running around the city meaning I had more than one try so. Transplant first, and some Byakugan shenanigans later. Or both I guess it depends on how it goes. It's been a day and things are were alright. The flesh graph went alright, there was little rejection. Though it seemed the higher the transplantees chakra, the lower the cell rejection rate. The man had much less chakra than the woman, and had more cell rejection, making the transplant almost useless. Almost though this could just be a unique trait that the woman possessed. I find out after some more tests. The flesh transplant seemed to provide an additional chakra nature. I'd transplant some of my cells into the man and woman, and see if this held. Currently, the woman had a water and wind affinity, and possibly she would have a lightning affinity. Maybe there would be some problems if their affinities countered each other. I guess I'll see. I came back with another test subject only to find my test subjects trying to escape. I dropped the guy I was carrying and made eye contact with the woman. She was dragging her still unconscious partner towards the door where I had just entered. Her recovery marked her as a medical nin or someone with a bloodline that provided regeneration of some kind. With the bright hair and purple eyes, I bet it was the latter. Hello, I see you are trying to escape. She looked at the guy I had dropped, and she pushed her lips together forming a thin line. A friend of yours. I vaguely gestured to the body I dropped. I again received no answer, though I guessed that she didn't know him. I activated my Byakugan and Shunshine behind the woman, and closed off the Tenketsu in her legs and arms, rendering her immobile. She hit the floor with a grunt. Ugh. Though she remained silent afterwards. Hum. I walked back and threw my newest test subject over my shoulder and started towards the bedroom. I now had the men sharing a room and the woman occupying the couch I had been using as a bed. I had to re-injure the man as he had started healing. Something I theorized came from the transplant. Though he had very little of the woman's cells, it seems that the transplant was still somewhat of a success. Now I was seated on a chair and was staring at the woman while I checked her over again, looking for whatever mechanism her healing operated on. So, where are you from? I got no answer. The woman just stared blankly at the ceiling. Her healing factor operated on a different mechanism than mine and Kishina's. Her healing seemed to be chakra-based. Though originally there was no mix of elements indicating a Kekai Gankai or Kekai Moro. It seemed like she could burn her chakra to heal. Though this seemed to be a non-conscious process. The downfall to her healing was that it ate up chakra pretty quickly. Though it wasn't much of a downfall if it could heal crippling internal injuries. So what clan are you from? Again, I got no answer. How about this I got up and left the room for a few minutes and returned with a severed hand that was still dripping blood. Since you wouldn't talk, I decided that I needed a hand. I gave her a little wave with my acquired appendage. She only spared the hand a glance before looking away. Alrighty I guess she didn't care about her partner's safety as much as I had thought. I walked away again heading off to return the hand to its owner. After a few more attempts I gave up on making the woman talk. I instead returned to the transplants after taking some stem cell samples from her with my bone senban and sealing them away. The woman's body easily accepted cells and had a high success rate for transplants. The men fared worse only accepting the woman's cells and my own and rejecting the cells of each other. Meaning cell rejection had less to do with chakra amount and more to do with whatever bloodlines the woman and I had. She now had three chakra natures, and with the addition of a good amount of my cells, her chakra density increased. Um, I think I'll need more test subjects. I crippled everyone again, and slapped a chakra restraining seal on the woman's forehead, before setting off to capture the remaining three spies. It seems that being a spy didn't require a lot of combat power. You just needed to look nondescript. I now had six bodies occupying the apartment, and it was getting a little hot. The purple-eyed woman integrated with cells extremely well and now had four chakra natures only missing earth. Perhaps her healing healed the cells and integrated them into herself. I wasn't quite sure. 
Would my body do the same? Hum, all five of the spies integrated with the woman's cells extremely well regardless of blood type, chakra nature, or chakra amount. My cells had varying success sometimes being completely rejected, and sometimes being completely accepted. I figured that it had something to do with our healing factors. Cell rejection was just an immune response, meaning the body recognizes the cells as foreign, and attempts to kill or reject them. Maybe the body didn't reject the cells if they were beneficial. Hum, or maybe it had something to do with the body's chakra, though I didn't see any evidence of chakra nature impacting the results. Two days had passed since I had arrived, meaning I had only a few more days before I had to get the show on the road. I had aged the woman's cells a lot as I had to speed up her cell division to get and integrate cells quickly. So, I guess this was an opportune time to test stem cell transplants. I didn't need most if not all of the people here after all. I grabbed a scroll from my kunai pouch and unfolded it. It was a storage scroll containing different types of bone semben. I unsealed the hollow ones and prepared to get to work. I drained two of the men of stem cells and give them to the woman, and see how it goes. The stem cell transplant was a success, though it took me a whole day to replace a good portion of her cells. The stem cells took on the characteristics of her old cells, and started producing the same healing chakra she produced by herself. Both neat and weird. Why would someone else's cells produce the woman's chakra? Maybe her cells had a unique structure. Hum, I extracted some more samples and prepared for the second round of stem cell transplants. I couldn't find anything different about her cells, which was saddening. I was running out of things to do and wanted to get on with the mission. I wanted to ask her some questions, so I took the chakra restraining seal off her and woke her with a quick tap to the forehead. So, want to answer some questions now? I wasn't too interested in torturing her. I didn't want to start torturing and become unable to stop. I didn't want torture to become a thing for me. The woman didn't answer she just continued to send the ceiling a faraway look. I sat in silence for a while, contemplating trying to integrate the woman's cells into myself. What have you done to me? Finally, she spoke, her voice hoarse and raspy. I remembered at that moment that I had forgotten to feed my captives. Oops, I need to take better care of my captives. I made a clone and sent him off to the kitchen to get a glass of water. Hum, what do you mean? She was probably wondering if I had raped her or something similar. She again fell into silence, and my clone returned with the water. The woman was watered by the clone while I started to pack my things. The other spies had provided me with some loot they had hidden in their residences, so I wouldn't be needing a trip to a weapon shop anytime soon. This trip seemed to have proved fruitful. I got a mystery healing bloodline and valuable experience with transplants. Though I had forgotten to try growing a biakigan in my excitement, I was finished with my packing. So I returned to the woman who the clone had been tending to. We stared at each other for a while in silence. Her with hate and me with apathy. My clone was making kissy faces at me from across the room ruining the mood. I sighed and dispelled it. So, what clan do you come from? She continued sending me a hateful stare. Alright, I was seated and staring at the woman. I was debating letting her and the other surviving test subjects free to see what happened to them later on. The surviving test subjects male and female respectively. Both had three chakra natures, both from my own and the woman's cells. So, they were quite valuable. I'd like to see what happens to them in the future. They didn't see my real face or any defining abilities. So it should be fine, though they did have my cells all throughout them. Which could be a problem later I leaned back and poked the woman in the side with the tip of my fort. Any interest in talking? I gave her two more pokes for emphasis. What have you done to me? I poked her again as it seemed to be working. What do you mean? Her I rolled over and made contact with my own. What happened to my chakra? I sat back and blew out a breath. How honest should I be? My chakra's not the same. Tears started pouring down her face. Oof. I was sitting in a shitty apartment with a crying woman and surrounded by corpses. I feel like my life took a wrong turn somewhere. The reality of the situation hit me. I had just experimented on six people and killed three of them. This was my life from now on. This would only happen more in the future. I blew a heavy breath from my nose and stood up. It seems crying women are my weakness. Perhaps a gift before I go I gave the woman one final check over. Her chakra system was still a little fragile. But she now had bigger reserves than myself. I blew a breath out of my nose while I rubbed my eyes. I think it's time I got out of here. I sent the sleeping woman a wave as I made my way to the door. I left the woman and the other survivors in the apartment after gathering the corpses for later research. Food storage scrolls were fantastic. Expensive but fantastic gotta love a little time dilation. I think I might need more food storage scrolls. I made my way out of the city towards Iowa and Kusa's shared border, after dropping my henge. According to the scroll, Shiro Renzo had been wandering the border and killing Kusa Shinobi. He had his genin team with him and was showing them the ropes. I was still undecided about going for a total wipe and killing him and his students. I wasn't sure I wanted to start killing kids. Saigrass's capital was extremely close to its border. So, it was just a short half an hour trip that I made with my Bayakigan active. A lot was going on, both Kanoha and Kusa Shinobi were heavily patrolling the border. The Iowa Shinobi seemed to have set up camps and were using hit and run tactics. Though it seemed that neither side crossed the border, they only threw weapons and the occasional jutsu at each other. I spent my day wandering the border by a kick and active trying to find my target. I of course had no luck. 
I did meet some friendly Konoha and Kusa Shinobi though. The cannon fodder from Konoha wasn't much help, but the Kusa Shinobi pointed me to Shiro Renzo's last known location. He had a genin with explosive release on his team who was stirring up some trouble. He also had a Kamazuru on hand as well Kamazuru were Iowa's version of the Aburum, only they used bees, wasps and hornets. Which was extremely annoying Shiro Renzo was likely strong. Only the stronger Jonin get clan children in their teams. Or at least that's how it was in Konoha I doubted it was any different in Iowa. I wondered the area where Shiro's team was last spotted. I... Think I need a different name for Shiro Evil Shiro. No, that should be my name if anything Shiro the second. Shiro number two. Iowa Shiro. Black Head Shiro. Black Shiro. Kuo Shiro. Enemy Shiro. That's it Enemy Shiro I wandered the area for a while longer. Eventually, I decided that staying on this side of the border and following the unspoken rules would get me nowhere. No one told me I had to stay in Kusa after all. I deactivated my gravity seal and checked my weapons. EOOM asterisk I felt the heat of the explosion wash over me from my position behind a tree. It seems I was shinobi were pretty good. I had hidden my chakra and I was sure there were no bees, wasps or hornets around. How did these assholes find me? I did a quick count and saw 14 ninjas were approaching me, with more on the way. I had Fog and Chikaku no Kaoka for range, and so far, it was paying off. I was outmaneuvering them and avoiding attempts to surround me. EOOM asterisk the one Chunin was getting a little annoying with his constant explosions. I grabbed a handful of explosive tags and started slapping them on trees as I passed. I had finished slapping several down when the first had started exploding. EOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk BOOM asterisk. My explosive tags only caught one Chunin, but they slowed the rest of my pursuers, which was what I needed. Having to dodge thrown weapons and flying chunks of rock had slowed my speed. I activated Chikaki no Kaoka and sped off towards the border with a chain of shunchens. I arrived back at the border annoyed but whole and hail. I didn't see any sign of enemy Shiro or his team. The second I stopped traveling along the trees and touched the ground, I was swarmed by ninja. I was seemed to have some method of sensing using the ground. What was worse was that it had an extreme range and was invisible to my Bayakugan. My late night trip into enemy territory had proved fruitless. Though at least I learned something. But oh I, he's just a kid. Another trip into Iowa's territory the following day provided similar results. It doesn't matter. Even if he's a kid now he won't always be. Soon he'll have grown and he'll be killing our brothers and sisters. By then it will be too late for regrets. Though this time they had successfully surrounded me. But he's a kid now. Who knows what will happen in the future. He might quit being a ninja after a scare. Though there were only eight of them. And no one was throwing explosive tags at me. Which was always a plus. I sighed. The two idiots had forgotten about me and were fighting. While the other six alternated between watching me and watching the idiot duo. Though they were underestimating me because I lacked a flak jacket, something available to anyone above Jenin. I felt my heart beating against my chest and took a deep breath. In through the nose. I activated Chikaku no Kaoka foregoing my Byakugan's range, and my world slowed. Out through the mouth. My legs flooded with chakra, and my fingertips glowed lightly. I bent my knees slightly and took off in a burst of speed towards the ninja, with the most chakra. He didn't have time to do more than widen his eyes slightly before he died from a strike to the heart. Another shunchen and another strike to the heart, and the female tuner next to my first target died. Though the other ninja seemed to have caught on and were now paying attention to me, I shunshined to the next closest ninja, and aimed a strike at his heart. He was quicker than his fallen comrades, and dodged three of my strikes in quick succession, before I tagged him on the gut with the fourth. He wasn't dead, but he was out of the fight and screaming bloody murder. The remaining five ninjas were quickly approaching, trying to team up on me. So I shunshined to the farthest ninja who was making hand signs and preparing to launch a technique. I tried to strike him in the lower back, but he turned and intercepted my strike with a half-formed stone gauntlet. I blinked and tried to strike him six more times, but my strikes were intercepted each time. My enemy sent me a smirk, smarmy bastard. I briefly eyed my remaining opponents. The one advocating for my survival was trying to help his injured comrade and stopped his pursuit. The one arguing with him was guarding his back. The remaining two were headed my way. I sent another two strikes at my opponent, and wasn't surprised when he blocked them. Annoying if at first you don't succeed the chakra in my hands shifted, started spinning, soon becoming a visible blue swelling drill of chakra. I struck my opponent's gauntlets with lackluster results. My chakra drill sheared through the stone gauntlet and part of his hand, before it ran out of steam. My opponent let out a grunt. Ugh. Though the pain my chakra drill caused him did provide me with an opportunity. I jumped and aimed my second chakra drill at his throat, and sheared half of it away. Though I got covered in blood for my trouble, I used his body as a launch pit and jumped into a nearby tree. My pursuers had retreated and were grouped up and covering my advocate, while he tried fruitlessly to save his still wailing comrade. I grinned at them. I thought they would pursue. But I guess not a few tense seconds passed. The Iowa ninja were grouped, and I was watching them from my spot on the tree. My advocate had given up on his comrade and looked lost in thought. 
My advocate stood and focused on me. A few more seconds passed. I got tired of waiting and sent a vacuum palm at the group. The ninja at the front of the group got hit and tumbled away. Seeing that I was successful I sent two more vacuum palms at the group and shunshined at to the one that was tumbling away. E-R-A-C-K asterisk A1 for all stomped to the chest finished her. I blew a breath out of my nose. The remaining three had recovered and entered a formation. I eyed them closely. They weren't making hand size or trying to palm an explosive note. What was their game? I caught a flicker at the edge of my range. Shit, I deactivated Chikaku no Kaioka and expanded my range. Another eight ninjas were approaching. They seemed to be surrounding me. I didn't have enough chakra to fight that many. I activated Chikaku no Kaioka and sent a two-handed vacuum palm at the group and shunshine towards one of the ninjas trying to surround me. I tapped him on the knee as I passed, crippling him and hopefully slowing any pursuers. Hopefully, they would stop and help their injured comrade. They didn't stop and help their injured comrade, though that didn't stop me from escaping. I made it well past the border and rubbed my irritated eyes. I think I used them too much. I stopped to give my eyes a break and got surrounded annoying I made my way to one of Kanoha's unofficial camps, hoping to get some rest. This mission was proving to be annoying. Perhaps I should have stayed within the land of fire. A new day dawned marking my sixth day on the mission. I activated my Byakugan and took note of the lack of clan shinobi, perhaps they didn't want to consume their strength before the war even began. I blew a breath through my nose. I don't think I'm doing any more assassination missions anytime soon I wandered around the camp looking for things to do. I had no plans on doing any fighting today. I've had enough excitement for a while. I came across Kanova's field hospital. It was hastily built with earth release, but looked rather sturdy. I wonder if I could offer my services. And we don't have any time to mess around so scram. After being laughed at and getting an ear beating from a Maonarish looking med nin, I was roughly escorted out. I figured they'd at least need someone to apply bandages or clean wounds and give me a chance. But if they're going to be assholes I looked at the Maonarish idiot. I held my hand up and it glowed green for a moment before I switched to my chakra scalpels. I took a second to take in the look of shock on the idiot's face, before I disappeared in a shunshin. With nothing to do, I sent a clone to the capital, and I made my way back to the border. Every time I crossed the border, they seemed to hone onto me regardless of what I did. At first, I thought they were using insects or some sort of earth-sensing method to find me. But that didn't seem to be the case. Even when there were no insects or I was up in the trees they were still able to locate and track me. Did they have a Senjutsu user? I traveled along the border by Akigan active. There was no sign of Fuenjutsu, nor was their chakra present in the ground. So it didn't look like anyone was using a technique of some kind. I was about 4 hours away from where I had last fought. I figured their sensing couldn't possibly extend this far. I silently crept past the border. There were no trees here providing me little cover. I watched as four Iowa ninjas started making their way towards me. I thought they could detect my chakra levels, and that's why squads of Iowa shinobi had come after me each time. Though that might not be the case, maybe their forces are just heavily concentrated around Grass's capital. Hum Iowa shinobi all seemed to wear red clothing with brown flak jackets. It looked pretty cool but also made them easy to spot. I palmed a bone senbon and started heading to the right. I watched one ninja make some hand signs and point in my direction. Did each team have a sensor or something? I coated the senbon in electricity and watched as the apparent sensor made more hand signs. The team slowed and started approaching slower. The sensor retreated towards the back of the group and withdrew a sword. I started making my way left trying to get a line of sight on the team. Eventually, I was confident and I took my shot. I flung the Senbin with a Shunshin Enhanced Throw. It hit the sensor directly in the gut, and the Senbin continued through him and into a tree behind him. The sensor fell and grunted, and one of the team members positioned himself in front of him, while the others started making their way towards me. It's likely the sensor won't survive gut wounds are often fatal. I decided that my work for the day was done. I disappeared in a shunshin toward the border. I made my way back to the camp lost in thought. Lightning coated Senbin were extremely effective. Perhaps what my chakra drill needed was lightning. And maybe the Rasengan as well maybe everything needs some lightning. Something new to test. I made it back to camp, surprisingly my clone hadn't dispelled yet. I dispelled it to prevent future trouble and leaned on a tree while I absorbed its memories. My clone hadn't caused much trouble, he just took over a clinic and started providing free treatment. Though I wish he hadn't started offering plastic surgery. Now men and women were walking around with much larger assets than they originally had. I rubbed my eyes. I don't know I'd be able to resist the temptation to do the same to myself. Especially in my teenage years now that I knew I could do it. Could I stop myself? Sigh, I sat in a room I had rented. I enjoyed the camp and all. But I'd rather a bed than a bedroll. I was kicking around the thought of assimilating that woman's cells. My main problem was that it would change my chakra nature, and I would come off differently to senses. Something that shouldn't happen outside of Kinoha. I also didn't need the healing or the water affinity either. But the woman's adaptability was interesting. If I had the same, I could probably assimilate whatever bloodline I wanted, though there was no need to rush. I was plenty strong as it was. Perhaps I should start taking missions around Kiri. I wanted the Shikotsu Myaku after all. What other bloodlines were interesting? I remember that there was a clan of people who could turn their bodies into smoke, similar to the Hazuki clan's weird water body Sai. 
I shouldn't get overly excited. I had a lot of time before things really kicked off. My day had started well until I was ambushed. Shiro, no. I was picked up and spun. Hello Kishina, what brings you here? And when would I be too big to be picked up? Your mother sent me. Why did that sound like a question oh? Did she? What does she want? Kishina pressed her head against mine as she hummed. Hum she got a mandatory mission and has to chase some trader. Ah, someone got sensitive intel and they needed someone to grab them. How many people are on the mission? The number of people sent deepened on how strong the trader was, and how much combat was expected. Though these missions were usually done by the Anbu, meaning they were likely short-staffed, no clue. Alright so, what brings you here? I couldn't remember if I got an answer. Kishina set me down, put her hands on her hips, and adopted a serious expression. Your mother wants me to stop you from fighting with the Iwanin. She leaned and stared me down. I took the time to take in her new appearance. She was wearing the standard Jonin attire and had her hair in a ponytail with her hiety on her forehead. So she reached down and started tapping me on the nose. No T.A.P. asterisk fighting T.A.P. asterisk with T.A.P. asterisk the T.A.P. asterisk Iowa T.A.P. asterisk Min. She straightened and sent me a brilliant smile. Okay? Well, it's a bit late understood. I sent her a nod. No more fighting Iowa Nin. And she ruffled my hair. You're so cute Shiro. I am cute so my mission was to assassinate an Iowa Jonin. Meaning I was fighting with the Iowa Nin which was exactly what I was just told not to do. Shiro Kishina bent down and reached her index finger towards my nose. I deftly stepped away, avoiding more nose taps. Kishina sent me a pout in response. She straightened and crossed her arms. No fighting with the Iwan in. How am I supposed to do the mission? I raised an eyebrow at her. What am I supposed to do then? Kishina smiled at me and scooped me up. You're working at the field hospital while I do the mission. What? We arrived at the hospital and Mednin was waiting for us at the entrance. He was bored and looked to be furious. Shiro, you're with me. He turned and walked into the building. I squirmed out of Kishina's embrace and quickly followed after him, only sparing a second to send Kishina a wave as I left. I've been told you're competent, all you have to do is not kill anyone. That shouldn't be hard. Okay. Where should I start? The room we were in was large and filled with stabilized but still injured people. No one is dying, so take your time and do it right. He pointed vaguely towards the left side of the room. While he started walking to the right, he paused midway. Be careful, injured ninja are jumpy. Make sure to speak loudly and tell them what you're doing. Don't be sneaking up on anyone. Alright, I approached the first bed on the right. Hello, I'm Shiro, I'll be healing you shortly. I was making my way through the injured ninja at a good pace. My minder was stuck on a female ninja who wouldn't let him heal her. Sit down you stupid bitch. He gave up and knocked her unconscious and started healing her. I raised an eyebrow. What terrible bedside manner. So, what's your name? My minder side eyed me. I don't think he's looked any less furious than when I first met him, Enomoto Kiji. He grunted his name at me and focused back onto his patient. Alrighty I finished my side a little after Kiji finished his. I raised an eyebrow at him, wondering what's next. You didn't fuck up. I think that was praise. Thanks. I sent him a nod. Okay? We're on break now, eat and come back in like an hour. I'll be in the next room over. He jutted his thumb in the direction of the door, before jumping out a window and disappearing. I was left standing alone in a room full of unconscious patients. When in Rome, I jumped out the same window Kiji left from. I returned 45 minutes later and made my way to the room Kiji had specified. The room was the same as the one before, except the people here were conscious and loudly moaning in pain. I spared a second looking for any clan ninja, but didn't see any. I couldn't just stand there and listen to them moan. So I got to work. I see you've gotten started. Kiji arrived with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. Yet... I was healing a woman with a large burn wound on her side. It wasn't something I was familiar with as the civilians I healed have never had their clothes burnt onto their torso. Why are the people here awake? The other room was full of unconscious people, only one or two being awake. These are the Jenin and Chunin, we're expected to be able to dodge them when they try to hit us. So, they sedate the strong ones. Okay? And these are the ones with minimal injuries, there's another section dedicated to surgery and stuff. I paused to watch him swat someone's hand away from his cigarette. That's mine bitch. I blinked. Kiji had destroyed the filter on the cigarette with his teeth, making it unusable. Cotton was coming out of the cigarette's filter. I turned back to the woman, cutting parts of her shirt that were burnt into her skin from her with a chakra scalpel. If these were minimal injuries, I wondered what was considered major injuries. We made through another room after the second before calling it a day. Kiji's mood never seemed to improve as he seemed to be perpetually angry. We didn't run into any other mednin. The only people I saw were trainees who were changing diapers or cleaning wounds, and sometimes sedating uncooperative patients. The hospital was divided oddly. The lower your rank the more roommates you had. If you were a genin you pretty much shared your room with five other wounded genin. It sucked in my opinion, but I guess you couldn't treat the jonin like genin. I was sneaking out of camp hoping to escape Kishina's affection. Shiro, but of course, it wasn't to be. Kishina picked me up and held me to her chest, leaving my legs dangling. Hello. Kishina used one of her hands to ruffle my hair and set off. Kishina started making her way through the camp, 
I had to endure the stares of my fellow ninja as I was carried. Kishina spent the walk telling me about Makoto. She was pregnant and moody. Though Kishina used the words not fun instead of moody. Kishina brought me to a tent and set me down before entering. I followed her in wondering what was up. Fuinjutsu time. Kishina proceeded to fill the room with smoke as she unsealed an assortment of paper and sealing tools. Is it alright to do this in the camp? Kishina smiled. Don't worry. That didn't answer my question. You are doing amazing Shiro. I appreciated the praise. But the support of Backrob was too much. Thanks. My progress in Fuinjutsu was mediocre. All I could do was copy excising seals. I wouldn't be making anything original anytime soon. I think Fuinjutsu bullshittery was a few years off. Which sucked as I wanted to use Fuinjutsu to get to the moon. So, no Tensigen for me. Should I have gotten into Fuinjutsu earlier? I finished the final stroke on the silence seal I had been making. It worked? But even I with my mediocre experience, could tell that it was clunky. Fuinjutsu is all about intent, there is no correct alphabet. You can draw whatever you want as long as there is structure and intent. That sounded too good to be true. However, if your intent wavers during the drawing of the seal, it becomes unusable. That still sounded too good to be true. But who was I to argue with a Yuzumaki? Do I need to have intent for each character or just the seal in general? And what do you mean by structure? Kishina picked up a brush dipped it in ink, before infusing the tip of her brush with chakra. She drew a perfect circle with the Yuzumaki swirl spiraling into the center. This is the structure or the foundation if you prefer. And you need intent in every brush trick. That was not how I was doing seals. What's with the chakra on the tip of the brush? And can you do that again I want to watch with my Bayakigan. Kishina dipped her brush tip into the ink and started on her circle. I activated my Bayakigan. Kigan eager to see what was happening. The chakra is how I infuse my intent into the seal. I watched her chakra drain at an astonishing pace, though at the rate her chakra regenerated, I imagined her reserves would be full by the time she started on a second seal. She slowed her pace while doing the Yuzumaki spiral. Her chakra expense stayed the same, though the amount used changed, as she needed more time to make the spiral. The structure of each seal depends on what you want it to do. You'll get a feel for it in time. The way Kishina was doing Fuinjutsu was completely different from how I had been practicing. Perhaps this is how you do it when you reach mastery. I deactivated my Bayakigan and closed my eyes. I need to write this down and memorize it. I opened my eyes to see Kishina had started on something else. Her brush flew across the page without an ounce of hesitation in her movements. Her movements were fluid and natural, born from countless hours of practice and repetition. It was something I hoped to one day achieve myself. I turned my eyes away from her and looked at my paper. I picked up my brush, dipping it in ink, gathering chakra on the tip, and bringing it down onto the page. Mastery would come with time, though now I had something to experiment with. I arrived the day after ready for another day at the hospital. I walked into what was considered the staff room and took a seat waiting for Kiji. I liked him so far, he wasn't friendly or nice. But I got along with him. I held my finger out, and a tiny Rasengan swelled into existence. I let the chakra unravel, and the Rasengan dispersed. I formed the Rasengan again this time adding some electricity to it. The lightning was gathering in the center of the Rasengan and lashing out in tiny steams of blue lightning. I wasn't sure if that's what I wanted, but I couldn't imagine a way that it would go better. I let it disperse and leaned back into my chair, throwing my leg over my knee and crossing my arms. That felt too easy. Would it shock or would it pierce? Did it need more electricity? I blew a breath out of my nose and closed my eyes. Questions questions during battles. The thing that kills you isn't enemy ninja. It's usually explosions or ninjutsu. This came from a ninja that was laying on his stomach, as he had six kunai jutting from his back. An explosion did this. He chuckled. After I killed this bastard with an explosive tag his friends fill me with kunai. Fair enough I hummed in reply. A quick scan revealed a shuriken in his leg. Hum the shuriken hit an artery. He let out a pained laugh. I didn't feel it until you talked about it. He had a senbin stuck his femur who was throwing senbin hard enough to pierce bone. That's how adrenaline works when you're no longer in danger. You start feeling everything and experience a bit of a crash. I hit him with the anesthetic jutsu before putting my hands on either side of the injury. Don't move, you're only feeling better you're not better. He quirked his lips. You won't get any trouble from me. I snorted. I hope not. I'd hate to have to tell your family that you died because I slipped. He chuckled and his body shook, making me nervous. My joke could become reality. I nervously scratched my nose with my thumb before getting back to work. I started manipulating his tissues to push the shuriken from his body. The process only took a few seconds sadly. I had to do this seven more times. Blood started to spill from his injury. Oops, forgot about the artery, yeah. So my brother said Kiji. I bet you're too scared to climb on the roof. And I showed him I climbed up the wall like a spider. Kiji chuckled and scratched his face. I asked him why he became a mednin and was now getting his life story. And that bastard got mad and threw a rock at me. Kiji slammed his fist on the table, making water slosh out of my glass slightly. So, I fell from way up high and hit my head and boom. I was different. Kiji took a sip from his glass before continuing. The moment I woke up I realized I wasn't the same. I couldn't stop myself from telling people to fuck off. And I couldn't stop my thoughts from leaving my mouth. He had what I'd call an evil grin on his face. 
Anyway, weeks later it became obvious I was now amazing with Chakra. You see, the fall knocked some stuff loose, but also tightened some stuff up. Kiji rubbed an arsing scar that went across the top of his head. Sadly I couldn't be a ninja. I kept running directly at my enemies and disobeying orders. So they made a med nin, and now I fix idiots for a living. Well, what an interesting life you've had Kiji. Thanks for telling me. I sent him a nod. Anytime you little shit. Kiji was one of a kind as he got to know me better. He hid less of his true self. He was one of the village's most accomplished medics. I had wondered what motivated him to become a great medic. Turns out he hit his head and couldn't become a ninja. And thus was forced to be a med mid. Kiji was probably one of the most unique people I've ever met. I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Someone was wailing on Kiji's side. I took a peek over my shoulder to see what Kiji would do. Kiji stopped what he was doing and stalked over to the screaming teen. I want to go home. The teen had stopped screaming when Kiji got close to him. Go ta sleep you silly bitch. Kiji then hammer fisted his head. E-H-W-A-C-K asterisk my jaw dropped and I had to close my eyes for a moment. What just happened? I opened my eyes and Kiji had returned to healing his previous patient like nothing happened. Did Kiji just punch one of the patients unconscious? I looked around looking for someone who had just seen what I saw. I and a female ninja with a broken arm made eye contact, and we shared a moment. I broke the eye contact and rubbed my face with both my hands. What a day! If I knew I'd spend a month out of Kanoha, I wouldn't have taken the mission the improvements with my Fuinjutsu and my practice with cell transplants almost made this whole ordeal tolerable. Almost. I frowned and rolled around in the bed trying to find a comfortable position. After a week of hospital work, I started sending clones to fight the Iowa Nin while I healed. I then realized that I didn't need to be there at all, and sent a clone to replace myself as well. I then spent a lot of time looking at the samples I got from the woman with bright yellow hair and purple eyes. I was no closer to figuring out why the cell's chakra had a healing property, though I figured out that integrating her cells only added a small amount of new chakra to the body, and didn't change the existing chakra pool. Was there any way to integrate two separate chakras as Madara had? I had no idea and I was no closer to figuring it out. Thus I spent most of my time rolling around in my rented room and pondering. Could she have been a half Yuzumaki? I tossed the idea around for a moment before dismissing it. She probably would have had more chakra. Though didn't she integrate with the foreign cells? I couldn't clearly remember. Though at the time it seemed that she had. What a blunder I think it's time to look into getting a lab. Kishina wanted me to join her after my shift at the hospital. So I was here in person today. I didn't want any clone shenanigans. I watched Dully as Kiji cut both his and the patient's wrist. He weaved some hand signs and the blood from his wrist wriggled like a worm and started so flow into the patient. Kiji only used the technique for a few seconds before he healed both their wrists and set off to continue his duties. How did you get that to work? I gave Kiji a once over. Did he have a bloodline? The technique's called blood transfusion. You have to have O negative blood to use it. So Kiji was a universal donor cool. I guess? I've never seen or heard of it before. I sent him a nod and thumbs up, though I doubted my nonverbal praise meant much to him. Yeah, it's something I made. My fucking brother bled out, and I was helpless to stop it. Ouch. I'm sorry to hear that Kiji. Kiji shook his head and started running his hands along his patient's body looking for injuries. Don't be. The fucker blew himself up with an explosive tag. He always was an idiot. And it was just a matter of time until he got hurt. I wasn't sure of what to say so I stayed quiet and returned to work. What are you doing Shiro? I was doing a handstand and pondering lightning release. I wanted to add some bigger moves to my repertoire. The main problem I and my clones had with the Iowa Nin was their swarm tactics. I couldn't get farther than 5 kilometers past the border without having more than 7 try to kill me. So, I needed a big jutsu or I needed to improve my shunshin, so I was fast enough not to get caught. I decided I needed a new perspective. Kishina blinked at me. You can join me. She nodded and joined me with her own handstand. So, what did you want? Kishina had started walking on her hands towards her living quarters, so I followed after her. We're heading back to Kanoha tomorrow. I hummed, that was good news I was tired of being here, and I think this was the last assassination mission I'd ever willingly take. You catch enemy Shiro. Kishina snorted and shook her head. No, someone from Kusa got him. All that time and effort for nothing. Does a mission count as complete or incomplete? I think this was the first time I had failed a mission. Complete. Hum, alright, so, what are we doing? Kishina laughed, sprung from her hands, and landed on her feet. We're doing Fuinjutsu. I stared at her for a moment before I sprung from my hands to my feet. Sounds good. I tried to insert some enthusiasm into my voice, even though I didn't feel it. I should have just sent a clone while I'm thinking about clones a quick hand sign. And I sent a clone to say goodbye to Kiji. With Kishina traveling with me, it would take three days to reach Kanoha. It gave me plenty of time to get lost in thought. I was what I'd call halfway into becoming a stem cell vampire. My main problem was that my body heavily rejected foreign cells, and that the chakra from foreign cells didn't blend with already existing chakra. Other people were able to accept my cells, but the reverse didn't seem possible. My body wanted nothing to do with foreign cells, and rejected them quite handily, which was a problem if I wanted to become a stem cell vampire. I figured that my body might be more open to Kagaya or Hayuga cells, 
though the problem with that is my immortality, would be dependent on the survival of the Hyuga and Kigaya clans, which was acceptable, but not ideal Sai. I also needed to finish the Lightning Rasengan and Lightning Drill. I hadn't even got through my list of experiments, though I guess it was alright if that took a while. So much to do. Have you been using the strength of a hundred seal? I blinked and focused on Kishina. I used it once and haven't needed to use it again. I haven't run into someone I couldn't handle start getting comfortable with it. It would be a shame to go through all that effort to make it and die. Because you couldn't use it. That's true. Though I'd hate to waste some of the chakra I've gathered. Can we continue the Fuinjutsu lessons? Kishina nodded but was still looking ahead as we traveled. Whenever we're both free. Even if I only got a single lesson a month. I'd still make more progress, than I would by myself. Thanks, I wasn't making any progress by myself. Kishina reached out and ruffled my hair, but said nothing. After an uneventful trip we arrived at Kanoa. I said goodbye to Kishina and decided to have a brief look around. I walked around periodically activating my Baikigan as I went. Even though tensions were escalating the people seemed happy, and the market was well stocked. I figured there would be some signs of the impending war, but it seems there were no shortages, and the people didn't look stressed. I gave the village one last sweep with my Bayakigan, before I sent a clone off to find Guy, and I made my way home for my customary post-mission shower. Shiro, I blinked and spun on my heel. Hi, mom. I walked over and gave her a hug which she returned. Why do you have a bounty? I thought I told Kishina to stop you from fighting with Iowa Shinobi. She still hadn't let go of me. Um, it was a bit late by the time she arrived. That and I kept sending clones out. I liked learning from the mistakes the clones made. It was better than making them myself. Mom stayed quiet, but didn't loosen her hold on me. I thought you wanted me to get a bounty. I tapped her on the back trying to signal for my release. That was before I knew war was likely in our future. Mom ignored my tapping and kept her hold on me. Fair enough I gave up my escape attempts and settled in. I might not be leaving for a while. Though I wondered what my bounty was I decided that it was probably better to let it go for now. I had regained my freedom and was sitting on the counter while mom cooked. I idly kicked my legs, feeling a bit anxious. Heaven's palm saved me. I sat quietly for a while wondering what Heaven's Palm was. Eventually, it occurred to me that she was talking about the Rasengan. Tell me about it. She shook her head. It got me out of a sticky situation. She said nothing further and continued cooking. Tell me about it. Mom shook her head and didn't reply. Meaning it wasn't something she could talk about. Either because she was uncomfortable or it was classified. I swung my legs up and sat cross-legged on the counter. Heaven's Palm is incomplete. That got her attention. What do you mean? I formed a tiny Rasengan on my finger and started adding electricity to it. It was meant to have a nature release added to it. I looked at my Rasengan, it was just a normal Rasengan with electricity in its center. Though mine is still incomplete. I had tested it, and though the electricity damaged things as the Rasengan dispersed, I think it should probably be completely made of electricity. Though I was waiting until I had a private place to practice, mom had forgotten about dinner and looked to be lost in thought. I waved my hand at her and pointed at the stove, successfully returning her attention to our dinner. Alright, I'm going to see how emergency rations is doing. Mom shook her head at me, but didn't look in my direction. Change its name. I know you think it's funny, but other people probably won't. A sound suggestion. Too bad I'm going to completely ignore it. Alright. I sent her a nod and a sloppy salute. I turned and started leaving. I had some new ideas to try. Maybe I could get them in before dinner. Sadly, I couldn't get them in before dinner. Though I got around to it the day after. I was now eyeing the 12 rabbits I had caged. I wanted to get started on Deadpool immortality and biological absorption. I figured the best way to get into absorption was to try and make one whole rabbit from two injured rabbits. So that's where I'd start. The males would go first and I'd work my way up to the females. The winner would become emergency rations mate. And I'd no longer have to hunt for rabbits. Though I figured I'd go through three dozen rabbits first. I guess I'd see. Shiro were going to Shimes. I heard mom yell through the door. Sure thing I'll be out in a moment. I heard her retreat from the door and had a devious idea. I wouldn't be going I made a hand sign and a clone appeared in a puff of smoke. I waved the smoke away feeling a tad annoyed. Perhaps I should make my shadow clone smokeless something else to do. I now had 12 dead rabbits sadly. I couldn't make rabbit stew out of these monstrosities. 12 attempts and 12 failures Ham, how do I get rid of these? I can't bury them in the yard. They will be seen I'll use storage seals and dump them when I do a mission. That's the plan I turned and eyed the mice I had bought. I had wanted to do some stem cell transplants with them. But as I had some successful human trials. I wasn't sure I needed them anymore. Though the human trials only worked out so well. Because of that woman's unique bloodline. Hum decisions decisions I now had 12 dead rabbits and 6 dead mice sealed in a scroll. The stem cell transplant worked as I'd intended only resulting in one mouse death. The remaining five were used to practice biological absorption. It predictably didn't go well. Though I wasn't in a hurry, Rome wasn't built in a day after all. My main problem was lack of necessary cells. I needed to be able to change cell functions to get biological absorption working. The following day I was seated in the third training ground practicing with the chakra drill. I had made the chakra I used in it denser, and it seemed to be working better. 
though I was still planning to add electricity to it. My clones were off in the distance trying to make a pure lightning Rasengan. Though the Rasengan with lightning at its core did a good job, it wasn't quite up to par. I wanted something stronger, though I may be getting greedy. I had three more days of unsuccessful training. I figured it might be more productive to come back to it later with a fresh mind. So, I was now browsing the Hyuga library. The only thing of note I had found was the lightning shadow clone technique. I activated my Byakugan as I was leaving, and took a second to memorize it before I was out the door. I was wandering the archives or at least the section devoted to lightning jutsu. This was the good stuff only accessible to Jonin, requiring permission from the Hokage to enter. Sadly, it was heavily guarded. I was warned if they detected any chakra usage, I'd find myself in tea and I. So, I couldn't do the obvious and activate my Byakugan and copy everything in here. Yet, I looked through the scrolls there were some repeats from the Hyuga library. But that didn't diminish my enthusiasm. There were a lot of lightning jutsus that needed weapons as well. Even then I was spoiled for choice lightning release. Lightning beam. Lightning release. Lightning blast. Lightning release. Lightning bomb. Lightning release. Lightning breath. Lightning release. Lightning aura. Lightning release. Lightning calling. Lightning release. Shocking. Lightning release. Kiss of death. Lightning release. Omnidirectional lightning wave. Lightning release. Lightning construct. Lightning release. Lightning vortex. Lightning release. Infusion. Lightning release. Shock wave. Lightning release. Zap. They were all straightforward names. I could tell what most of them did with a glance. There were a few that I was interested in, though I was going to copy them all. I didn't think I'd have the time to practice most of them, but I guess that's what shadow clones are for. I started making my way through the scrolls starting with the most interesting and making my way down. Lightning release. Lightning construct. The user can turn electricity into tools, objects, weapons, and other items, and create semi-living constructs. A user who has mastered this ability can use it for almost any situation, creating anything they need. Chakra expensive but also extremely useful, it was something I was extremely interested in. If this technique worked as it said it did, I might forego the Kagaya bloodline. Lightning release. Omnidirectional lightning wave. The user releases massive amounts of electricity in every direction at once. This ability allows the user to dispatch many foes at once, and destroy large areas like villages, at the cost of the user's life. I felt this technique should be better guarded lightning release. Shocking. The user releases extreme electrical current to destroy almost anything, causing extreme amounts of heat and paralysis in living beings. This was just a more powerful version of lightning palm lightning release. Kiss of death. I sighed as I skimmed over it, it was exactly as the name stated. You kissed your opponent and ran current from your mouth into your hand which you place on your target's heart. I decided that it was time to get to work. I activated Kokoro no Kaoka and waited for a second to see if I was going to be attacked for chakra usage. I wasn't dead or dying, which was good. Now it was go time. I started memorizing each scroll only giving each a glance before continuing. I idly wondered if I could ever learn all of these techniques. Ninjutsu didn't come naturally to me. Though I guess it gives me something to do after the war hum I guess that's my post-war goal. Learning all the villagers lightning ninjutsu. Eight months passed in a blur I had occupied myself with training, small experiments, and some few ninjutsu. Mom and I started taking more missions around Kiri at my request. I was looking for Kagaya clansmen, and maybe if I was lucky, I'd find Jugo's clan as well. Though I considered the former more likely than the latter. I'd had no success so far. But I had high hopes even though the Shikotsu Myaku was uncommon and the Kagaya having a body without the bloodline would still be helpful. The only thing of note was my birthday, and that was a small celebration only including Guy, Mom, and Kishina, who Mom had invited. I held my palm out and observed my lightning Rasengan. I'd say it was complete or almost complete. I had run out of ways to improve it. So this might be its final form. I half-heartedly tossed the Rasengan and watched as it impacted a tree. The lightning sphere expanded to four times its size and then dispersed in multiple streams of lightning striking the surroundings. The Rasengan didn't pierce like I thought it would, it instead turns into a big sphere of lightning and explodes shooting lightning into the surroundings. I had sadly learned it the painful way I had figured the lightning Rasengan would just be a swirling Chidori. But I'd take what I could get. I admired the child and smoking tree. This was more interesting anyways. I guess this will be called lightning release. Heaven's palm. I then moved on to my next project. I eyed my lightning chakra drill. It reminded me of the Chidori. Though it didn't make too much noise, and it didn't have any cutting power. The lightning chakra drill was only for piercing. The lightning chakra drill worked as intended, its piercing power had improved, and I'd soon be piercing the hearts of my enemies. Though it didn't boost my speed as Kakashi's Chidori seemed to hopefully. I didn't have to pull a Kakashi and kill my friends with it, though I guess time would tell Sai. I still needed a name for this technique. I drilled the technique into the earth and released my control over the electricity, and watched it disperse into the ground. Lightning release. Lightning drill. Yep, that's it. The final ninjutsu I worked on was the lightning construct. It was by far the one I spent the most time on. I was close to getting it right. I could make simple shapes like a staff or a simple sword, but I couldn't make the construct solid. Whenever I hit something the construct would disperse. 
I had tried adding more chakra or making the lightning dancer, but it didn't seem to work. I had a few more ideas, but hadn't had the time to try them even with clones, a lot of my time was spent murdering rodents in the name of self-improvement. I made some progress in Fuenjutsu. Though I couldn't maintain my intent when writing I was still making steady progress. I was confident in making and editing existing seals. Though I still wouldn't be making anything of my own creation anytime soon. The more I knew about Fuenjutsu the less confident I was in making my own seals. It was beautiful and complicated. I was trying to mix some French and English into my seals with no success. I was pretty sure my lack of success wasn't due to any fault of my writing or use of words. I believe it has something to do with the structure. Though I wasn't sure and I didn't want anyone to ask why I knew two never before seen languages, so I didn't consult Kishino or Minato about it. So, it was up to trial and error. If it didn't work out it wasn't a big deal. There was already an established system of sealing, and I could just focus on it, if English or French didn't pan out. How are you doing Shiro? I looked away from the rabbit I was working on. Minato was standing in the doorway watching me. I blinked and stared blankly at him, he had already seen me experimenting, so it was pointless to cover anything up, and it would probably make me look suspicious, so I turned around and stabilized the rabbit I was working on before speaking. Good thanks for asking, what brought you here? Why was my lab being invaded, and why didn't any of the traps go off? Kishina and I wanted to check up on you and Sumiko, meaning Kishina forced him to come over cause she wanted to see us. Hum, I just hummed at him and looked at my rabbit, he was whole and hell having just received a new leg. I had made a breakthrough and could now turn other cells into stem cells. There was a problem with this though, a lot of the cells that turned into stem cells become cancerous. I'd say about 30% of the cells became cancerous, which currently wasn't a problem as I was looking to study cancer, but it would be a problem if I needed to make myself a new arm. What are you working on? Now, that was a difficult question. I wasn't sure of how truthful I should be. And would this catch the wrong type of attention? I'm working on a new medical ninjutsu. Minato hummed and started petting the rabbit. I had a feeling he was running a discreet diagnostic jutsu on it, but couldn't tell for sure. Minato continued petting the rabbit for a moment before he spoke. What are you trying to do? I was silent for a moment. I was mentally debating how much I could share. A few words in the right ear could get me a lab. But the reverse was also true. A few words in the right ear might also stop me from getting a lab. So I had to word this correctly. I'm trying to regrow lost limbs. Minato hummed and ran his hand along the rabbit's front left leg. It seems you were successful. I shook my head with a small smile on my lips. He could tell there was something different about the leg, but he couldn't tell what was going on at the cellular level. No, I sadly was not. I walked over to a bookshelf on the wall and grabbed a cabbage from the shelf. You may not be able to tell, but the leg is full of cancer. I brought the cabbage over to the cage and started breaking leaves off of it. It may look alright now, but over time the cancer will grow and possibly spread around the body. I made my way over the emergency rations cage, and left the remainder of the cabbage with him. Done with my task I turned my eyes to Minato. He was staring at the rabbit, while it ate its cabbage seemingly lost in thought. What I didn't say was that the more chakra one had the less cancer seemed to form, chakra seemed to keep cells cancer free. Which was good for me. The technique might not even need to be improved, cancer could be removed anyway though Minato might not have realized it. The other problem I had was the technique's chakra cost. Minato blinked and focused on me. I had to use a good part of the chakra in my seal, just for the leg of a rabbit. That wasn't true at all, but I didn't want people to think it was easy making limbs. Well, that and the jutsu would get more efficient with proficiency and added hand seals. Currently, it was seal less, but if I offloaded some of the easy work using some hand seals, I could probably improve both the speed and cost of the technique further. So only those with the strength of a hundred seal can use your technique. I nodded. The third might be able to pull it off as well. Minato shook his head. Do you have a name for it? No, I didn't. Did I need a name for it? I shook my head and raised an eyebrow afterwards. Minato folded his arms and leaned against the table. The jutsu should be considered a kinjutsu. I raised an eyebrow at Minato again. Techniques were called a kinjutsu when they got banned from being taught or used. Though I had no idea who banned them. How so? I wasn't sure of his game. Was he trying to stop me from developing the technique, using it, or just teaching it? Jutsu that cause harm to the user are generally considered a kinjutsu. I nodded. I knew that and didn't need to be told. I guess it would be considered a kinjutsu. I won't be teaching anyone I guess. Though the technique would see more use from myself. Alright let's go see how Kishina and Mom are doing. I wondered why Mom had allowed Minato around my lab. Sure, Minato nodded. Though I guess I'd trust her, she probably had her reasons. Mom and Kishina were standing outside and chatting. Hi Shiro. I was engulfed in a hug as soon as Kishina noticed me. Hi. I could see my mother's amused look out of the corner of my eye. So, what brought you guys here? Why was my home being invaded? Me and Minato are going to spa. And we wanted to invite you to watch. I sent a look over to Minato. Did he want to show off or something? My eyes left Minato and I looked up at Kishina. Was it her who wanted to show off? I sent a look to my mother asking for permission. I got a nod from her. Sure. There was no harm in watching. 
I had needed a break anyway. That's great. Kishina took off in a sprint, leaving me no time to say goodbye to my mother. We arrived at training ground 7. Kakashi had been waiting at the training ground and sent me a look of disgust when he saw me being held by Kishina. I didn't expect to see him here. I did my best nice guy pose in his direction in an effort to annoy him. Though my pose was probably lackluster as I was still being restrained. Can you let me down? I was squeezed for a few more seconds before I was released. I landed and sent Kakashi a much better nice guy pose. Though he was chatting with Minato so he probably didn't see it. Alrighty. Seeing that my pose was ignored I turned to Kishina. So why are we watching you spar? Kishina ruffled my hair. Kakashi is going to take his Jonin exam soon. And Minato wants to show him how power of elite Jonin fight. I blinked and looked at Kakashi. He was probably being a cocky little shit, and needed to be shown that he wasn't top shit yet. Cool, was all that I said. I didn't know Kakashi had become a Jonin at such a young age, though that meant that he stagnated for around 10 years. I wondered if I would stagnate in the same way Kakashi did in canon. After some time Kishina and Minato stood in front of each other. Me and Kakashi were seated in a tree at the edge of the clearing. I watched out of the corner of my eye as they started the spa with an exchange of tojutsu. Kakashi looked surprised, though I couldn't tell what surprised him. I turned my attention back to Kishina and Minato. They continued to engage for a few minutes until Kishina jumped back, and Minato followed suit. I watched Kishina start to weave some hand signs, and Minato pulled a handful of familiar kunai from his pouch. I raised an eyebrow. It seems Minato learned the flying thunder god Minato threw his kunai at Kishina as she finished her hand seals. Kishina waved a hand, and a wall of wind blew Minato's kunai away. Minato charged with kunai in each hand. Kishina jumped backwards and started weaving more hand signs. Kishina created a water whip and sent it forward towards Minato. Minato threw his kunai and disappeared in a yellow flash, reappearing past the whip. I sighed and looked at Kakashi. He didn't seem surprised at Minato's use of the jutsu, so I assumed Minato had been using it for a while. I looked back to see Kishina launch a couple of dozen wind blades at Minato while he flashed around the field. Kishina was an ninjutsu cannon, and Minato was fast and slippery. It was interesting watching Kishina and Minato fight. It also made me realize that I hadn't yet fought anyone at their level. Though I was technically a jonin, I was upsettingly weak compared to these two. I ran my fingers through my hair, Minato was so much faster than me it was upsetting. Even with my improved nervous system, Chikaku no Kaioka, and near constant use of Shunshin, I wouldn't be able to match him in speed. All my effort to improve my speed. I watched Minato dodge a huge wave of water that Kishina spat from her mouth. I thought watching this fight would be entertaining, but all it did was cause me anxiety. I wasn't good enough, though I could kill a bunch of cannon fodder, I was still nothing compared to the stronger ninjas. All it would take was one encounter, and my life would be forfeit. My mother as well. She wasn't strong enough she was cannon fodder, and she would probably die like cannon fodder. I had been stronger than her for a while now I closed my eyes and took a deep breath at the painful realization she had a close call recently as well. I don't know why I didn't think about this then not only did I need to get stronger my mother did as well. EOOM asterisk a few chunks of earth flew past the tree Kakashi and I were in. I focused back onto the fight. I still had time I didn't need to worry right away. Thanks for allowing me to watch you fight. I sent a bow to Kishina and Minato both who looked no worse for wear. I had expected them to sweat or at least breathe heavily, but I guess not. Kishina sent me a brilliant smile, while Minato sent a silent nod. Anytime Shiro, I returned her smile with as much enthusiasm as I could muster. Sorry. But I've got to go. I had thinking to do all I wanted to go eat some ramen together. Kishina pouted and mentioned free food. Free food was my weakness sorry. But I have things to do. I disappeared in a shunshun before Kishina had any more time to change my mind. I sat on my bed lost in thought. I had to get stronger to jutsu and medical ninjutsu were my main focuses. Medical ninjutsu was steadily improving, and my tojutsu would improve as I got naturally stronger. Though sadly that would have to wait until puberty. I was pretty much at my physical limit my mother on the other hand. What could I do for her? Or what could she do for herself? And how would I get her to get her ass in gear? My realization of my mother's weakness added a whole new dimension to my anxiety. Most of the ways I could strengthen her involved medical ninjutsu and telling her my secrete techniques, both of which I wasn't very comfortable with. I flopped over onto the bed and rolled myself into a hot dog with my blanket. What to do what to do? The day after I had witnessed Minato and Kishina spa, I started bothering my mother about her affinity and applied a gravity seal to her. After finding out my mom also had a lightning affinity, I spent the next month trying to get my mom to learn ninjutsu. She was resistant to the idea, and I didn't understand why until I was a month into teaching her lightning release. Heaven's Palm. She had zero talent in ninjutsu. Though she had learned a few techniques to become a qualified jonin she quickly gave up afterward. She said she thought her time was better spent elsewhere. I wholeheartedly agreed after spending a lot of time trying and failing to teach her Heaven's Palm. I had thought my progress in ninjutsu was slow, but compared to my mother, my progress was considered prodigious. I had given up on any fast progress after a while. 
Instead, I had started trying to get her to do some body modifications. She and I fought over it for another three months, all the while her progress with the heaven's palm slowly trudged forward. I had spent six months total trying to get my mother stronger. If she didn't want to do any body modifications, I couldn't force her. But it was a damper on my mood as of late. I left her to her own devices with the gravity seal. I didn't feel like it was my place to police her exercise. I sighed and cracked my knuckles. Even though I had no success with my mother, I had made some improvements with my lightning constructs and had been pondering experiments and further enhancements. I had been trying to find ways to further improve my Biakigan's range. The Biakigan can detect additional wavelengths of light, while Chakra is normally invisible to the normal eye. It emits electromagnetic waves in a different part of the light spectrum. The Biakigan has photoreceptor cells corresponding to those wavelengths, making Chakra visible. Different materials absorb different regions of the spectrum and thus will be opaque or transparent to different wavelengths. To see through various objects, Biakigan needs to be able to detect a wavelength Length that the object is transparent too. There wasn't anything I needed to do about this part of the Biakigan, but it was interesting. The part I could improve was visual acuity or the range of the Biakigan. Visual acuity depends on the amount of cone and rod cells you have. This is why birds like hawks have amazing visual range. They have a huge amount of rod and cone cells. The same applied to the Biakigan. The Biakigan has many more rod or cone cells than the normal eye to accommodate the increased number of wavelengths the Biakigan detects and to increase the visual acuity for each wavelength. The increase in the number of active rod or cone cells requires increased blood flow to supply it with the necessary nutrition and oxygen, which is why the blood vessels enlarge when the biochigan is active. I had been thinking about increasing the number of rod slash cone cells in my eyes. Though I didn't think it would increase my range much I was interested in seeing what it did. But after some thought, I gave up on the idea. The biochigan's range naturally increased, and my range had not finished expanding yet, so I shouldn't be in a rush. I wrote down my findings in my book of experiments, and decided that I'd get back to it later. Though I knew the clan had people with ranges of more than 10 kilometers, I guess 5 or so would be fine with me. Sigh. I should leave my eyes alone for a while at least until I could grow new ones. I needed a more private space to get started on Biakigan experiments. I watched Guy exit from the academy. I had seated myself in the usual tree, and was watching both new and old faces stream from the academy. Guy was graduating this year in September, which meant Team Minata would soon be complete and the war would soon kick off. I was feeling good about my chances of survival, but was less sure about Guy and Mom. I had tried with my mother, and now it was time to offer Guy some training. I caught up to Guy as he was leaving. Hey, Guy. I tapped him on the shoulder as I spoke. Guy turned and smiled at me. Hello, my youthful friend. I sent Guy a nod. What are your plans for today? Guy sent a wide grin in return. I was going to have a most youthful training session. Excellent. Can I join you in some youthful training? Guy struck his nice guy pose. Of course. My most youthful friend. Guy took off in the direction of the northern gate. It seems we were running around the village so. Are you interested in apprenticing under me when you graduate? Guy's cannon team was full of nobodies as far as I knew. So it didn't matter to me. If I deprived the team of Guy. If they died because of a lack of Guy it wasn't my problem. Guy teared up and wiped his tears away with the sleeve of his jumpsuit. No thank you, my eternal friend. Look deep into my eyes and accept my sincere apology. Guy stopped running and then gave me a deep bow. I can't look into your eyes if you bow I gestured for him to stand up. Are you not interested in an apprenticeship? I may not be as experienced as other Jonan but I could still teach you whatever you needed to know. Guy likely wanted to join a team under his own merit. I think I had made a mistake in asking like this. I want to join a team with my prowess. I don't want people to say I became a ninja because of my connections. I was disappointed, but I tried not to let it show. That's very youthful. I gave Guy a thumbs up and started on my run again. Guy probably thought I was offering an apprenticeship because I felt he wasn't good enough to get a Jonan sensei. It wasn't the case, but trying to deny it would probably look worse than just dropping the topic. I eyed Guy as I ran, he had a lightning affinity, maybe I could teach him, Heaven's Palm, how's your chakra control? Guy's shoulders slumped a tiny amount. Not very well my friend. I still have trouble making even a basic clone. I hummed in reply, so ninjutsu was out. I activated my Byakugan for a moment. Guy didn't have enough chakra to make any shadow clones and I wonder if Guy will be open to body modifications. I looked at Guy, I seem to have ruined his mood sign maybe not. I sloppily waved my sword of lightning at a tree, and watched as it slid off its stump before falling to the ground. The lightning constructs might make up for my lack of Kagaya bloodline with its versatility. If I wanted to wildly slash at my enemies with a 10 meter lightning sword now I could. Though I had no sword skills, and I wasn't willing to invest any time into anything other than basic sword skills. Once I cast the jutsu, the sword wasn't malleable which was a shame. But I suppose making a sword was already good enough. I shouldn't expect to turn into the green lantern. I guess I gave my sword another swing this time carving a deep furrow into the ground. 
What should I call this? I looked at the construct with a critical eye. I was going to slim this down a bit. It didn't look cool when it was this thick. It didn't look anything like a sword. No one would know it was a sword unless I told them I took a stance and tossed the construct like a javelin into the earth. I watched it tunnel for a while before it dispersed into the ground. Hum. Could I use the huge sword to kill big summons? Something to try if I'm ever unfortunate enough to run into a summoner. I'll slim it down a bit and keep calling it a lightning sword. I'd gotten what I wanted out of the lightning construct jutsu and didn't have any other ideas at the moment. I now had seven lightning jutsus to my name. It's a shame this had such a huge chakra cost I thought as I idly twirled the blade around. It looked cool, but it was too expensive to use for normal fighting. I guess that's why people coat weapons in lightning. Instead of making constructs I was sitting in my backyard sunbathing, while a pair of clones worked on fuinjutsu a few meters away from me. The clones were making storage scrolls and explosive tags. I had found out I could sell my seals, and now I had a clone on seal duty almost all day. I want to buy a few houses having another stream of income from renters would be nice. I was laying in the grass and thinking whilst my clones were hard at work. The more lightning jutsu I learned the faster I seemed to learn other lightning jutsu. The things I needed to learn for a new jutsu overlapped with the things I learned when I was practicing other jutsus. It cut down the time I needed to learn stuff considerably, which was nice, though it still took me a few months to learn anything. I think I inherited some of my mother's lack of talent in ninjutsu that, or all Hayuga had no talent in ninjutsu. I had just thought ninjutsu was hard, but there were lots of people with more than one nature release even when it wasn't their affinity. But then again most people only learn their affinity, it was only the truly talented that learn more than their affinity. Sigh. My control was amazing, but once distance was involved my control was lacking. I'd been able to overcome the problem some with training, but I was still lacking. Was this a me problem or a Hayuga problem? Mom was the only other Hayuga I spent time with. I blew a breath from my nose. I'll get around to figuring it out eventually perhaps I need to scan a few Hayuga Shiro. Look at what I found. Kishina was waving a pair of scrolls around while she danced towards me. I just stared dully at her in response. She sent me a sunny smile and slid the scrolls into my pockets. I raised an eyebrow and ignored the scrolls for now. What brings you here? I was practicing with a dual-bladed lightning sword, after remembering the dual-bladed lightsaber from Star Wars. I wanted to say bye before I left. I'm going to reinforce some buildings around the border for a few months. That sounded like an opportunity. With Fuinjutsu? Kishina nodded with Fuinjutsu. Learning Fuinjutsu and the possibility of fighting. How could I resist? Can I come? Kishina bit her lip and looked to be lost in thought. Eventually, she shook her head. No, it's highly classified. No one is supposed to know about it. I raised an eyebrow at her. Why was I told then? At my look, Kishina looked sheepish and rubbed the back of her head. I had forgotten until now I rolled my eyes at her. All right. My body was impacted and I blinked in surprise as I was caught in a hug. So, have you said goodbye to mom? Kishina nodded and released me from the hug. Yep, yeah, you and Kakashi are the last people I needed to see. I nodded and took the scrolls from my pocket. Lightning release. Lightning dragon jutsu I skimmed the scroll for a while and was slightly disappointed. I would be more interested in the technique if it didn't require 12 hand seals. As it was anything with more than 6 hand seals was usually useless in combat. I unrolled the second scroll. Lightning release. Omnidirectional lightning wave. Something I already had memorized and also something useless as of now. Another big move with too many hand seals. I looked up from the scroll to see Kishina's expectant face. Thanks Kishina. I hugged her with as much enthusiasm as I could muster. Anytime Shiro. The hug lasted a few seconds before Kishina broke it. Alright I gotta go. I have to go see Grumpy Kakashi. And with a flamboyant wave she disappeared in a shunshun. I sighed and looked at the sun. I had about 8 hours left in my day. Back to training so my mother sent me an unamused look. So. I started tapping my fingers on the table. How do you feel about adding another member to our team? Mom wrinkled her nose and knitted her brows. And that told me all I need to know about her answer. I want to take Dai from the Genin core and add him to our team. Mom's features smoothed over. And she looked less opposed to the idea. Why is that? It was almost impossible to escape from the Genin call once you were there. Your only chance of escape was a random Jonin taking interest while you are young. If you were over 15 and in the Genin core, you were doomed to the Genin core for life. Dai practices the eight gates, and prolonged use of the eight gates causes weakness, which is why Dai is still a Genin. That wasn't completely true. Dai was still a Genin in base strength. The eight gates only multiplied your existing strength. Makes sense, Dai is known for failing basic missions. I guess that could be attributed to his use of the eight gates. Mom nodded at me but didn't look sold on the idea. Even with opening all eight gates Dai was still weak only being able to fight a few elite ninjas with most of them escaping. It was much different from Kanan Guy who nearly defeated a pseudo-space god. This could be attributed to Guy's higher base strength. So, my goal was to bump Dai up a few notches in base strength, mainly with body modifications and liberal use of medical ninjutsu. Mom blew a heavy breath from her nose, crossed her arms, and leaned back in her chair. Give me a few days to think about it. I nodded and stood up. 
That was more than I thought I would get. All right. I needed to go check on my rabbit emergency rations was a fine specimen, always providing me with discoveries. It seems that cells don't just affect chakra, but chakra also affects the cells. Emergency rations chakra recovery rate had become that of a normal genin, and his bodily functions seemed to have become more efficient. It was quite the find but also something I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't been looking at a younger rabbit just moments ago. What a discovery. Chakra affects the cells, now I'm interested in artificially expanding my reserves. Though any changes to my body likely wouldn't happen for a while. As tempting as it was to jump the gun and expand my chakra system, I should do some human trials before I do anything. Or at least some observable human trials. I don't think the woman counts. She could have exploded for all I knew. How could I get Dai to let me do it to him? A question for later I suppose him. Maybe this is why Madara survived for so long. Being hooked up to the statue and being fed its chakra must have somehow changed him. Being hooked up to the statue might also be why his and Harashima's chakra combined. Or it could still just be that they were spiritual brothers. How would feeding myself Otsutsuki chakra go? Where could I get Otsutsuki chakra? Could I steal the stamu from Madara or Nagato? Questions questions. Credit to 006 Sam for bouncing ideas with me. Most of the stuff about DNA is coming from ideas he inspired. We talked about DNA, cells and bloodlines, and he straightened some stuff out, and made my ideas more solid or logical. I had a vague direction, but it was looking subpar, Sam's ideas straightened out the story a good bit. So, much love to him. If anyone wants to chat about the story feel free to PM me. I enjoy the back and forth. Mom and I were sitting in the dining room drinking tea, different from usual mom looked annoyed with my presence. Can we add Dai to our team? My mom looked defeated. Yes. After a week of wearing my mother down, Dai was finally going to become a member of our team. Though you have to do the paperwork. The smirk my mother sent me was annoying. I suppose this was revenge for bothering her. I sighed I hadn't even asked Dai to join yet a quick hand seal, and I sent three shadow clones off to do my work for me. I saw mom's smirk disappear, and I sent her a smirk. The paperwork didn't inconvenience me in the slightest. Dai you're joining our team. Dai looked confused maybe because I was giving him no choice in the matter. Or maybe because I invaded his home and woke him up at midnight. Dai sat up and stared at me for a moment. What? I sent him a sunny smile I had copied from Kishina. Welcome to the team Dai. Dai's mouth opened and closed a few times. But no words came out. It seems I had caught Dai flat-footed. I grabbed Dai's hand and placed a pen in it. Alright here's your paperwork please sign your name here and write your ninja registration number here. I pointed to the appropriate sections and watched with joy as Dai mechanically wrote his name and registration number. Alright, thanks Dai. With one last sunny smile. I shun shined out a window I had left open when I entered. A new day dawned. I had kidnapped Dai early in the morning to assess his skills. He had been training with the eight gates the previous night, so I had to heal him to get him ready for a spa. The results were disappointing but expected. Dai had no talent in the ninja arts. I had thought his tojutsu would be great, but even that was barely above genin level. His physical fitness was the only thing he had going for him, though I guess he had to have great fitness to use the gates. I tapped my foot and sent Dai a look filled with disappointment. He flinched and looked down avoiding my eyes. Dai had been caught flat-footed with his abrupt entry into a team, and we hadn't had time to chat. All right, I looked at Dai who was still looking away from me. You have no talent for the ninja arts Dai slumped. But just because you have no talent doesn't mean you aren't a great ninja. Dai regained some vigor, and his eyes met mine. Now demonstrate the eight gates for me. Dai sprang to his feet. Normally I wouldn't open any of the gates unless I had something to protect. But I'll show you what I can do Shiro. Dai got into a stance and took a deep breath. I activated my Bayakigan and slowed my perception. Gate of opening. I saw one of the Tenkutsu in Dai's brain flash for a lack of a better term. I attributed it to an increase in chakra from that Tenketsu. Gate of healing. Another Tenketsu in Dai's brain lit up. Gate of life A Tenketsu on the spine lit up. And I deactivated my Bayakigan. Dai's skin was red, veins were bulging all over his body. And his hair stood up, though his Super Saiyan hairstyle made him look silly as even his moustache was standing up. Alright, I've seen enough. Dai laid on the ground releasing heavy breaths. I was healing him, and admiring the lack of damage done to his body. Though there was a huge amount of lactic acid buildup, nothing to worry about as it would only cause muscle soreness. We'll have to get your tojutsu up to scratch, having such impressive physical fitness is useless, if your tojutsu is subpar. Dai nodded but said nothing. I'll be coming over every night to heal you and spar with you. Well, a clone would, but it was pretty much the same thing. And don't worry about missions for the next two months. I'll have some clones making enough money to take care of your necessities. Dai shook his head and opened his mouth to refuse. But I cut him off. Alright I've got to go, we'll talk about it later. I disappeared in the shunchen successfully putting off the conversation. I sat in my makeshift lab pondering ways I could make Dai stronger. Obviously, he was getting his chakra network expanded. And he was going to have his nerves enhanced. But that was as far as my ideas went. I was rolling the idea of implanting some cells from the woman into him. He could use the healing factor. It would help him in recovering from using the gates. Though Dai having a separate chakra type in his body. 
would be extremely noticeable both to sensors and to any of the village's Dejutsu users. So, if I wanted Dai to have that bloodline I needed to find a way for the two chakras to combine. I didn't even have the slightest idea on how to go about that. Could I just completely trade his chakra out for the woman's? Maybe or maybe not. Chakra was complicated it was affected by the physical body, but also affected the physical body. So maybe it didn't have to be too complicated. How about a gravity seal and some body modifications? Let's do that to start with I won't worry about anything more than that for now. Come on. It's safe, I've done it to myself. Dai was literally backed into a corner and looked ready to escape. No thanks young Shiro, the gravity seal is enough for me. I pouted at his refusal. This was the second time we were going through this song and dance. Dai didn't even want the gravity seal at first. You won't even feel a thing. You'll wake up faster and with a bigger reserve of chakra. Dai paused for a moment, but then jumped into his nice guy pose. I believe I can become stronger through my own effort. One's true youth fades when they turn their backs on their beliefs. I took a moment to admire almost blinding sparkle on Dai's teeth. Artificially improving your reserves isn't turning your back on your beliefs. Con you'll forget it even happened in a few days. I took a moment to contemplate knocking him out and doing it regardless of his opinion. Dai seemed to have picked up on my thought, he jumped through, slipped through a window and started running off into the distance. I approached the window and stuck my head out. I know where you live. You can't run for long. Dai looked over his shoulder and sped off faster. I shut the window and eyed it for a moment, perhaps I should have that window sealed. Or maybe just removed entirely it'd give the villagers Jenin something to do. I stood staring at the letter I had received in disbelief apparently. I was doing fine without a lab, and there was no need to allocate resources for a personal lab. Though there was a friendly offer to join the research and development department, I balled the letter up and tossed it into the trash. If the village wouldn't pay for my lab, I guess I'd have to do so myself. I think I had enough to outright buy a house, maybe that's what I'd do. Though it'd have to be outside the Hyuga compound. Mom might appreciate the idea as well. I heard the elders were pressuring her to marry anyways. Perhaps getting out of the compound would do her some good as well. Guy was glued to the ground and unable to stand. Dai was enthusiastically doing squats when he yelled encouragements at Guy Guy use your youthful vigor. Dai was training with Guy. Both of them were using gravity seals for added efficiency. I was healing them every time they got too tired to move. It was a beautiful display of youth. Ha ha. I've done it. I turned my attention back to Guy who was standing and had thrust his arms up in victory. Nicely done my son. Dai slapped Guy on the back knocking him over. Dai ignored Guy and made his nice guy pose. Now it's time for the next step. Guy had worked his way up again and was enthusiastically waiting for instruction. It's time for 100 push-ups. Dai dropped to the ground and started doing him. Guy also dropped to the ground but was struggling. I can do it. I have the passion of youth. That's a new one. That's the spurt guy. That's the power of youth. I turned my attention back to the seals I was making. I would have joined them. But I was a clone, and there was nothing to be gained from exercise. That and I had money to make I spared a look at my almost forgotten pile of storage seals. I looked back at Guy. It was interesting how he turned out. I figured he might be different without his eternal rival Kakashi to challenge him, but he seemed mostly the same. Perhaps any changes would become more apparent as he aged. Guy was only 12 now. There was plenty of room for him to change and grow. Yosh. Let's increase our seals. I sighed, at a certain point. They're simply too heavy to use or too chakra expensive. I wondered what level Guy would eventually reach. I was maxed at level 5. The increase to level 6 broke my already ridiculous bones. Not that it mattered playing get out of the compound and make my own lab was a go. Mom was reluctant to move as the house we were living in was her parents. And after some discussion, we agreed to keep the house and rent it out while we bought a new house away from the Hayuga. Though maybe she agreed because I said that I'd be moving regardless of what she chose to do so. The plan was to get a place in a shinobi-occupied neighborhood with a basement. Sadly, this wasn't a quick process. Thankfully Mom took it upon herself to find the perfect house. And it was no longer my problem. Now I needed to look into getting some equipment. I didn't know where to start, or if anything I needed could be bought, so maybe I'd have to steal it. I'm sure Orochimaru probably had a few hidden labs I could pilfer if needed. Shiro start packing we have a mission. I looked up from my book. What are we doing? I had a few experiments planned, so hopefully this mission wasn't too much of a time sink. We're going to Noodles for a patrol mission. So, we were just making sure there were no ninjas trying to hide near Kanoha. Can Dai come? Mom rolled her eyes. Your project can come. I rolled my eyes back at her. He wasn't my project. I guess it's time to field test Dai, though it's a shame that the mission would delay house hunting a bit. We were on our way to Noodle Country, Dai was brimming with excitement and was chattering non-stop, filling what had once been a comfortable silence with constant noise. Mom and I were both quiet people, and having Dai with us was a change to our usual dynamic. It wasn't a huge upset, it was just different. And perhaps that is for the best, some change is good after all. So, what's our team name? Dai's question broke me from my thoughts. No idea. I looked at mom as I really had no idea. It's Team Hyuga. Something I didn't know. I had thought it was just a nickname. Now we need a new name. Dai stayed silent and mom just nodded. Any ideas? 
Mom and Dai both stayed silent. Finally, Dai spoke up. Team Youthful Gentleman. The word youthful didn't come with its usual enthusiasm. No, Mom didn't like the name, but hadn't offered any suggestions of her own. I bounced a few ideas around my head before settling on the least awful one. Team Irregular. Mom shrugged and Dai nodded. Alrighty, I'll update it when we get back. Well, a shadow clone would we were midway through Noodle Country when Mom spotted a treasure. And by treasure, I mean a Kagaya. He was apparently leading a little group of Genin, and was showing them how to remove their tracks, and use Chakra to keep yourself from sinking into the muddy ground. It was rather touching. Alright, I'll meet you guys at the capital. Mom and Dai nodded through Dai looked confused. Alright, see ya. With a little wave I took off in a shunshun towards the direction Mom had pointed out. I was about 200 meters from the Kirinin. He was setting up camp and teaching his genin how to start a fire. It brought back memories of Minato teaching me and Kakashi the fire starting jutsu. How sweet. Though now that I was close, I was hesitant to do anything. The Shikotsu Miyako only appeared in Kimimuro, so I didn't have much to gain from capturing this guy. I figured it was like wood release only appearing rarely once every few generations. In fact, it might something to do with being the reincarnation of some part Otsutsuki ancestor. Maybe Kimimura was the reincarnation of one of Hamura's sons or something. I started chewing on my nails. I wish I hadn't even had this thought. It only complicated things. How much did Hashirama's would release have to do with being the reincarnation of a quarter space god, and having space god chakra? Working under that assumption maybe Otsutsuki chakra awoke dormant DNA and gave its wielders access to forgotten bloodlines. Could I awaken or improve my bloodlines by awakening dormant DNA? A lot of DNA was just junk and filled with inactive elements that only become active with stimuli, such as environmental changes or trauma. Perhaps Otsutsuki Chakra was the stimulus in Hashirama in Kimimuro's case. Going by that logic, Chakra itself could also be part of that stimulus, and allow for changes to happen in the bodies of potential shinobi, while they grow up and train their bodies. Bloodlines are simply unique mutations built upon those changes over generations. Stuff like elemental training should also be reflected in one's DNA. I used my arm to hide my eyes, even though it didn't do anything with my Byakugan active. The more I followed this train of thought, the more things made sense. The Tensigan awoke with Otsutsuki Chakra, probably the Chakra awakening dormant DNA. The Sharingan awoke with Trauma, it was Trauma activating dormant DNA. Madara awakening the Rinnegan, it's Senja Chakra and Achiha Chakra combining making Demi Six Parts Chakra and awakening dormant DNA. It all seemed to fall together. I resisted the urge to groan. Where do I even start with DNA? I wasn't sure Orochimaru had gotten into DNA yet. Wasn't he just injecting Hashirama's cells into children and killing them when he got booted from the leaf? Was he experimenting with DNA or cells? I couldn't remember. So, I didn't even have anyone to steal research from if he was just messing with cells. Fuck. And emergency rations had changed with exposure to chakra as well. More chakra and DNA fuckery. I couldn't even get into DNA when I was still bumbling around with cells. There was no way I was ever going to be able to get into DNA without computers. And I hadn't seen more than a shitty television so far. So there was no chance of the Naruto-verse having computers. Is this enlightenment? No. I think the word I was looking for was epiphany. I had an epiphany and could do almost nothing with what I had thought of. Sigh. I turned my attention back to the team of Kirinin. They were happily roasting some fish over a fire and chatting. Perhaps I would awaken both the Tensigen and Shikotsu Myaku if I got some Otsutsuki Chakra into my system. Though how pure would the Chakra need to be? Could it come from Naruto or Sasuke? Could it come from the Otsutsuki on the moon? Could it come from the Stamu that Madara was currently hooked up to? Could it even come from Kimimuro? Or could I inject myself with Hashirama's cells and use his chakra? Would it even matter if I dose myself with chakra Madara was hooked up to the statue for ages before he awakened the Rinnegan? So many questions. I took a peek at the Kirinin. They were settling in and getting ready for sleep. What do I even do with them? I watched as the female Genin threw more sticks into the fire. Did I even need to do anything with them? Credit to 006 Sam for bouncing ideas with me. Most of the stuff about DNA is coming from ideas he inspired. We talked about DNA, cells and bloodlines, and he straightened some stuff out, and made my ideas more solid or logical. I had a vague direction, but it was looking subpar. Sam's ideas straightened out the story a good bit. So much love to him. If anyone wants to chat about the story feel free to PM me. I enjoy the back and forth. Even though I didn't need the Kagaya it was always good to have extra Kagaya cells on hand. Or at least pure Kagaya cells. I decided on a plan and blew a breath out of my nose. I crouched and coiled my muscles and appeared behind the Kagaya clansman with a shunshin. I was met with an elbow to the face and was sent flying back landing on the ground with a thump. I knew you were here the whole time. I laid there for a moment dazed. He had hit me so hard I lost control of my chakra and deactivated my Byakugan. I looked up and seen a manic grin appear on the man's face. Did you feel sneaky tree hugger? I climbed to my feet while still feeling rocked. The Genin had taken this time to gather in a rough formation. I spared the Genin a moment of attention, but dismissed them. This was likely their first mission out of their country. One was even shaking, and looked halfway to pissing himself. What's with your hair? 
did your mommy do it for you? The man's hair did indeed look stupid. It was the first thing I noticed about him. Fuck you, bitch. Even though he was annoyed he didn't make any moves and seemed content with watching me. I didn't know Kiri Nin was such bitches. He snorted. Fuck you midget. At least I don't have to jump to reach the counter. I glanced at him for a moment. At least I don't wear makeup bitch face. My opponent snorted and started making his way towards me, though he kept his guard up. Seeing that he was silent I stayed silent as well and started my approach my opponent elected to forego weapons, and had his fists at the ready. I thought for a moment and decided to do the same. I jumped in first and tagged him on his right arm which he tried to punch me with. The moment I touched him he jumped away and started fiddling with his arm. I used the time to slow my perception. What did you do to me? Bullshit no jutsu. Medical ninjutsu. He grunted. Annoying. I nodded. Having your limbs immobilized was annoying. Sorry about that. He didn't respond, and one of the genin threw a handful of kunai at me. I sidestepped them and used some chakra strings to catch them and toss them back where they came. I heard two screams of pain, but ignored them. Reflexes for the win. The Kagaya used the time his genin bored and rushed at me, sending a kick towards my head. I gracefully sidestepped it and tapped his leg as it passed further disabling him. He grunted and used his good leg to launch himself backward. He landed ungracefully and looked at his genin. I took the time to do the same. They seemed to have been patched up. The girl seemed to know medical ninjutsu, and was surprisingly good at it. The fight was going my way, so I decided it was time to test a jutsu. I ran through four hand seals, and a long thin blade of lightning formed in my hand. I enjoyed the look of shock on the genin's faces and sent them a nod. Sometimes you just run into people with lightning swords. It's a wild world out there. I shunshine behind the kagaya and ran the tip of my sword through his spine. Another shunshun and I was away from his body and out of range from any potential shenanigans. I sighed and watched as the kagaya fell to his knees and then face planted. His genin rushed and surrounded him. The female member was fruitlessly trying to patch his wound, and the two males were standing at the ready one armed with two kunai the other with a sword. I released my grip on the sword and watched it disperse as I was no longer feeding it chakra. My favorite thing about the lightning sword was its weightlessness. I could effortlessly swing it around as I pleased. I guess the lack of blood was a plus as well. Hum, I leaned to the side to dodge a kunai that one of the boys had thrown. I snatched it out of the air and pocketed it. One could never have enough weapons after all. Now what should I do with you three? They were about 12 and that's just over the age where I wouldn't be willing to experiment on them. So, they might be out of luck. I eyed the group, one of the boys looked terrified, but resigned, the second had pissed himself, and looked to be barely standing. The girl was sobbing over her sensei, and had given up on healing him. It was a sorry sight, it almost made me feel bad. Almost. Any of you have a bloodline? All I got was silence in response. The genin were resigned, and the jonin couldn't do more than mutter curses at me. The first one to answer me gets to go free. The two boys shifted and looked at each other, but ultimately didn't speak. I took a closer look at their features, but didn't see anything hinting at a bloodline. Death it is then. I took a moment to stare at them, giving them a chance to blurt out something to save their lives. No one spoke, they just silently held my stare. Either they didn't have any bloodlines or they were extremely loyal. I shunshined into the group and with two quick taps to their necks the boys were unconscious. I looked at the girl, she was silently crying and hadn't moved, she had seemingly given up. I tapped her on the neck, and she collapsed onto her sensei I sighed what to do what to do after looking at the Kagaya for a while. I discovered a few things. His body structure was slightly different, and his bones were denser than normal, though they were nowhere as dense as mine. He also had a healing factor though it was barely noticeable. The most notable thing was the huge amount of testosterone in his body. I figured it probably caused the increased aggression and savageness the Kagaya were known for. Overall, I discovered nothing of note. Just that I might become more of a savage when I start puberty. So I hopefully, Kagaya puberty wasn't too much of a bother. I've got four bodies and I was out of ideas well. I guess I'm practicing chakra network expansion. I need to find a way to increase chakra density as well. Hum, I do it to the Kagaya and girl. Then I'll poke at the gates of the other two. I wonder if I could open a gate permanently. Something to test in any case. A twitch of my fingers and all the team's weapons were gathered and neatly stored. Another twitch, and the packs flew into my arms. Chakra strings were a marvel, and they brought me immense joy when I used them. Using something someone worked hard to learn as a parlor trick never ceased to bring a smile to my face. Though they were less impressive when they could only go three or so feet from my body. I sealed my loot away and looked down at the now weaponless ninja. All in all, things went well. There was only one death. After expanding the Kagaya's chakra network, I pumped him full of chakra from my seal to see what happened. He was ripped apart from the inside out. It was shocking and not something I had anticipated. Didn't two idiots from Kumo gain the Ninetales chakra after being swallowed? If they could handle that why couldn't this guy handle cage level reserves? What a useless waste. It seems the body had a limit of what it can handle. Maybe that's why Yuzumaki are such good Jinjuriki and have such large reserves. Their bodies could handle more chakra. Or maybe I just jumped the gun and increased his chakra system too much in one go. Something to experiment with later though the Kagaya was a lost cause the other three fared better. 
The girl now had reserves equal to mine, and the boys had their gates of opening damaged. I say damaged because I lacked a better term. The gates weren't open like dies were, but they were active. The first gate the gate of opening regulated muscular strength and when released allowed you to use 100% of your muscular strength. Humans used like 20 or 30% normally. Also untold so, maybe the boys would gain incredible strength. Or maybe they destroy their bodies just by moving carelessly. I'd see in a moment him. I eyed the group for a moment. I wonder how enhancing their sense of smell would go. Probably not well. I imagine smelling people's pulley wiped assholes all day would be hell. Perhaps that's why the Inuzuka stay in their compound. The thought brought a smile to my lips. Okay? I clapped my hands together. No more silly thoughts. Daylight's burning after all. Damaging the gates worked about as I expected, meaning it worked but it also had drawbacks. The sheer force exerted destroyed the body when one moved carelessly, and even if you didn't destroy your body right away your muscular skeletal system would eventually deteriorate anyways. And the lactic acid buildup was insane, meaning you had a lot of strength, but no stamina. Stamina could be built up, though I guess stamina doesn't matter when trying to stand destroys your body. Anyway, you need an insanely strong body to not be destroyed by your own movement. I probably could have guessed this this whole ordeal was almost pointless, which was a pity. The girl had seemingly lost her hard-earned chakra control as well, which was a shame as I had wanted to expand my chakra network. But I probably shouldn't if my control suffered. Control was my specialty after all. It was time leave and I was wondering what to do. Having my subjects running around is ideal as I would like to know if there are any side effects caused by my experiments. I guess it's time to use the memory concealing technique. Originally the Jutsu called for the user of tiny sand needle. But I opted for some bone needles instead. I already had the seal on some tiny bone needles, so I was good to go. I just had to pop them in the memory center and all would be well. As long as they didn't get checked over by a competent mednin, everything should be a-okay. I hope, even if the needle was found, tampering with it would kill them anyway, so I wasn't too worried. I put all the genin in their bedrolls and tucked them in. I then sealed their sensei's body for later use. They would wake with no clue what happened to their sensei or themselves. Or at least that was my hope. I'd see how it went, if I didn't get an update on my bounty, I'd assume all was well. I regrouped with Mom and Dai at Noodles Capital, whose name I hadn't cared to remember. Mom and Dai were both slow, so they had only been waiting for three hours. They had used the time to buy two rooms at an inn, and take a quick look around. Well, Mom took a look around, and Dai youthfully complimented the Byakugan's usefulness. Or so I heard. I hoped Mom and Dai got to know each other a little better while I was gone, though hopefully not too well. I didn't need a youthful stepfather. Mom was sending me a look from across the room. So, how'd it go? I made a so-so gesture. It was messy. Meaning it didn't go as I wanted it to. Though almost nothing went as I wanted it to. That's a shame. I shrugged. You win some, you lose some. At least I knew not to expand my reserves right to cage level. And I got some Kagaya parts. So it wasn't a complete loss. Have you got Heaven Spun down? Mom nodded but looked slightly peeved. I have but I can only use it four times. That was good enough. I could only do nine myself. Want to learn something else. Though she had the Rasengan and Heaven's Palm, having two big moves wouldn't stop her from dying. Most of my fights ended before anyone got to throw any moves at all. That's the advantage of crazy speed. Her mom leaned back and tapped her fingers on her crossed arms. No thanks. That wasn't what I wanted to hear. I'd like to make a technique of my own. I don't want you to be the only one with anything to teach. I'm not sure how much I like that. Alright. Even though I didn't want her wasting valuable time, it was probably best that she makes her own techniques. I could still teach her with clones. Or get her to make her own clones. Did you know that you get memories from shadow clones? I got a nod and an eye roll in response. Why don't you use it to train? Mom raised a single eyebrow. And it was my turn to roll my eyes. Would I have to spell everything out? Sigh annoying. Don't sigh at me, Shiro. Annoying Dai stop helping the civilians was supposed to be unseen and unheard. Dai sent me a nice guy pose from across the roof. Thank you for your reminder young Shiro. I shall endeavor not to make the same mistake twice. I sent Dai a blank stare in response. Dai couldn't seem to stop himself. He already painted a fence, patched a roof, and went grocery shopping for an old lady. All within the hour. Sure, I pointed my index and middle finger at my eyes, and then pointed them at Dai. I'm watching you. Dai nodded with a youthful smile. I repeated the gesture twice more and gave up when I saw it did not affect Dai. Let's go check out the shore. There's no ninjas here. I expected there to be around six spies, but there was no one with chakra above civilian level. It was a little suspicious. Perhaps my suspicion was for nothing. I had wandered most of Noodle Country's northwest shores and had found nothing, which was annoying. Missions around Kiri were seldom peaceful as of late. So where were all the Kiri Nin? I'm going to have a quick look around. I'll meet up with you at our inn. I shunshined away before Dai could reply. Another thorough search provided nothing other than annoyance. No ninja anywhere. 
which was unusual. Last I heard we were having some skirmishes with Kyrian noodles. There wasn't even a single Kanoha cannon fodder bumbling around. Though I guess that Miss Genentine counted I arrived at the door to our room and gave it a quiet knock. A-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk Mom opened the door and waved me in. Did I get back? Mom nodded, but sent me a reproachful look. Yes, but don't leave him behind. Dai was a grown eight gate using man. He could take care of himself. All right. However, I knew better than to argue. Anyway, I couldn't find anything. It's like everyone packed up and left. I wasn't sure what was up, but there was no Kanoha or Kiri Ninja to be found. Mom hummed and nodded but didn't say anything. Did everyone pull back to the border? Mom just shrugged. All right. Another day and another attempt at convincing Mom and Dai that body modifications were the way to go. You won't even feel it. You will just wake up with more chakra at better speed and reaction time. Dai and Mom were hard nuts to crack. No amount of reassurances, promises, or threats would work on them. No thanks. Mom as usual wasn't having it and was determined to remain unmodified. Thanks for your offer young Shiro. Dai wasn't interested either. I eyed them for a moment and played with the idea of just knocking them out and doing it regardless of what they thought. Broken trust could be rebuilt. Stop staring like that, it's creepy. I turned my head away and focused on the setting sun. I had hoped to enjoy some combat. But it seems that everyone withdrew from the area. Boring. It was time to leave, and I was excited to return to Kanoha. I wanted to see if the village had anything on DNA and I was bored with this patrol mission. Hopefully, the village had texts or books on DNA, and maybe even a way to manipulate it. I wouldn't get my hopes up, but there was always a chance. The Naruto-verse was weird. They lacked blenders, but had microscopes, lacked toasters, but had heart monitors. I could go on all day. The point was, the research and development might have had some way to manipulate DNA. It wasn't too much of a reach to think that the village was experimenting with DNA. Or at least Orochimaru was. So now I needed to figure out what was up. If they had texts about DNA, that would be great. If they had ways to manipulate DNA, even better. If they had jutsu to manipulate DNA, that was amazing. The shenanigans I could get up to, I couldn't wait. There were a lot of possibilities open to me, even immortality. I already had a few ideas. But if I could manipulate DNA, I could at least slow or stop my aging and give myself more time to discover something better. I didn't need to replace my cells if I could stop my DNA from degrading telomeres are responsible for protecting the DNA if I remember correctly. Now I've got a new direction to explore and soon the war will kick off. It's going to get hectic these next few years the trip back was slow. Mom wanted to find someone to set Dai on and was taking her time looking for infiltrators and missing Nen. Sadly, she had no luck. The southern part of Fire Country was peaceful. There were no nearby ninja villages, nor was there a lot of bandit activity. We only really had to worry about Kiri coming from the southeast, and they didn't seem all that interested in us at the moment. So, it was one long trip back to Kanoha after getting back home and glancing at the calendar. I realized Guy was graduating in a month and a half. Which meant the war was almost here. I had the chance to snag a Jenin from the graduating classes, and snap them up before anyone else. And lots of choice. I also had to see Makoto soon. I hadn't seen baby Itachi. Yet I also needed to look into DNA. What to do what to do I'll have a shower and sent some clones out, and then I'll take it from there. Clones were sent out, the rabbits were fed, and now I had some time to myself. Though I had no idea what I would with my time. Guy and Dai needed some time to themselves, and Kushina was still out on a mission. I think I'll locate the research and development building, so I can plan a heist if need be. If I couldn't buy equipment, I'll just steal it, whether that be from Kanoha or another village. I guess it'll depend on how I'm treated when I try to buy anything I need. The more annoying the ordeal, the more willing I would be to steal. Though hopefully, it wouldn't be too hard to get my hands on. Orochimaru had quite a few hidden labs. If the stuff was hard to get, he probably wouldn't have had so many labs. I guess I'll see. It only took a moment for me to decide that looting the research and development building wasn't going to happen. It was extremely well defended, so no easy loot for me. I guess I'll just wait on it a little. I was jumping the gun anyways. Perhaps some training. I wanted to figure out more uses for my lightning constructs. Though they were extremely costly, they were just too potentially useful to ignore. After I had thought about it for a while, I realized that there were plenty of uses for my lightning constructs, and that cost wasn't as much an issue as I thought it would be if I used my seal. After pondering for a while I remembered the Susanu. What was special about the Susanu? The Susanu was a chakra construct, and it made me think of other constructs. Yuzumaki chains were constructs, Naruto's weird chakra hands were constructs, tail beasts were also constructs. Any one of those I could potentially copy. Though obviously on a smaller scale I wouldn't be making a Susanu or tail beast anytime soon. Or possibly ever. But I've gotten basic constructs down, and it would only take a little work for me to make some lightning chains so... I guess that's where I'll start chains first, lightning arms second, and Susanu never. I couldn't imagine the chakra cost of a Susanu. Sai my clones disperse bringing both good and bad news. Makoto and Atachi were doing well and appreciated the visit. Atachi was too young to do anything other than babble, and Makoto looked exhausted, so the clone left and dispersed soon after not wanting to impose. 
The other clone had requested a visit to the archives, as there was nothing on DNA in either the Hayuga or village library. The archive was huge, so I had high hopes I'd find something even if it was not immediately relevant. If I had no luck, I might have to join Team Orochimaru or Rob Orochimaru. Neither of those was likely to end well, which was why I hoping the archives provided some answers or direction. Although I hoped to luck out in the archives. I didn't have high hopes. There was a good chance that all the good stuff was in research and development. Hopefully, that wasn't the case. How about I expand your chakra network just a little? I held my fingers milometers apart, and mom just stared at me with an impassive face. I stood still in my position maintaining eye contact, and still trying to demonstrate how little I'd expand her reserves with my fingers. When chakra reserves grow greatly, your control over your chakra degrades. Fair point. That won't happen if you expand your reserves in tiny increments over a few months. It still might happen. But at least you didn't just lose all of your hard-earned control in a day. I'm not interested. That's what I expected. Alright. I'll just bother her later. My trip to the archives was approved, and after a trip deep into the Hokage Monument, I was once again welcomed to the side of towering shelves packed with books and scrolls. I took a moment to enjoy the smell of paper and pulley circulated air. Can I use my back again to look for what I need? I stood looking at the ceiling for some sign of my hidden observer's approval or disapproval. I caught movement to my left and saw a hand face through a ceiling tile, and make the hand signs for negative disapproval at me. The hand quickly retreated into the ceiling after a moment. I admired the Jinjutsu and nodded in the hand's direction. Alright, thanks. The hand popped back out and gave me a thumbs up before retreating. I snorted feeling quite amused. But my amusement faded when I realized that I'd have to look for what I wanted the hard way. I'd start in the medical section. I guess after two days of searching, I finally found gold. Genetic mimicry the user can temporarily mimic or obtain properties of a creature's physiology through vigorous study. Alternatively, the user's genetic structure can alter itself to become identical to a biological creature upon contact, though doing so has a high chance of death or injury as changes are random. When used by someone unskilled, unlike shapeshifting, the user does not necessarily take on the appearance of the target, but rather select parts of their physiological makeup. With this technique, one could touch an eagle and see far, a fish and breathe underwater, or a dog, and gain an amazing sense of smell, but only if the user is experienced with the technique. Alternately, an unskilled user can touch a tiger and become a tiger-human hybrid, losing his sanity in the process. Prolonged use can result in permanent changes. Good stuff. I took a moment to ponder about this being part of the Inuzuka's origins, though I doubted it. Who would mimic a dog when there were better animals? Or maybe the one who mimicked a dog got the best results. I'd likely never know as such stuff was usually clan secrets. Hmm this might be a path to stealing Keke Genkai or becoming a full Otsutsuki. Though I'd have to catch an Otsutsuki first which was easier said than done. I moved on after some thought. Mutation inducement the user is able to induce mutations changes in the sequence of an organism's genetic material, in their selves or other living beings. The changes can range from minor genetic changes to severe physical mutation. The user could even be able to activate recessive abilities in allies, or suppress abilities in foes. Note that the user may force instant change or stretch it over longer periods or even several separate sessions. The technique had a lot to do with manipulating someone's chakra. It confirms my theory that chakra can cause physical changes. Not useful at the moment, but it was still interesting and potentially useful in the future. Gender transformation the user can alter one's and or other's gender either permanently or temporarily. They may be able to combine genders for hermaphrodite or remove both for nutri. The change is complete to the cellular level. Not something I wanted or needed. DNA indexing. The user is able to take the DNA of any species or any individual being, and record it either for replication, a recreation of the species, or genetically enhanced beings. The user may be able to encode their DNA into seals slash weaponry, ensuring that such devices and weaponry will only work for them. Something extremely useful. Now I didn't have to worry about needing computers for information storage. It had a lot to do with seals. But even when I could see the DNA, I wouldn't know what it did without a lot of experimentation. Cell manipulation. The user can shape and manipulate the cells of any sort of organism, including the functions of the cells in the organism. They can help to circulate oxygen in the body, make cells heal any sort of wounds, or fight off disease. I had already roughly did this myself, but this was an improvement to my existing technique. It was just a more advanced version of something I already use. DNA override. The user can completely or partially override the DNA of themselves or others. This can be either permanent or temporary. This could possibly be what Orochimaru used when he jumped bodies. Though if that was the case, I didn't understand why the bodies rejected him. This could also solve some problems with biological absorption. The main issue was taking in foreign DNA. The body didn't like foreign DNA and rejected it. With this, I can overcome that hurdle. But looking at the seal work was upsetting. It required you to edit 200 different cells, have the seal copy your work, and then apply the work to other cells throughout the body. A lot of setup was required for this to work. But once it was done I could use the seal whenever I wanted. Neat. DNA link. 
The user possesses a link to somebody slash something through fresh DNA and chakra, which allows them to know the location of their target within a kilometer radius. It seemed useless so I didn't bother with further reading. DNA isolation. The user can isolate DNA, performing such acts as suppressing certain genetic traits, and making others dominate. Now that was gold, and exactly what I needed I was already half Gagaya. So there was little gene manipulation needed. Sadly it was made to suppress the non-desired traits during a fetus's development. So it needed to be changed a bit, nevertheless I continued sifting through the shelves. There was so much more to explore. Gene splicing. The user is able to take the DNA of any species or any individual being, and is able to modify it, and insert it into the DNA of any other species to strengthen or modify the host body. There was a warning written in near flowing script on the bottom of the scroll. Any modifications made to oneself may cause infertility, any traits gained from outside your species may cause unexpected mutations. Interesting but not something I was interested in at the moment, though it could see future use. Amalgamation. The user can merge two or more separate objects into one, regardless of whether the objects are organic, inorganic, living, dead, technological, etc. They can decide which parts of the objects are dominant in the union, what is erased, and what is merged. The denser the materials fused, the higher the chakra cost. This wasn't useful for anything outside of crafting. Unless I wanted to do some messy experiments I moved on. DNA disintegration. Users can disintegrate slash destroy the DNA of any organism, causing varying levels of damage from necrosis. Not useful in combat as it require the target to be completely restrained. So not useful at all DNA analysis. The user can analyze DNA through various means. They can identify such things as the DNA DNA owner's identity, or such things as mutations and genetic damage. It went on to list other sub-techniques and additional ways to analyze DNA. Another gem. Though it required a lot of seal work, there were 33 different techniques involving the manipulation of DNA. Though one in particular caught my interest. Primal form. The user reverts into the primal form, becoming an evolutionary throwback with traits that have disappeared generations before. I stared dully at the scroll. This was way too good to be true. Warning users may have a limited intellect. Users may not have control of their primitive instinct and urges. Users' physiology may be unstable. I thought so I was almost certain this was an Inyazuka technique. In fact, a few of them could be attributed to the Inyazuka. Though if that was the case, why were the Inyazuka such a shit clan? Wolves in sheep's clothing? Or did mimicking dogs make them stupid? And why would the Inyazuka ever give up any of these techniques? Sigh, if I just up and used the jutsu I probably would just turn into an ape. I probably had very little Otsutsuki in me. Or at least not enough to risk my sanity for. I looked at the section of shelves that I mentally dubbed the Orochimaru shelves and pondered. Even if I was able to mess with my DNA what good would that do me? From what I read I was only isolating DNA few cells at a time. The body had around 30 trillion cells and 200 different types of cells. It was a hilariously pointless endeavor. Without using DNA override seals. The only way around doing every cell a few at a time was to make the cells divide a few billion times. And I doubt the cells would be young after that I rolled my eyes at the thought, of course. They wouldn't be young so. I needed to make the cells immortal or change DNA overwrite seals. That's the only way I could think of getting around aging myself. Since I was already manipulating DNA, could I manipulate or regenerate telomeres? Telomeres are just repetitive strings of DNA found at the ends of chromosome pairs within cells. Telomeres protect chromosomes stopping them from deteriorating or fusing. But the telomere on the end of each chromosome pair is shortened with each cellular division. Eventually, the telomere is depleted and apoptosis or cell death begins. That was aging in a nutshell. So, I regenerate the telomere and I'm theoretically biologically immortal. As long as I could regenerate the telomeres on the DNA, I might be able to divide cells indefinitely. Meaning I can change the DNA of one cell, dived it, and replace other non-changed cells. Potential immortality and the potential easy awakening of my other bloodline. I took a deep breath and sighed. I had a rough plan, and now I needed to work towards that plan. Cell manipulation, DNA analysis, DNA indexing, and DNA isolation was what I needed to focus on. Cancer cells were immortal, so that's where I'd likely find out about telomere regeneration. I started placing the books I borrowed back onto their shelves. I was preparing to make my exit. I could come back another time. I was already researching cancer. I had thought about turning my whole body cancerous to become immortal. Ideally, I just had to make a seal that kept everything where it was supposed to be, and I could become living cancer. Or so I thought, but my new plan was better. I finished filing the books away and gave a friendly wave at the ceiling. My mood was much better, DNA had opened a whole new avenue. I might not need to do any cell transplants if I could mess with DNA. I guess I'll see. A month passed, Dai graduated, Kishina returned, Kakashi got his new team, and five clones plus myself, were spending just about all day studying, reading, and practicing some of our newly learned techniques. Things were going well. All they were until the Hokage requested a meeting. I hadn't done anything, 
so I wasn't overly worried, but it was still an annoyance. Now the question was, do I go myself? Or do I send a clone and risk shenanigans? I gave a firm knock on the door. A-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk K-N-O-C-K asterisk enter. I opened the door and made my way inside. After a deep bow towards the hokage, I stood in the center of the room and waited. Take a seat, we're still waiting on someone. He pointed behind me. I turned and saw a pair of chairs that weren't there a moment ago. I eyed the chairs and shrugged. I took a seat and looked at the hokage. He had started on some paperwork, leaving me to sit by myself. Alrighty, I crossed my arms, leaned back, and closed my eyes. I heard the door open. I turned my head towards the door and opened my eyes. Arachimaru was making his way inside and looking rather annoyed. Looking at him, I understood why people would fear him. He looked evil, but I guess it was hard not to look evil with snake-like eyes. I'm here, Sensei. I stayed quiet and watched the exchange. Arachimaru looked annoyed, and the third had a warm smile on his face. Arachi, it's good to see you. Take a seat. The third gestured to a chair. I thankfully didn't smirk at his nickname. What was so important that it required me to waste my precious time? Arachimaru talked was a slow drawl and his face was impassive. He in no way wanted to be here. I wanted to ask you if you would spend a few hours a week teaching young Shiro here. The Hokage pointed at me as he finished his sentence. Orochimaru turned his attention to me for the first time since he arrived. I sent him a little wave and he ignored me. I don't have time for an apprentice. The third shook his head. You just need to pass on some of your knowledge on body modification and DNA manipulation, which is Shiro's current interest. That sentence made me incredibly nervous. I didn't know how much they knew about what I was doing. Even if all my notes were in French and English, there was no guarantee that they weren't decoded. Orochimaru sent me a look of mild interest but remained quiet. Shiro, why don't you tell Orochimaru what you've been working on? The question served two purposes. He wanted me to impress Orochimaru, but he also wanted to know about any body modifications that he wasn't aware of yet. I was pretty sure they didn't know too much of what I got up to. The Hokage was fishing for information and trying to foster talent, or so I thought. I took a deep breath and prepared myself. I've enhanced my nerves and improved my Bayakigan's range. Orochimaru didn't look impressed and neither did the Hokage. I'm currently working on ways to expand someone's chakra network. That didn't have any visible effect on Orochimaru nor the Hokage. I've also recently been able to regrow limbs, though at a huge chakra cost. The Hokage looked mildly interested, but I didn't think I'd sold Orochimaru on the idea of a student, so I decided to throw out some bait. I've also been looking into immortality or ways to become immortal as well. The Hokage hummed and Orochimaru shifted slightly, though his face hadn't changed. Ham any discoveries? I shook my head. No, I've just got a lot of theories. The Hokage nodded. You're not confident in your theories. I nodded. The more I learn the harder it seems it is to achieve true immortality. The Hokage nodded and I leaned back, hopefully giving the appearance of being comfortable. Would you share some of your theories with us? I nodded and smiled. Yes, as long as you can dismiss your Ambu. The Hokage nodded and waved his hand. I flickered my Byakugan and watched the Ambu leave for a moment. Well, I deactivated my Byakugan, even though they won't know what we talked about one of them will probably report to Danzo, meaning I've probably gained his attention if I didn't already have it. The first one I had thought of was something I call Cancer Immortality. This was easy to give up. I didn't think it was possible, and it had large risks to oneself. Cancer is immortal, meaning cancer cells can duplicate indefinitely. So, I thought if I made every cell in my body cancerous could I become immortal? Orochimaru shook his head. If all your cells were cancerous, your body would keep producing cells eventually failing when the cancer impedes critical bodily functions. I nodded. But if you had a seal that kept your body in your desired shape, you could overcome that. Orochimaru nodded. Though even then it's imperfect, your physical energy would become sickly and weak because of the cancer. I nodded even though I didn't know that. The second one I had thought of is called Tail Beast Immortality. I looked at the Hokage and Orochimaru, both seemed interested, which was what I wanted. Hopefully I wouldn't have to show too much of my hand. The idea was to turn oneself into a chakra construct via Fuenjutsu. I had thought that if Sasori could seal his consciousness into a core and operate a puppet body, why couldn't I do the same and make myself a chakra construct? You seal your consciousness into a core from which you pilot your body using an artificial network. I blew a breath from my nose. I realized that wouldn't work, so I pondered the possibility of having a seal replicate your every cell with chakra and hold that form. I rolled my eyes. It would be almost impossibly hard to do. You would need the seal to record everything about your body, and then replace your cells with chakra cells. But even if you got that far, then you would need a way to generate physical energy, or you wouldn't have a way to generate chakra. I paused for a moment and Arachimaru chimed in. Nature chakra. I nodded and sent him a thumbs up. Yes, I had the same thought. The problem is that a chakra body wouldn't be able to adapt. This time Arachimaru nodded. You would lose the ability to grow. I nodded and looked to see if the Hokage was paying attention. And even if it somehow worked, you would just become another tailed beast. Someone would eventually seal you and use your power. 
The thought of Tell Beast made me think of the Zero Tails, was it worth capturing? It had no relevance to Zetsu's plans. So I wouldn't have to worry about anyone plotting against me if I stole it. Now do I continue or do I cut the conversation off here? Do you want me to continue? The Hokage looks to be losing interest. The Hokage had been looking out the window seemingly having lost interest, though I don't know why he wouldn't be interested in immortality. You two can talk later, Shiro. Why do you seek immortality? The Hokage didn't look even mildly interested in my answer, but I could see Orochimaru paying attention from the corner of my eye. I wanted to live long enough to learn world travel. The Otsutsuki could do it so it wasn't out of reach. Though I couldn't say that to the Hokage. I want to live long enough to see the village advance. The Hokage blinked at me, and Orochimaru didn't look too enthused with my answer. When the first Hokage created the village, he wouldn't have been able to imagine how much it would change and grow. I hope to experience the village's growth over the years. The Hokage hummed and Orochimaru stayed silent. I leaned back into my chair and folded my arms. Everyone was silent for a while, and I wasn't keen to break the silence. I wanted some time to think. Hopefully, that answer was satisfactory. I barely pulled that out of my ass. I implied I wanted to be the village's immortal guardian, watching it grow and prosper. Hopefully, the Hokage loved that eventually, Orochimaru broke the silence. I don't have the time to teach you, but I'll allow you to be my assistant and teach you as I go. Allow me. What an asshole. I'd be happy too. Hopefully, I'd learn stuff. If he shafted me and didn't teach me shit, I'll seal him and toss him into the ocean. I reached over to Orochimaru and offered my hand. He reached over and took it. We shook hands, and I wondered if I was making a huge mistake. Was faster progress worth having to worry about my Baikigan or body being stolen? Alright Shiro you're dismissed. Orochi you stay we have more to discuss. I nodded stood up and bowed towards both the Hokage and Orochimaru. Orochimaru wasn't sealing bodies until after Naruto was born. So hopefully, it wouldn't be a problem for a while. I made my way out of the room and dismissed myself in a burst of smoke. I stood staring blankly at emergency rations. Clones didn't suffer any consequences from their actions. It made them make risky or silly decisions. I was both horrified and glad. Horrified for my future and glad the clone made no mention of my plan to become a stem cell vampire. I was pretty close to making it work. DNA overwrite was the final piece of the puzzle. Cell rejection was caused when the immune system rejected foreign cells. If the DNA was changed, and the cell was manipulated a little, it was no longer foreign. I was pretty sure Orochimaru could come to the same conclusion himself. Though hopefully, I didn't give him any ideas. Psi two possible paths to immortality. Stem cell vampire and biological immortality. I just needed to get the seals down. And I was done with stem cell vampire. And I also needed to get the rate of cancer down. I almost forgot about that. The chakra control needed to touch DNA without destroying it was insane. I couldn't imagine what sort of madman made this technique. I understood why you had to use a seal to do the rest of this. I couldn't do it yet. But I'd keep trying. Though perhaps I should focus on other things would it be better to put DNA shenanigans off. I didn't know the next day I was pondering expanding my chakra network and feeding emergency rations when I was disturbed. Ah hem. I turned and saw Orochimaru standing in the middle of my lab and sending me a board stare. Hello. I sent him a nod and tried to hide how disturbed I was with having my home invaded. He took a glance at my crappy lab and gave it a look of disdain. Your mother let me in. I nodded, though it didn't make me feel better about having my lab invaded once again. All right. Orochimaru walked over and placed his hand on one of my rabbits. He hummed but didn't say anything, and I remained quiet as well. Eventually, I got bored of watching and went to start feeding my other rabbits. Have you been using these as practice for DNA analysis? I nodded with animals, you would look for physical differences between subspecies, like rabbits with different colored furs, ear sizes, or hearing sensitivity, all those things. Once you have enough rabbit species with different traits, you can easily find out which mutations are most prevalent in which species, and inside that species which rabbit has different combinations of mutations. You can use that data to find out which rabbits will have the biggest ears or longest fur. At least if you are right that's the case. Don't bother. I've already done this myself with many different animals. Aside, I wasted a few weeks on this if that was the case. Alright. I just nodded if Orochimaru already had this done, all I needed to do was memorize his work. So, what brings you here Sensei? Orochimaru seemed to have enjoyed my use of Sensei. It was the right move. I came to collect you. It occurred to me that I didn't arrange anything before you were dismissed. I nodded. So, what's the plan? Orochimaru started making his way towards the door. I'll show you where I do some of my research, and I'll key you into the seals. From there we will decide on a schedule that works for you. I nodded and followed after him. Sure thing, Sensei. I figured it would take me around 5 years to make any progress in DNA manipulation. By studying under Orochimaru I could cut that time down. I just needed to identify what part of the DNA corresponded to the Shikotsu Miyaku, which was easier said than done. I might still need to wait until Kimimura was born Sai. Hidden under a dongo shop in the middle of Kanoha is where Orochimaru brought me. Orochimaru's lab looked less advanced than I had imagined it to be. There were a lot of different organs, animals, and other body parts floating in glass containers. I spun and took a better look at the lab. Shelves were lining the walls, each was filled with different specimens. So, 
I looked at my new teacher wondering what he had planned. Orochimaru brought out many different scrolls, books, notes, and stacks of paper, and set them on a table in the corner of the room. You will be studying. When you've memorized everything there, I'll decide what to do with you. I nodded and made my way over to the table and grabbed the notes first. Those don't leave the lab. I nodded again. I briefly looked over to the pile of stuff Orochimaru gave me. Some of it was medical stuff I had already memorized. But there was other chakra-related stuff that I hadn't seen before. Spiritual energy and its effects on chakra. Neat. Chakra capacity and lifespan. Hum chakra and DNA. The whole pile contained lots of good stuff. I hadn't seen any of this in the archive or the libraries. So, this was likely Orochimaru's work. Either that or it was heavily restricted. More restricted than the already restricted stuff in the archive. I took a breath and activated my Bayakigan. I admired the flowing script covering just about every inch of the room. I saw Orochimaru eyeing me, and I sent him a wave. I turned my focus onto the books and activated Kokoro no Kaoka. It would only take me a day to memorize all of this. It would likely take me longer to understand it, though a lot of Orochimaru's notes were about directly fucking with the DNA, and seeing what happened. It was ugly business, but it was extremely efficient. Orochimaru had made great progress in analyzing human DNA. According to his notes, humans have between 20,000 and 25,000 genes. Genes were just strands of DNA. Every person has two copies of each gene, one inherited from each parent. Most genes are the same in all people, but a small number of are slightly different between people. These small differences contribute to each person's unique physical features. Lots of interesting stuff, but nothing related to Keke Jenkai so. He was holding back not unexpected, but it was annoying. I'd already made massive gains, so I'd stay my path and continue as I was. Hopefully, I could gain his trust and start working on some of his projects. I'll see what the future holds. Things were going well. My birthday passed, and I spent time with Guy and his new team. The only major event being I was Invasion of Rain Country, which escalated tensions. I guess Iwa wasn't happy fighting us in Kusa and elected to piss off Hanzo as well. Other than that nothing much happened, Team Irregular had only been on four more missions together, and things went unexpectedly well. No major upsets. I and all my clones spent a lot of time with Orochimaru being his henchman and practicing DNA isolation on my rabbit farm. Progress was slow but it was much better than paving my own path. That would have been almost hopeless. I stood and watched Team Chosa complete another lap around the training field. Guy, Gemma, and Abisu. Or Guy plus two nobodies. Guy's teammates didn't go the extra mile, often giving up when they got tired and not continuing when I healed them. It was upsetting and a waste of time training them, but it made Guy happy so I injured. I could vaguely remember Abisu, so I knew that he wasn't total cannon fodder. But Gemma I didn't have any hope for. He was the first to quit and spent too much time training his throwing skills. A total waste. But at least he gave me some of his blood. So I didn't mind him too much. Alright I'll heal you once more. But then I've got to go. Guy fist pumped and started running faster. While his two teammates groaned. Healing dying Guy was a drain on my time. But it was worth it both were showing great improvement. Though that could be because Guy was going through puberty sigh. Gemma stopped dragging your feet. Gemma ignored me and continued being a useless waste. I made a single hand sign, and an arrow of lightning appeared over my shoulder. Run faster. Gemma didn't head my warning with a thought, the lightning arrow sped off in his direction. Faster. The arrow narrowly missed his ass, and Gemma started running. Are you trying to kill me? I readied another arrow and ignored him. Move it. Gemma matched his pace with Abisu. You too Abisu. I launched the lightning arrow. It sipped between Gemma and Abisu. I looked at Guy for a moment to see if he needed some motivation. He didn't but Gemma had slowed when I stopped looking at him. I said faster. I readied another arrow I was watching as Orochimaru gathered samples from the Kagaya's body. After a little thought I handed it over to him. I had already learned everything I could from it. So it didn't matter if I handed it over for some brownie points. Orochimaru certainly apricated it. And I got to learn some new things. A win in my books. Anything interesting? Orochimaru shook his head. If he was alive I might have found something. But because he's dead, I won't know until I look at the DNA. Alrighty I'll bring the next one in alive. Orochimaru inclined his head, but didn't look away from what he was doing. What did you hope to achieve from collecting this specimen? Honesty seemed to be my best bet. If I lied, he would probably know. I want to awaken the Kagaya's bloodline in myself. Orochimaru shook his head at me. And how would a corpse help you with that? I don't think that was a question. Understood sensei. Orochimaru side eyed me for a moment before looking away seemingly satisfied. You also destroyed the chakra network. I nodded. I was practicing with chakra network expansion. Orochimaru nodded. I can see that he exploded from the inside out. Wait, I blew a breath from my nose. Going from low Jonin level reserves to cage level was too much for him. Orochimaru hummed but didn't speak. He finished what he was doing and removed his gloves. Any problems with it other than that? I rolled my eyes. Other than losing a good bit of chakra control. It seems fine, as long as you have a good healing factor. Orochimaru started labeling his newly acquired organ jars. We'll test it out and see what can be improved. Might as well go for the home run. Can we try to improve my nerve enhancement as well? Orochimaru shook his head. I've already done something similar myself. 
I'll give you my notes for you to pursue in your own time. Awesome. Hopefully, he made more progress than I did. Thank you, Sensei. Orochimaru said nothing but nodded and sealed all his now-labeled jars away. Shiro, I turned and looked at Mom. Yes. I looked and saw that she had emergency rations by the scruff of his neck. Why is this running around the house? An excellent question. Let's go find out. I walked past her, taking emergency rations as I passed. I made my way to the lab and saw that the door was open, which wasn't too unusual. I walked inside and saw that emergency rations had chewed through the metal bars of his cage. It seems we have another escapee in the house. Emergency rations wife was on the loose as well. Clean up your mess. Mom walked away leaving me alone to search for my missing rabbit. Perhaps this is a sign that you were meant to be free. I looked at emergency rations. And his little rabbit eyes met mine. But not today. I put him in one of the glass aquariums with a few other female rabbits. Maybe more wives would keep him occupied. Isla has declared war on Kenora. Weren't they fighting rain? Why are they in such a rush to die? Mom sent me a reproachful look. Don't joke around, this is serious. As was I. Are we getting deployed? Mom shook her head. Not yet. We won't be deployed until later unless we choose to go. Should I stay or should I go? Let's see what happens. I might follow Orochimaru if he goes out. I imagine he would be eager to capture some Bloodline users. Alright, thanks for the update. I've got things to prepare. It seems we wouldn't be getting a new house yet, Saiso. Sensei. Orochimaru just stared at me. He wanted me to stop beating around the bush. War has officially been declared. What are your plans? Orochimaru continued his staring but spoke. I'm heading to the front to gain merits. I snorted, merits likely meant experimental subjects. Can I join you? Orochimaru narrowed his eyes at me. We'll see. Alrighty so, what's the plan for today sensei? Orochimaru turned and made his way to a cardboard, where he withdrew a stack of loose paper. You will be making indexing and analysis seals, and I will analyze the Kagaya DNA you brought me. Alrighty, sure thing. I grabbed the paper and ignored the offered brush. I unsealed my own from my kunai pouch, and took a seat. Come take a look. I was startled and messed up the seal I was working on. I looked over to see Orochimaru waving me over to a large script-covered scroll. I walked over and placed my hand on the center left of the seal. The seal activated and I was put under a light jinjutsu allowing me to see the DNA the scroll had analyzed. What am I looking at? I knew it had something to do with the bones, but it wasn't drastically different from normal DNA. Part of the Shikotsu Miyaku. What? How did you identify it so quickly? Orochimaru placed his hand beside mine and gestured towards a few of the runs of the DNA. These nucleotides here are for bone growth, and this is completely foreign to normal humans. Orochimaru pointed vaguely towards another part of the DNA. 99% of human DNA was the same, with a few differences often corresponding to physical traits. I guess that made it easy to single out a bloodline. It's also a recessive gene with its dominate counterpart being here. The Jinjutsu shifted and we were looking at a different section of DNA. It has something to do with Yang Chakra and physical energy. I blew a breath out of my nose. Anything else? Orochimaru nodded. There is a part here that determines the body's natural regeneration. That's foreign as well. He gestured towards a few different parts of the DNA. This, this, and this all have something to do with personality traits. But I won't be able to tell what it is without testing. He ended his sentence as he removed his hand from the seal. Would I be able to isolate these? Orochimaru nodded but raised an eyebrow. Yes. But you're better off using DNA override. That was fine, better than fine. It will be your project, so you won't receive any help from me. Isolating was so much easier than splicing. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that I could do so on my own. I removed my hand from the seal and rubbed my eyes. That's fine, it's a good opportunity to put what I learned to the test. Not that I was anywhere near ready. Thanks, Sensei. Orochimaru nodded. I thought for a moment, sat down, and started removing my sandal. I took it off revealing a seal on my ankle. Orochimaru raised an eyebrow at me. I pressed my finger against it and withdrew a vial and a notebook with a puff of smoke. Here, Sensei. He took it and eyed the vial of blood for a moment before he set it aside and started flipping through the notebook. I got that in grass country. I caught a spy that had an interesting bloodline. Orochimaru snorted. Bloodlines don't literally come from the blood. I snorted as well. I wrote that when I was much younger. It just said inject blood. It was just a random thought. The bloodline grants a good healing ability different from what I've seen before. I had planned to combine it with the Yuzumaki bloodline to become immortal. Orochimaru furrowed his brows. The two bloodlines combined will make you close to immortal, the only limitation being aging or chakra exhaustion. I believed that the healing factor plus my own would make me unkillable but I'd changed my thoughts on it after a bit of study. The bloodline healed you, but sometimes improperly. Long-term use of the bloodline would cause a buildup of mistakes that unless corrected, would eventually impede your bodily functions. My bloodline had a similar fault if my stem cells were used up and divided too quickly they aged, and became prone to cancer and other malformities. Thankfully I was on top of things and eliminated any cells that were too old. Stem cell bone weapons weren't an option anymore though, but I guess it was a worthwhile endeavor. If I learned my healing's weakness, 
Alright sensei I've got to go, enjoy your research. I sent Orochimaru a backward wave as I left. I've laid a trap, if Orochimaru jumped the gun and spliced the bloodline into himself, it'd weaken him. If he took his time and studied it and found the flaws in the bloodline, I'd claim innocence. Win-win. Emergency rations new wives had done as intended and kept him busy, but now I had a surplus of rabbits. Though I guess I've got a lot of test subjects now, I went to a different cage and grabbed two normal male rabbits. A quick tap to the neck and one was dead and a tap to the forehead, and the other was unconscious. Now it was time to make some cancer. How was the mission? Judging from guys still enthusiastic, but less enthusiastic than normal look it wasn't good. We babysat for a couple so they could have a date night. I snorted but wiped the smile off my face at the look guy gave me. What was so bad about it? Guy went on to explain that Gemma had left the stove on and almost burnt down the house when they left to visit the park. I fought to keep the smile off my face. I wish I had a few of these stories I found it. The reason for cancer's supposed immortality. It was a weird enzyme that copied the telomere and added bits of DNA to its tips making it longer. It seemed present but dormant in all the cells but was most prevalent in sperm cells and some immune cells. It was activated when cells mutated and somehow activated the enzyme. Sadly, the mutation caused cancer as the cell never died and duplicated indefinitely. So, I didn't want the mutation, but I still needed a way to temporarily activate the enzyme. It was active in the sperm cells constantly adding to the telomere length maintaining it and keeping it young. I guess it was so the egg isn't fertilized by some old mangled DNA. I imagine the egg had something similar going on I sighed and put it out of my head. I needed a way to activate the enzyme. I'd observe the process more and see if there was a way to do so with seals. It was likely that I would need to step up my Fuenjutsu practice. A lot of the hard work was done by someone else. I just needed to change DNA overwrite seals, and I would be good to go on cell immortality. Though if I was doing that I might as well change the seals, and make DNA isolate work with them. Overwrite was much different, then isolate overriding my DNA just to change one passive trait seemed like overkill. Even if there was a lot of potential for mistakes. I wasn't willing to risk any mistakes, perhaps I'll start with isolate while I think about activating the as of yet unnamed enzyme. Looking at DNA overwrite seal work was headache inducing. I got the gist of what was happening. But I had no clue how to change it without having it fall apart on me. All I needed to do was suppress the dominant non-active Shikotsu Myaku DNA. But how do I get the seal to do that? The DNA dismantling part can go, as can the part where it puts it all together. The copy part that copies the intended change and applies the work can stay, as can the other 200 parts. The part that makes the change temporary can go. Now the seal is unbalanced. Further unbalancing won't matter if it's already fucked now I needed to add the part that suppresses the dominant gene from DNA isolating. I looked down at the seal. It was a mess goddammit maybe override is the way to go. I just need to make the two genes both recessive which involved a little DNA splicing. Get rid of the dominant gene and then splice in a second recessive gene sigh. What a headache I also didn't need to overwrite my own body. I could just overwrite someone else's DNA and absorb them. Most of my hesitance about DNA overwrite was because I didn't want to use it on myself all right. That's the plan. Overwrite someone and then absorb them. I was pretty much done with stem cell vampire anyways now. I just needed to splice that DNA together hopefully. The infertility was only because some idiot was splicing animal DNA. But I guess I'd see it was an acceptable sacrifice even if that wasn't the case. Orochimaru had helped me get a hold on the seals. So all I needed to do was splice the two genes together. Though sadly... I wasn't capable of that yet, though I would be soon. Hopefully now the question was, do I use another one of my recessive genes? Or do I use the puka guy's recessive gene? I'd say I should use my own, but I had no idea what the right way to go was. I'll use mine and if it goes badly, I'll use the Kagai's gene. Sai, I also needed to identify and index my own DNA. Lots of stuff to be done. DNA overwrite was originally used to make compatible organs for transplants need. But useless for now I sighed and put down the book. I was still having trouble with DNA splicing so... I turned to the archives, hoping for an answer to magically appear. But so far, no dice. Orochimaru had left to the Land of Frost, so he could engage in hostilities with Kumo, who had also declared war against us, leaving me to bumble around by myself. Though I did get permission to use one of his labs, which was a plus now that I had been sciencing without smelling a room of 40 rabbits. I couldn't go back, which led to the release of most of the rabbits. Now there was a bunch of rabbits with genin level reserves messing with the sensors, and causing havoc I heard they were sending the Ichiha after them. I smothered my smile with a hand, imagining those assholes catching rabbits brought me joy. Though I guess having the alarms raised every time one of the sensors senses a foreign chakra signature was annoying. We were officially four months into the war, and as of yet, the clans have not contributed to the war effort, which had earned the ire of most of the other ninja. Even I who was only 11 got cursed as I walked the streets, though it was only when I was wearing obvious clan clothing. Things were coming to a head, soon the clans would have to send out some of their men. I thought I might as well get ahead of the curve, though I wasn't interested in bringing my mother and die along so, 
I wouldn't I left a note and set off towards Frost. I was going to be stationed there as a Ruchimaru's assistant. Meaning I was supposed to follow him like a little duckling and do as I was told. Whatever that may be. The trip would take a day and a half even at full speed. So I elected to draw it out and arrive in around two days. Hopefully with mostly full reserves. Though I guess I'd see. I might run into trouble after all I ran into no trouble on my way and found myself disappointed. I passed through the land of Hot Springs and into Frost. Hot Springs was currently neutral and thus was holed up in their villages. Frost on the other hand had allied with Kumo and told us to fuck off with a nice stab to the back during an alliance meeting. So Kanofa and Kumo were having a blast fighting all over Frost destroying many of their villages and burning what little crops they could produce themselves. Recently the battlefield commander was assassinated so Kanoha sent a Nara in who was also subsequently assassinated. Now Orochimaru insisted he should go take care of things of Frost. The third didn't want to escalate by sending an S-ranked ninja to the field, but didn't want any more casualties, so he sent him anyways. Or at least that was the situation as I understood it. I could be wrong. Frost was aptly named as most Naruto countries were. Everything seemed to have a layer of frost that melted around midday. It was an interesting climate. Lightning country to the northeast was more mountainous but had no Delhi Frost as far as I knew. And to the south, there was Hot Springs who also had no Delhi Frost. Quite unusual, but maybe this was normal in the Naruto-verse. I wasn't an expert in Naruto-verse climate after all. I approached the camp and nearly had a heart attack when Orochimaru sunshine next to me. Hello sensei, Orochimaru didn't acknowledge my greeting. You took your time getting here. I just nodded. I wanted my reserves to be full. Orochimaru stared at me with half-closed eyes, but eventually turned and started making his way into the camp. What's your combat potential? What? I blinked at him. What's your combat potential? He repeated himself but this time slower like he was talking to a child. I'm somewhere between Jonin and Elite Jonin. I'd put myself above Elite Jonin level with my seal active, but a little under Elite Jonin without the seal. Here, Orochimaru pressed a scroll into my hand. I raised an eyebrow, and he gave me an unimpressed stare. I unfolded and started reading. So an escort mission. He just nodded. I need someone competent to protect our supplies. I've already lost a shipment and some of my ninja. Meaning he had a spy problem and he needed to root them out. He probably wouldn't be talking about it out in the open otherwise. As much as being called competent warm my heart I wasn't too interested in being bait. Alright. An order was an order though. Any requests? I sent a Ruchimaru wink. Send a message. Make it messy and leave one survivor. Alrighty. Make them hesitate to raid future supply caravans. Rice country was just half a day from frost. It was nestled between hot springs and the land of iron, and shared its southern border with the land of fire. It was aptly named and covered in rice paddies, with a few villages dotted throughout the country. It was also a shithole. The only village that wasn't made from mud and wood was the capital, and even then, it wasn't much. The population was uneducated and mainly consisted of farmers. They also had little contact with ninja. They likely wouldn't see more than a few ninjas during their lifetime. This led to them crowding me and asking annoying questions. Where's the shipment? I ignored the children crowding me and looked at the slightly better dressed old man standing a distance away. He waved me over and started walking towards a building. He went around back and opened a door to a cellar. The cellar was packed with bags of rice, and was surprisingly well put together. I bet someone used Earth Release to put it together. How much can I take? The old man handed me a scroll. I unfolded it and gave it a quick scan. Orochimaru had already purchased all of his rice from Rice's Dynamo. These people probably wouldn't see any money from the rice I blew a breath out of my nose, and handed the man the scroll I had gotten from Orochimaru. Even if I gave them any money it would likely get them killed or heavily taxed thank you. The old man sent me a smile. Anytime young one. I flickered my Byakugan when the old man turned to leave. Good thing I had a ton of paper and ink. I had sealed the rice up and my kunai pouch was bulging with scrolls. Now I just needed to be wary of an attack on the way to Frost. I made my way out of the cellar and disappeared with a shunshin after sending the old man a wave. I arrived at the border of Hot Springs and Frost with my Byakugan active and there was not a ninja in sight. Did I travel too fast? I briefly considered doubling back and making the trip again but dismissed it after a moment. I just continue as I was I arrived at the camp and was directed to the commander's tent, where I was met with a Rochimaru's usual stare the moment I stepped past the flap of the tent. I see your back. I shrugged. Yay, there was a lack of trouble during my trip. I was feeling a tad disappointed about it. We took care of the trouble on our side before it could become a problem, meaning he rooted out the spy slash trader. I walked over to a semi-clear table and started unloading my scrolls. Alright, I'm going to claim a tent. Orochimaru stopped looking at me and turned his focus onto a map of Frost's surroundings. Do so. I sent him a backward wave as I left. This morning I had wandered into Orochimaru's tent wondering what he was up to. It seemed he was going to stare at the map some more. I took over a desk in the corner of the tent and started unsealing my Fuinjutsu equipment. I wasn't going to take on a job when I could use my free time to study. I watched as Orochimaru ordered different people around all day. A scout had found a Kumo-occupied camp to the northeast of us, and Orochimaru wanted to hit it tomorrow night. Orochimaru wanted to send some grunts to Harris Frost Ninja Village, 
with a few Jutsu bombardments while he and the Jonin swept up the camp. Judging from the look I got, I was also a member of the Grunt team, which sucked I wasn't interested in attacking a village full of civilians, nor was I interested in fighting people who were desperately defending their families. Sigh. Orochimaru stood solemnly in front of the map. Shiro, you're in charge of this mission. Your job is to hit Shimogaka's west wall with your biggest jutsu, and then flee into hot springs. From there you will cross over the border near Heron Bay, and make your way back to camp. He interspersed his order with a few vague gestures at the map. Any questions? I nodded. Does it matter if anyone from my team survives? Orochimaru cracked a smile. Not in the slightest, their only job is to defend you while you prepare your jutsu. Alrighty. How many people am I working with? Orochimaru shrugged. How many do you want? How many meat shields do I need? I guess it depends on what jutsu I use. Do I want to hit the walls with heaven's palm or a giant lightning construct? Or something else either way. I would need to use my seal to do any real damage. Though I guess their walls might not be as strong as Kanoha's. Can I get 24? That's two squads or half a platoon, which was an extremely small amount for our current number. Have a whole platoon. Orochimaru grabbed a sheet of paper and wrote something down. Wait by the gate tomorrow morning for your troops alrighty, and strike as soon as it's dark. I got up and started making my way out of the tent. I had no idea how this would work out I was elven after all. I doubted anyone would be enthused to listen to me. I briefly eyed the squads. 12 to a squad with each squad having 3 jonin, while the rest of the space was occupied with chunin. 12 jonin and 36 chunin. That was a lot of meat shields perhaps Orochimaru didn't trust my ability to escape. Or maybe there was some old monster lurking in Frost Hidden Village. I handed the closest ninja a scroll. Read this. He looked befuddled but did as he was told after unfurling the scroll. Attack Shimogaka's westmost wall an hour after dark and immediately retreat towards the I.I. the squads again this time closer. They were unremarkable, each wore the standard uniform, and there was a distinct lack of clan markings among them. I hope all of you can hide your chakra. I saw a lot of nods, but also a few head shakes. Those of you who can't will be setting traps at the border to cover our escape. I again saw some nods. Those of you who can will set traps closer to Shimogaka. I saw a few more nods. We will then leave the Chunin behind, and the Jonin will advance as much as we can, before launching an attack at the West Wall. Any questions? I saw two hands fly up, and I pointed at the closest one. Who's launching the attack? Me, obviously me. Next question. I pointed to the next guy. Will we get reimbursed for any ninja tools used? Sure. I don't think soldiers have to pay for their weapons. Yet, yeah, as long as you live through the mission. A few chuckled, though I hadn't meant for it to be a joke. Alright, let's set off. We're going to take a roundabout route, so there's no time to waste. The sooner we arrived, the sooner we could set up some traps. We traveled the hot springs and frost border, or at least what was roughly considered the border. We arrived at where our exit was supposed to be, and I ordered them to start setting traps. Alright, you and you are staying. I pointed to two Jonin. Shimogaka wasn't far from the border, so just had a little trip to make, and we would be there. Okay, let's go. Hopefully, this wasn't a total shit show. Alright, get around. I pulled two stacks of explosive notes from my kunai patch. After a moment of thought, I just handed one of the Chunin the whole pouch. It only had explosive notes in it anyway. I had a second one on my other leg full of most of my other tools. Explosive tags. I stared dully at the Chunin who spoke. Yes, thanks, genius yet. Though these have five times the blast radius and are a little more fiery than the normal ones. They were more of a napping bomb and less of an explosive tag. I want to see these blow up anyone who approaches. I singled out the one who spoke and looked at him specifically. I activated my Bayakugan and took a thorough look around. You and you, stay here. I again pointed at two different Jonin. Nothing was amiss, so I deactivated my Bayakugan. Everyone else who is not a Jonin stays and makes traps before retreating to the border. I broke off from the group and sped up. I had shed most of the dead weight in the previous two stops so I didn't need to take it too slow anymore. Orochimaru wanted me to bash the walls and distract Shimogaka, while he took care of Akumo Cam. I'd do him one better, though I'd destroy that wall alright, let's approach. I activated my Bayakigan after I spoke. I saw the remaining eight Jonin nod, so I looked away and focused my attention on Shimogaka and started my approach. I was slightly annoyed at Shimogaka's positioning. It was nicely nestled between two mountains with only the west and northeast being easily accessible. It was better naturally defended than Kanoha. Sigh alright, let's get closer. We weren't far from the wall, and I was thinking about just entering the village and causing some havoc. But that was probably a dumb idea. I shouldn't be launching any attacks in what was bound to be a mostly civilian village. So, it was just the wall I was targeting Heaven's Palm would just singe the wall. It was more of an anti-personal attack. Oh, I know. Alright. Get ready to protect me, as soon as I start charging my attack, they're going to sense us. I sent a tendril of chakra to the seal on my forehead and gave it a twist. My body was flooded with chakra and a manic grin split my face. I held both my hands above my head and a Rasengan started to spin into existence. It got bigger and bigger and bigger alright run as soon as it hits. I finished my sentence by anchoring my feet so the ground and smashing the Rasengan at the wall. EOOM asterisk a shockwave scattered the Jonin sending them flying. I took part of the wall down. 
but it wasn't too impressive, though I guess the dust cloud was neat. I launched the Rasengan away from me and into the village. I aimed it at a vaguely important looking building. Alright start running. A quick hand seal later and I was surrounded by more than 20 clones. That was a little sloppy they ran off to different parts of the walls. Each clone raised their arms above their heads and started creating giant Rasengans. Once they were created, one by one, they started smashing their Rasengans into the remaining sections of the walls. BOOM asterisk 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 The wall crumbled, and I activated my Byakugan. The civilians were evacuating, and some ninja were gathering at the base of the wall, and digging through the rubble, looking for people trapped underneath. While others cautiously made their way through the dust cloud, surprisingly no one was coming after me. I had believed I would be swarmed, but it hasn't happened yet. I decided it was time I take off. Alright kill as many as you can, and take out some buildings. I waved my clones into the village and started running. There were a few remaining Jonin. I made sure to remember their faces. The ones who fled so soon were either cowards or good at following orders. Let's go. I like the ones who stayed better, yes sir. I sent another tendril of chakra to my forehead and closed the seal. Leave a trail, don't cover your tracks. I scanned the area around me and was slightly annoyed at the lack of pursuers. I had expected to be chased by a horde of angry ninjas. Whatever, we made it to the first checkpoint safe and sound, we had a few ambu following us. But those were easily dealt with. Clones for the win alright keep going. One of the Jonin had stayed behind and waited for us. I took note of his face, and mentally labeled him as one of the good ones. I think we weren't chased because the civilians took priority. Now that they were evacuated, they were likely organized and chasing us. No more tracks. Cover them to the best of your abilities. I faintly heard explosions behind us. Though we made it successfully to the border with no trouble. Pack up, we're leaving. This is where bringing along 36 Chunin became a hindrance. They hadn't been useful meat shields, but they were useful anchors. Move it. I yelled at one Chunin who was taking his time. I was stopped from further berating the man by a rush of memories. The clones were doing a good job, and one had even managed to invade their version of a cage tower. He had taken a look around for anything potentially useful, but found nothing. He instead decided to blow himself up and take out the tower. I sighed the self-detonation technique I haven't made much use of it. Alright let's go. Leave those who aren't ready. These idiots knew what was happening. We weren't going camping morons we made our way into hot springs, and took a long winding path back to base. I was bombarded with memories a little after leaving the border. The clones had taken inspiration from the one who blew up and started suicide bombing anyone who gave them trouble. Though they assassinated as many important looking people as they could, it likely led to a good loss in Shimogaka's military might. Are we missing anyone? I hope not, but it was possible as we were scrambling at the border. No sir. I looked at the one who yelled, she was one of the Jonin who had followed me to Shimogaka. Good, let's keep up the pace. Not that the pace was great, having a bunch of Chunin slowed us down. Shiro, I just wanted a distraction. I shrugged and stayed quiet. I wasn't sure what Orochimaru was so angry about. Why did you invade Shimogaka? I didn't know 20 clones was considered an invasion. It was only 20 clones. No one even set foot in Shimogaka. Orochimaru didn't look satisfied. You destroyed their west wall, demolished their tower, and killed a huge amount of their Jonin, and one of their few S-ranked ninjas. I only killed a hundred people at most, and the guy who launched giant icicles wasn't that strong. Shimogaka's Jonin need to learn sensing, and Icicle Guy died in a clone suicide bombing. They were just too easy to assassinate, and Icicle Guy only took out two of the clones, before succumbing to a suicide bombing. Orochimaru just stared at me. The traps you left in your wake demolished a good part of their forces. I nodded. I made my seals rather well. Orochimaru took a deep breath and rubbed his temple. You've overshadowed my battle. Oops, that wasn't my intention. Orochimaru sent me a tired look. I can tell. I sent him my best sympathetic smile. Why don't you claim credit call it your idea? He snorted. The Jonin have already spread tales of your mission around the camp. Hum, I decided to change the topic. How are things on your end? Orochimaru's face suddenly twisted with rage, and he was practically a waterfall of chakra even I who couldn't sense worth shit could feel the chakra leaking from him. The camp was much bigger than we thought, we had to retreat after an encounter with two of Kumo's S-ranked ninja. Shame, they sending out the S-ranks already. Orochimaru nodded. They've got enough to throw them around. Annoying so, what's the plan? Orochimaru was back to his usual bored look, any trace of anger had vanished from his face. We've stirred the pot, now Kumo and Shimogaka should be hesitant to attack us. I wasn't getting it. So, Orochimaru rolled his eyes. So, the hard part is done. Now they're going to be afraid to commit to any large battles for a while. Orochimaru cackled. Kekiki, meaning we have some time to gather test subjects. I ignored his weird cackling. Cool. He snorted. Yes, cool. I struggled not to roll my eyes. Orochimaru was such an old man sometimes. Over the next many Kumo Nin were captured and brought into the camp. Orochimaru spent his time using Earth Release to build himself an underground lab. And I spent some time sealing the chakra of any prisoners we obtained. It was awfully boring. Which was why I delegated the task to my clones after a few hours of doing it myself. 
I was now happily indexing my DNA and trying to identify any interesting genes for future study. It was slow going, it was an endeavor that would likely take months. But I was hoping to speed that up with liberal use of shadow clones. Shiro, go get me another test subject. Orochimaru was going through people faster than we could capture them. There's no more. He was doing some messy DNA manipulation, most of which went horribly. Well, get more. Orochimaru was trying to give his test subjects some sort of bloodline. But so far it hadn't worked a single time. Alright, following Orochimaru around was becoming annoying. But I was learning more than I could learn myself. So, it was well worth it. Quit dawdling and go. That's one I haven't heard yet, yes sensei. I put down my brush and sealed the ink up. I was going through paper a bit too fast, but I needed a lot of fuinjutsu to analyze my DNA. Sai Shiro, I blew a breath out of my mouth. What? I turned and looked at a mildly afraid looking Chunin. Your mom's here. Great, send her in. I sighed and started gathering my supplies. DNA analysis was going well. I had identified a few different genes that weren't present in normal people. But that was it. I still had no clue what they did. I was broken from my thoughts by a pair of arms circling my torso and a chin on my shoulder. Hello, mom. She was silent for a moment. And I started sealing my stuff away again. You disappeared on me. I left a note. I left a note. And you were on some sort of mission. I felt her shake her head. You should have waited. I blew a breath from my nose. I will next time. She released me and I turned around to see her. She didn't look any different. But it felt like ages since I've seen her. Did you bring Dai? She nodded. Yes. He was quite eager to display his youthful improvements. I chuckled a little. Though I didn't think Dai knew what he was getting into. A few weeks here will probably kill that enthusiasm. I had seen hundreds of people die since I got here. And it had only been two months bring might die in. I directed my yell vaguely at the tent flap. I now had a few minions to do things for me. It was one of my new favorite things. I don't think I could go without minions again. Shiro congratulations on becoming an s rank ninja. Mom's words almost caused me to drop the arm full of scrolls I was holding. Since when? I hadn't known I was considered an s rank ninja. Shimo and Kumo put out bounties labeling you an s rank ninja. What? Do you have the bounty book on you? I wanted to see it. Mom shook her head with a small smile on her face. Bring me the bounty book. I sent another yell at the tent flap. Looking at the tent flap annoyed me. I won the building of some kind Dai jumped into the tent with a youthful flourish and opened his mouth wide preparing for some youthful shouting. So, has Guy. He got my letters. I stopped Dai from preforming whatever youthful shout he was going to do with my question. His mouth snapped shut with a click and he spun on his heel before giving me a nice guy pose. Guy told me to offer my most sincere thanks for the letters you sent him. I nodded at him. So Guy's doing well. I heard my mom snort from behind me. Guy is participating in the Chunin exams, and has been training most youthfully. I shook my head. Neat. It seems puberty was doing Guy well if he's already participating in the Chunin exams. A Chunin entered the tent in a near run. Here's a bingo book sir. I took it from him and waved him off. Thanks. Always thank your minions. I flipped through the book for a moment before finding the Kanoha section. I flipped through the book some more, noting that the book was in alphabetical order. I went through the O's looking for Orochimaru's entry out of curiosity. I took a glance at it and continued. I reached the S's, and after a few flips, I found my name. There were three pictures of me from different angles, and a few small entries at the bottom containing my bounty and estimated strength. It mentioned my frequent use of a lightning sword and shunshin, but lacked anything about the Rasengan. It noted me as a Hayuga, but stated that they didn't know what branch I was from. Neat. But where did they get these pictures? The book had my elemental affinity as well, no idea. I sent a slight frown at my mom. These are from when I went shopping. Meaning someone took them in Kanova and got them either to Kumo or Shimo. Spies sucked whatever my bounty paled in comparison to Orochimaru's. Though I guess that's not too surprising. I snapped the book shut and turned my gaze to Dai. I heard you've improved. Dai nodded and fist pumped. Yes, I have been youthfully training my tajutsu, and Sumiko has called it passable. I looked at mom and she nodded at me. I sent Dai a thumbs up. So, what brought you two here? Hopefully, the clans were sending people out to the fronts. We were getting demolished in grass as far as I knew. They needed some sensors here, so I was sent. I raised an eyebrow at mom. That was news to me. You're a sensor. Mom crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow at me. Haven't I told you? No, you haven't nope. I popped the pee and stared her semi-accusatorily. Mom shrugged and looked unaffected by my stare. Aside, go get your tent set up. Hopefully, we could get some buildings set up. I might need to order some people to do so with Earth release. Mom departed with a wave and Dai trailed after her. I threw my head back and stared at the roof of the tent. Now I needed to watch over my mother. The thought of her being out here made me anxious. Though I suppose it was ideal that she was around. At least then I had a chance to make sure she was alright. Thankfully she wasn't in grass. As far as I knew Iowa had been stomping all over us there. Sai I better go see Orochimaru. He usually wants something to eat around now. Feeding Orochimaru was my least favorite part of being his assistant. I heard your mother arrived. I wasn't sure I wanted Orochimaru to talk about my mom while he was standing over a corpse. Yes, she arrived this morning with a batch of sensors. Orochimaru hummed. It took them long enough to get here. I requested them weeks ago, 
He trailed off and started making an incision on the corpse's chest. It can't be helped, Awa is destroying us, and they need all the people they can get over there. Grass was a meat grinder, ninja were constantly sent in, and it made little difference, we were constantly losing ground. Grass was half occupied by Awa as far as I knew. Those incompetents Orochimaru shook his head, he was wrist deep into the corpse, and it was weirding me out. I decided it was time to bail. I wasn't interested in chatting while Orochimaru was doing a dissection. Sigh. I'm leaving your food on your desk. I'm going to order someone to build some buildings. I've grown sick of the tents. Arachimaru showed me away with a blood-stained hand. Do so, alrighty. Yes, sensei. I turned and started towards the stairs. Things had been slow lately, after my attack on Shimogaka. There hadn't been more than the occasional skirmish. Things had been boring, though I guess boring was okay. I had made a lot of progress in the analysis of my DNA. After all BOOM asterisk I was woken by the sound of a nearby explosion. My eyes snapped open, and I came face to face with a mask ninja. We made eye contact, and I only realized he had a kunai to my throat after he slid it. I hit him with a sloppy strike to the chest, and my other hand flew up to my throat to cover it. My strike had done as intended and damaged some of his organs. I heard him release a painful gasp. He backed away and started hacking. It seems I hit a lung BOOM asterisk I heard another explosion, but paid it no mind. My hand glowed green, and I started using the mystical palm, hoping to heal my throat a little faster. I got off my cot and stumbled towards the man. He was bent over and still hacking, so he didn't offer much resistance when I tapped him on the top of his head, ending his life. I gave my throat a scan and saw it was good enough. I took a deep breath. I instantly felt better, though my heart was still beating out of my chest. I wiped my bloody palm on my underwear and made my way towards the opening of the tent. I breached the opening and saw some smoke coming from the direction of Orochimaru's lab. It was likely where the explosions came from. Only now did the shouting and the smell of blood start to register in my mind. A single hand sign and three clones appeared in a burst of smoke. One set off to make sure my mom was alright, the other toe set off to clear the camp, and I went back into my tent to get dressed. What a shit show I was fully dressed and making my way towards Orochimaru's lab. My chest was sticky with partially dried blood and I was in a foul mood. The shouting had died down for the most part, things seemed to have calmed down some, meaning we weren't being invaded or raided. Just some assassins then I yawned. I probably should have my Byakugan active. I activated my Byakugan and quickly scanned the camp. Things seemed alright for the most part. Orochimaru's lab had collapsed, but there was no sign of him inside. It seems he was alright. Mom was wandering around with her own Byakugan active. I waved in her direction, and she sent one back. She was alright Dai was youthfully pitching a tent while regaling those who were helping him with tales of youth. So, Dai was good the clones were doing well. One was hefting a body and slowly making its way towards Orochimaru, while the other two were nowhere to be seen. They might be chasing some runaways Sai I changed my direction and started towards Orochimaru. I arrived near Orochimaru and deactivated my Byakugan. Orochimaru was a sorry sight, he was covered in a layer of dust and his robes were stained in blood. And he looked to be barely holding himself back from snarling. Beautiful night we're having. Orochimaru snorted and his face seemed less twisted. Then it was a moment ago. The Funjutsu protecting my lab was sabotaged. I hummed my protections were sabotaged as well. What I had protecting my tent didn't trigger as well. I had a large seal covering the floor of the tent, it almost looked like I was preparing some sort of ritual. It should have screeched the moment foreign chakra entered the seal's area. But that didn't happen spies. Orochimaru nodded with clenched teeth. Spies he hissed the word. I saw a passing Jonin shiver when he said it. My clone arrived with his cargo breaking the atmosphere. The ninja was heavily concealed and had no obvious markings that connected him to any of the villagers. Want this brought to the interrogation guys. My clone shrugged and moved the body for emphasis. Orochimaru shook his head before I had even finished the sentence. I'll take care of this one personally. Orochimaru hissed again, and the clone raised an eyebrow at me. I shrugged at it. This was new to me. Two Orochimaru had the ninja over his shoulder and turned to leave. I'll get your lab set up. Orochimaru nodded but didn't stop walking, and soon left in a shunshin. That was a cool exit go. Find some earth release users. My clone nodded and shunshine away. Delegation for the win. Sigh, I flickered my bayak again, but saw no sign of my other clones. Hum, I wonder what they were up to. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.